and welcome. I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you are not speaking. For media and press, the FDA press contact is Laura J. McCarthy, and her email is displayed currently. Thank you. My name is Robbie Madden, and I will be chairing today's meeting. I will now call the morning session of the March 15, 2024, Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Joyce Frimpog uh, is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting, and we'll begin with introductions. Good morning. My name is Joyce Frimpong, and I'm the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. We will start with the standing members. Dr. Advani? Ranjana Advani, Stanford. Thank you. Good morning. Dr. Gratishar? Bill Gratishar, Medical Oncology, uh, Northwestern University. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Good morning, everybody. I'm Chris Liu. I'm a GI medical oncologist from the University of Colorado Cancer Center. Thank you. Our chairperson, Dr. Madan. Good morning, Ravi Madden, medical oncologist, National Cancer Institute. Thank you. Dr. Nieva. Good morning, George Nieva, thoracic medical oncologist, University of Southern California, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you. Dr. Spratt. Dr. Dan Spratt, Chair of Radiation Oncology at University Hospital Simon Cancer Center and Case Western Reserve University. Thank you. Dr. Vassan. Neil Vassan. I'm a breast medical oncologist at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you. And for our industry representative, Dr. Frankel. Good morning. I'm Dr. Tara Frankel, I'm Head of Oncology Development at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. And now for our temporary voting members, uh, Dr. DeFleiss. Hello, I'm uh, Hello, I'm John DeFleiss. I'm a gastroenterologist, and I have a 13-year history of uh, multiple myeloma. I'm a patient uh, advocate. Yeah. Dr. Hunsberger. Good morning. I'm Sally Hunsberger. I'm a biostatistician at NIH NIAID. Thank you. Dr. Kwok. I am Mary Kwok. I am a multiple myeloma physician at the University of Washington and Fred Hutch Cancer Center. And for our consumer representative, Ms. Lattimore. Good morning. I'm Susan Lattimore from Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. And now I will do um, our FDA participants. I would first start with um, Dr. Thierry. Yes, hi, good morning. My name is Mark Thierry. I'm a hematologist oncologist and deputy center director of the Oncology Center of Excellence. Dr. Kanapuru. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Bindu Kanapuru. I'm a hematologist oncologist and the medical oncology review team lead. Dr. Skolik. Hi, Rob Sakalik. I'm the, the branch chief for the hematologic malignancy in CBER. Dr. Pedro Pinto. Good morning. I'm Dr. Helga Peredo Pinto, a pediatric hematologist oncologist in the Division of Clinical uh, Hematology Evaluation and CIVER, and the primary clinical reviewer for this product. Thank you. And Dr. Wang. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tong Wang, Biostats uh, reviewer for CARVEC-T application. I'm from the Division of Biostats, CIVER, FDA. Thank you, everyone. Dr. Madan, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Frimpong. So for topics such as the, those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are strongly held. 
Our goal is that this meeting will have a fair and open forum to discuss these issues and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, a gentle reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak in the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to this meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory, Advisory Committee Act and the Government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open form of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic during breaks or lunch. Thank you. Now, Dr. Fringpong will, will read the conflict of interest statement for this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Madan. The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's meeting of the Oncologic Drug Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and, in and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by, but not limited to those found at 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 USC section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweighs their potential financial conflicts of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as it would be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussion of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children and for purposes of 18 USC section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consultant, expert witness testimony, contracts grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patent and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves a discussion of Supplemental Biologics License Application SBLA 125746.74 0.74 for Carvicti, Silocaptogene Autolucel Suspension for Intravenous Infusion, submitted by Janssen Biotech Incorporated. The proposed indication for this product is for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least one, line, one prior line of therapy, including a proteasome inhibitor and an immunodulatory agent, and are refractory to lenalidomide. The committee will have a general discussion focused on the overall survival data in the, in the study MMY3002, CARTITUDE4, and the risk and benefit of silicaptogene autolucel in the intended population. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to Janssen Biotech's SBLA will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all final financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, a conflict of interest waiver has been issued in accordance with 18 USC Section 208B3 to Dr. Mary Kwok. Dr. Kwok's waiver involves a consulting interest under negotiation with a competing firm. The waiver also involves 10 of the employee's research contracts for various studies funded by the party to the matter or competing firms. Dr. Kwok's employer receives between zero and 50,000 per year for each of the four studies from Janssen, Seagen, Celgene, and a competing firm. Between 50,000 and 100,000 per patient enrolled for one study from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, between 100,000 and 300,000 per year for each of the two total studies from Janssen and Sanofi, between 100,000 and 300,000 for enrolled patients for each of the two total studies from Janssen Research 
and development and to no one and abdity and 300,000 and 500,000 per year from one study from Harpoon Therapeutics. The waiver allows this individual to participate fully in today's deliberation. FDA's reasons for issuing the waiver are described in the waiver document, which is posted on the FDA's website on the advisory committee webpage, which can be found at www.fda.gov and by searching on March 15, 2024, ODAC. Copies of the waiver may also be obtained by submitting a written request to the Agency's Freedom of Information Division, 5630 Fishers Lane, Room 1035, Rockville, Maryland, 20857, or requests may be sent via fax to 301-827-9267. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to the FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Tara Frankel is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative, acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Frankel's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Frankel is employed by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. For the record, Dr. Sham Malankati, an employee of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, has acknowledged having contracts for grants from Bristol, Square, Bristol Myers Squibb and being a principal investigator or co-investigator on studies with Janssen Oncology, Takeda Oncology, Bristol Myers Squibb, Allogene Therapeutics, Fate Therapeutics, and Caribou Therapeutics. Dr. Malankati has also acknowledged receiving consulting fees from Janssen Oncology, Bristol Myers Squibb, Arcelex, AbV, Optimum Oncology, and Sanofi Aventus. As a guest speaker, Dr. Malankati will not participate in committee deliberations, nor will he vote. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and the exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you. Thank you, Madonna, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Rimpong. We will now proceed with the FDA introductory remarks from Dr. Robert Sokolik. Good morning, my name is Rob Sokolik. I'm the chief of the malignant hematology, hematology branch in the Office of Clinical Evalu Evaluation at CBER. I'm gonna briefly introduce the purpose of convening this convening of the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee meeting. Next slide, please. During this meeting, we'll be discussing the clinical development program for siltacabdigene autolucel, also known as siltacel and carvicti for the treatment of relapsed multiple myeloma. Siltacel is an autologous T-cell immunotherapy for the treatment of multiple myeloma. Cells are engineered to express a chimeric antigen receptor directed against BCMA, a protein expressed by benign and malignant plasma cells. Siltacel is currently approved for the treatment of adults with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after four or more prior lines of therapy, including a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory agent, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The applicant, Janssen, submitted a Supplemental Biologics License Application, or BLA, seeking expansion of the siltacel indication to read, Carvicti is a B-cell maturation antigen directed genetically modified autologous T-cell immunotherapy indicated for the treatment of adult patients with, with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least one prior line of therapy, including a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulatory agent and who are refractory to lenalidomide. Next slide, please. So during my brief remarks, I'll describe the meeting purpose, provide an overview of the trial whose results provide the basis for the applicant's request for approval and conclude with questions for which we're asking the committee's discussion. Next slide, please. Thank you, next slide. The applicant submitted the results of the CARDITUDE 4 trial to provide the evidence 
of safety and effectiveness of silt to cell for the proposed indication. Carter 2 4 demonstrated an improvement in progression free survival in patients randomized to silt to cell compared to patients randomized to standard of care treatment. During the review of the application, FDA identified the higher rate of early deaths in the silt to cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm as a major review issue. Specifically, visual inspection of the Kaplan Meyer curves for overall survival indicates a crossing hazards pattern with an early decre decrement in overall survival through the first 10 months. As you'll hear from my colleagues in the subsequent FDA presentations, the crossing hazards pattern renders the average hazard ratio uninterpretable. We ask the members of the committee to discuss and provide input on the adequacy of the data from the CARTITUDE 4 trial to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of silt to cell for the proposed indication, taking into account the effects of on progression-free survival and the increased rate of early deaths observed in the silt to cell arm. Next slide, please. I'll now briefly review the CARTITUDE 4 trial. Next slide, please. CARTITUDE 4 is an ongoing, open-label, randomized phase three clinical trial a total of 419 participants with relapsed to refractory multiple myeloma who are refractory to lenalidomide were randomized to either a single infusion of silt to cell after lymphapheresis, bespoke product manufacturing, and lymphodepleting chemotherapy, or to standard of care immunochemotherapy until progression or intolerance. Treatment response is assessed in CARTITUDE 4 using the 2016 IMWG criteria. Next slide, please. So this is shown here as the Kaplan-Meier plot for progression, for progression-free survival for the intention to treat population at the first interim analysis. Carditude 4 demonstrated a statistically significant effect on progression-free survival with a hazard ratio of 0 0.41, indicating a 59% decrease in hazard rate of progression for patients randomized to silt to cell compared to patients randomized to the standard of care. The median progression-free survival was not reached in the silt cell arm and was 12 months in the standard of care arm. Next slide, please. Card 4 demonstrated a numerically increased overall survival in the silt cell arm, although the crossing hazards pattern makes the hazard ratio uninterpretable. The median overall survival was not reached in the silt cell arm and was 26.7 months for the standard of care arm. My colleague, Dr. Pareto Pinto, will, inter will review these data in greater detail in the body of the presentation. Next slide, please. I'll now present the questions for the committee. Next slide, please. The review issues are that siltacaptogene autolucel led to a significantly improved rate of progression-free survival, but with a decrement in overall survival in the first 10 months of the trial. The decrement in overall survival calls into question whether the risk-benefit assessment is favorable. Next slide, please. We ask the members of, commit of the committee to discuss whether the observed increased risk of early death in the silt to cell arm of CARTITUDE 4 is offset by the statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival. Next slide, please. Shown here is the voting question, which I will read. Is the risk-benefit assessment for siltacabdogene autolucel for the proposed indication favorable? Thank you for your attention. I will now invite FDA's guest speaker, Dr. Shem Malankoti, the clinical director of the Cellular Therapy Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, who will provide an overview of current management of multiple myeloma. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sokolik. We'll now proceed with our guest speaker presentation from Dr. Shan Malkali. Thank you. So I'm gonna to try to summarize the current management of multiple myeloma in the next 20 or so minutes. Uh, next slide. These are my disclosures. Next slide. 
Um, so to begin with, I guess, incidence and prevalence of multiple myeloma, as many of you may know, this is the second most common blood cancer amongst adults in the U.S. There is probably about 35,000 patients being diagnosed with multiple myeloma every year. And the prevalence or the number of patients living with this disease is almost 160,000. Myeloma represents about 1.8% of all kidney cancer cases in the United States. Uh, and it's primarily seen in older adults. Uh, the median age is 69 years. Next slide. So we stage myeloma using either the revised ISS staging or the R2 ISS staging. And as shown here, uh, there are one to three or one to four different stages. We don't necessarily change treatments based on staging, at least currently, but suffice to say that higher stages generally are associated with less optimal outcomes. And the other point to note is these staging systems incorporate a cytogenetic risk factors. About 25% of our patients have one or more high risk cytogenetic factors, which again is associated with somewhat um, um, less optimal outcomes. Uh, the, the most trials that we will discuss and we have reported so far report the RISS staging, although the R2 ISS is a further refinement of this RISS staging. Next slide. Uh, we, this is one of several examples of population-based studies that have shown a consistent improvement in survival for patients with multiple myeloma over the last 30 or so years. Uh, in, and this improvement has been seen in the cross age groups, it includes patients younger than 65, 65 to 74, as well as 75 plus years. And this data only goes up to 2012, after which we've had many more new treatments become available. So it's expected that patients diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2023 will have an average life expectancy of 10 or more years. Next slide. And this is largely driven by a new drug development uh, over the last 25 or so years. We have had multiple classes of treatments become available for our patients, starting with immunomodulatory drugs and proteasome inhibitors in the 2000s, and then monoclonal antibodies targeting CD38 and SLAMF7. And then in the last five or so years, the introduction of T-cell redirecting therapies. And this is not a all-inclusive, but a pretty comprehensive list of treatments we have available for myeloma. And, and the three major classes we have are listed in the top here, proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, CD38 antibodies. And then the last seven or so years, we've had the development of T-cell redirecting therapies. Those are CAR T-cells or bispecific antibodies um, on the bottom right uh, listed here are the five currently approved products. Next slide. So starting with newly diagnosed myeloma, when the patient is diagnosed with myeloma for the very first time, the first kind of determination uh, that happens after initial screening and testing is to determine whether a patient is transplant eligible or ineligible. And this is based on several factors, including age, comorbidities, general fun um, organ function, um, and, and, and other clinical factors. And so patients who are transplant eligible are typically treated with induction therapy followed by consolidation, which is typically autologous stem cell transplant. This is for them followed by maintenance treatment. And for patients who are transplant ineligible, uh, they receive initial therapy with a combination of drugs followed by maintenance. As is standard for most of oncology, supportive care is given throughout the course of these treatments. And eventually when patients relapse, they go on to receiving treatments for the relapse disease. Next slide. So starting with management of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, I, this is a busy slide by the intent because we have a lot of data here, but uh, listed here are probably six of the major clinical trials that inform our current practice of managing patients with multiple myeloma. As shown here, most of these treatments are looking at either combinations of three drug induction compared to two drugs, or four drugs compared to three drugs. And one example, endurance in the middle, looking at a three drug versus three drug comparison. The second point to note is some of these studies were for patients who are transplant eligible, some were for transplant ineligible patients, and two studies where transplant was not intended but was feasible to, 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 to do in the studies. And then looking at response rates and complete response rates, I won't go through each of these uh, columns individually, but suffice it to say, three drugs typically get better responses than two, and four drugs provide better responses than three. And for the one three to three drug comparison, the response rates were quite similar. The next two slides, uh, call, uh, rows look at PFS and OS, median PFS and median OS. And list, uh, so, sorry, can you go back to the previous slide? 
Uh, and, and red highlights statistically significant results. Blue are, are those that have not yet met statistical significance. And again, as shown here, every time a three drug is compared to two drugs or four drug is compared to three drugs, uh, the progression-free survival is, 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 is improved statistically significantly. And in some of these studies, we're also seeing overall survival benefit. So in general, it's believed that three drugs are generally superior to two drugs, and with the 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 the, right, the the extreme right two columns, increasingly emerging data for induction therapy with four drugs. And when you use four drugs as part of induction, you're using a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory drug, and a CD eight thirty eight a CD thirty eight antibody, all as part of the initial induction treatment. Next slide. So as mentioned, for patients who are transplant eligible, there's a consideration of doing a consolidative autologous transplant after initial induction. And there are currently two major clinical trials that inform the practice of transplant. And both studies looked at the use of autologous transplant in the early or upfront setting or deferred, uh, i.e. at the time of relapse. The first study is IFM 2009. This is from the French myeloma group. And the second study is from the determination study here, done here in the United States. And in both studies, patients received induction therapy with the standard three-drug induction of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. And then uh, thereafter, patients were randomized to receive either transplant in the early setting or transplant that was deferred. And regardless of the transplant status, pay all patients received lenalidomide maintenance for two years in the IFM study and indefinitely in the determination study. As shown here, both studies showed a pretty uh, significant improvement in the median progression-free survival. However, with eight years of follow for the IFM study and almost five years for the determination study, there was no difference in overall survival. Um, and so in summary, it's clear with modern ther induction therapies that the uh, autologous transplant continues to improve progression-free survival, but uh, not quite yet um, any difference in overall survival in either of these two studies. And to the bottom panel are, are, are the four relevant studies for maintenance treatment. So again, regardless of whether patients get uh, consolidation or not, most patients then move on to maintenance. The only approved treatment for maintenance currently in the United States is uh, lenalidomide, and that is based on these four large clinical trials. And each of these studies showed a significant improvement in median progression-free survival with the use of lenalidomide as maintenance compared to placebo. And one of the studies has also shown an overall survival benefit. This is the, the US study, CLGB100104. Uh, but also a meta-analysis of all these four studies has shown an improvement in overall survival, suggesting again that lenalidomide maintenance uh, with or without consolidation is the, the default standard of care for patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Next slide. So to summarize this section, um, standard induction therapy for patients with multiple myeloma is either a combination of three or increasingly four drugs. And when you use four drugs, all three major classes of our treatments are incorporated, proteasome inhibitors, immunomodulatory drugs, and CD38 antibodies. The role of autologous transplantation as consolidation is evolving. This is based on data that PFS is improved, but similar OS. And therefore, increasingly fewer transplant eligible patients, especially here in the US, are receiving upfront autologous transplantation, although it remains a, an important treatment consideration. Maintenance, particularly with lenalidomide, remains the current standard of care. Uh, it has consistently improved progression to survival in multiple large randomized studies, and a meta-analysis also shows an improvement in overall survival. Although the number is evolving, I think it's fair to say that median progression-free survival based on all of these clinical trials and some of the real-world data for patients receiving first-line therapy is currently estimated to be about four to seven years. Next slide. So I come back to the slide to say that these are the same 18 or so drugs we have uh, that we can use for patients with relapsed myeloma. Uh, and, and, and next slide. And when patients relapse, uh, there are a plethora of choices you have in front of you because of different combinations of these uh, 18 drugs that you can use. I've listed, I think, 42 or different choices here, but there may be others as well. One thing to note here is there's a lot of overlap between these regimens. As you can see, all the alphabets are kind of overlapping. Uh, and therefore, while there are 42 choices, most patients have uh, been exposed to some of these treatments or classes of these treatments previously. And there's a significant amount of cross resistance across the different classes of drugs and agents used, such that subsequent lines of therapies uh, generally become more and more challenging. Next slide. 
And how, so how do we use these 42 regiments or more than 42 regiments in the, for the patient sitting in front of us? I guess we use different factors. For instance, what's the nature of relapse? Is it symptomatic, asymptomatic? How aggressive is the patient's relapse? Should we be using high-dose chemotherapy to control aggressive relapse? We also look at side effect profiles for these drugs uh, and as well as patient's own um, history of side effects, peripheral neuropathy, for instance, may, may steer us towards using some drugs versus other cardiac dysfunction, renal dysfunction, cytopenias, uh, immune function, all of these play into our choices of which regimens to use. Patient factors like frail, frailty, how far does the patient live from the treatment center? Does the patient prefer an oral drug compared to infusions? Eligibility for clinical trial participation, uh, those are also factors. And finally, mechanism of action. Has the patient received a, uh, uh, the same tre treatment previously or a different drug from the same class? What was the, the response to that treatment previously? Could we use an alternate mechanism of action? Uh, and refractoriness or exposure to a class of drug are all factors we, we use to determine what treatments to use in the relapse refractory setting. Next slide. And again, when we have patients who have relapsed myeloma, we generally think of patients as being either lenalidomide refractory or not refractory. And listed here are the key clinical trials that inform the management of patients who are not lenalidomide refractory. I'll note that as more and more patients receive lenalidomide maintenance in the initial setting, we increasingly have patients who are lenalidomide refractory at the time of relapse. But in the rare instances that a patient is not lenalidomide refractory, one of these four clinical trials using lenalidomide backbone may inform the practice of what to do next. Each of these trials look as a combination of three drugs compared to two drugs. And in every instance, the progression-free survival is better for the three drugs compared to two drugs. And in most of these cases, as shown here, the overall survival has also improved with the three drug combination compared to two drugs. So in general, three drug combinations are better than two drugs, both for PFS and OS in this setting. Next slide. So if you have patients who are lenalidomide diffractory, which increasingly is the more common scenario when patients relapse, there are several clinical trials that inform. Again, most of these studies are looking at a three-drug combination compared to two drugs. Uh, I've listed here the different uh, treatment regimens. Uh, and these trials are largely for patients with either one to three or more than two lines of treatment. And in every case, three drugs provides better responses and better complete responses compared to two drugs. And in every case, the three-drug regimen has a better progression-free survival uh, compared to two drugs. In, in a couple of instances, we also have overall survival benefit uh, to the three drug versus through two drugs. And in some other instances, we either uh, the data is not mature enough or uh, have not demonstrated an overall survival benefit, highlighting some of the challenges of multiple um, uh, subsequent lines of treatment and other challenges with long-term follow-up for overall survival in these clinical trials. Next slide. And so uh, one final thought about relapse refractory myeloma in this setting is that attrition through lines of therapy, uh, we, we do have several choices uh, for treatment. However, not every patient who gets diagnosed with multiple myeloma receives third, fourth, or fifth lines of therapy. This is one example from a US claims-based data set uh, that was published by Dr. Fonseca and colleagues a few years back, looking at non-transplant patients who receive first-line treatment. Only about 8% of those patients receive fifth line of treatment, although we have several treatments now approved for fifth line. And for transplant patients, that number is about 22%. Um, the, the, the study tries to look into what might be some of the reasons for attrition, and that's harder to do with an insurance claims data. But one of the reasons is unfortunately death. But that's not actually the most common reason for attrition across lines. Some of the, uh, the purported reasons could be that patients drop off, have side effects, or can't access treatments, um, other reasons for drop off. And this is uh, data from US claims um, uh, res uh, database. But similar data has been reported from Europe and Australia as well, suggesting that a fair amount of patients who get newly diagnosed myeloma do not uh, receive uh, third, fourth, or fifth lines of treatment uh, despite multiple approvals and choices available. Next slide. So what about triple class exposed patients, patients who have already been exposed to or refractory to one proteasome inhibitor, one uh, immunomodulatory drug, and one um, um, uh, CD38 antibody? We don't have a lot of prospective randomized data in this setting, but two uh, observational data sets, again, one international, one here in the US, the mammoth is here from a US-based uh, observational study, locomotion, more international. Both of them show that with conventional treatments, uh, less than 30% of patients were 
respond to the to, to next line of treatment if they're already triple class exposed. The median progression free survival in this setting is under six months, and median survival is somewhere between nine to 12 months. I highlight again that these are both observational data sets, and we don't currently have a lot of prospective long term data for triple class exposed patients. However, whatever limited data we have available would suggest a response rate with conventional treatments of around 30% and a median PFS of less than six months. Next slide. So that's before we had T cell redirecting therapies, CAR T cells uh, on, the, uh, on the left here, and by specific antibodies, CAR T cells are, are autologous gene engineered or um, uh, T cells that target a tumor specific antigens. By specific antibodies, on the other hand, are off the shelf drugs that target, on the one hand, a tumor specific antigen, uh, and on the other side, binds to CD3, which is present on T cells, and redirects these T cells towards the, the tumor cells. Next slide. We have now five different uh, T cell redirecting therapies, immune therapies that are approved for patients with four or more prior lines of treatment. Each of these treatments have been approved based on single arm pivotal studies, so not randomized comparisons. None of these treatments have been compared head to head in, uh, uh, so far. And each of these treatments, like I said, are approved for patients with uh, very advanced multiple myeloma. In these studies, median of five to six prior lines of treatments, but showing a very high response rate, uh, order of 60 to 95, 98 percent for each of these products, uh, and, and complete response rates in the order of 30 to 83 percent. Uh, the median progression-free survival, again, in this non-randomized single-arm study is between eight months, eight and a half months, to 35 months. In terms of safety, while these treatments have high efficacy, they also come with toxicity concerns. For instance, cytokine release syndrome and neurologic symptoms are class effects for these drugs. Shown here are the rates of CRS and ICANS. And immune compromise and infections are another particularly challenging side effect with many of these treatments. Next slide. So for honing in on some of these side effects, which will be discussed later today at the meeting as well, I'm sure, is number one is cytokine release syndrome or CRS. This has been reported with most T cell directed therapies, and not only in myeloma, but across disease settings and across treatment modalities. And the key symptoms include fever, hypoxia, hypotension. Any grade CRS is seen as shown in the previous slide in 70 to 95% of patients. Grade three or higher, though, is less than 5% with each of these products. Our management of CRS has improved um, dramatically in the last 10 or so years with the use of IL-6 blocking drugs like um, tocilizumab and steroids like dexamethasone. And there are some patients with each of these products that develop a more severe form of inflammation called hemophagocytic syndromes as well. On the, the right are um, uh, features of immune effector cell-associated neurologic toxicities or ICANs. Again, symptoms here include lethargy, confusion, somnolence, seizures. Any grade ICANs is 20 to 25 percent, grade three or higher, less than 5 percent. And treatments here include steroids or anakinra. And there are some patients with these products that also develop a distinct neurologic syndrome that's somewhat delayed by weeks to months and presents as in the form of either Parkinson's-like features or cranial neuropathies and doesn't fit into the classical ICANs definition or timeline. Next slide. And then, uh, you know, looking at, I guess, really logistics of CAR T cells. So they, it's, it is a pretty unique treatment in that it's customized and it's individualized. So there's multiple steps involved in providing these treatments to patients and, and bottlenecks also uh, that are associated with each steps. There's initial screening, screening when we see the patient to determine whether they're eligible. And then we have to find a slot available for them to collect their T cells. We also have to work with logistics like donor room, um, catheter placement, treatment washouts. All of this may take two to four weeks. After all of this, we apheres or collect their T cells. This is a single day process, takes about three to four hours. And once the collection is done, many patients, especially in the advanced setting where patients have had four or more lines of treatment, need bridging therapy because they're rapidly progressing. The challenge here is we have very limited bridging options in this setting because many of these patients have already been exposed to most available treatments. And the choices for bridging that we have have low responses and typically high toxicities, which becomes a challenge. And, and then we have to consider treatment washout before CAR T cell infusion. And, and so the current time from, uh, from the apheresis to bridging to CAR-T infusion can be four to eight weeks. So all in all, from the time when we see the patient to them actually getting the CAR-T cell can be upwards of eight to 12 weeks in the current scenario for the currently approved CAR-T cells. And when you give CAR-T cells to patients with high burden of disease, as often happens with advanced multiple myeloma, we also recognize that there's higher uh, incidence of toxicities with refractory disease and high burden of disease. 
disease. So uh, these are all some of the challenges we're facing with the currently approved um, indications for CAR T cells. And, and some, of, some of that may steer us towards using bispecific antibodies due to ease of access and, and uh, ready availability of these treatments in the advanced setting. Next slide. There are other challenges as well to both these treatments, the need for specialized centers, inpatient management, and the management of toxicities, availability, as I mentioned, for CAR T cells, the turnaround time. The efficacy is high, but so is cost, and the access is limited. And then finally, bridging therapy, which is particularly, as indicated previously, needed for CAR T cells, but obviously not needed for bispecific antibodies. Next slide. So to summarize the section on relapse refractory myeloma, we have multiple available options, but significant overlap in mechanisms. Uh, cross resistance and attrition through lines of therapy limits choices. A triple class exposed patients remain a particular challenge where we have limited data for long-term survival. T-cell redirecting therapies in the form of CAR T-cells or bispecific antibodies have high responses in this setting. And uh, to date, I guess until recently, had limited long-term and randomized data for safety and survival. Next slide. And to summarize the entire talk, I would say we've made substantial progress in the multi treatment of multiple myeloma. By some counts, we have 19 different FDA-approved treatments for myeloma, and most of these treatments became available in the last two decades. This has directly led to consistent improvements in survival, both in our clinical trials as well as population-based studies. But despite these improvements, um, it's somewhat sobering to say that most patients who have a diagnosis of multiple myeloma will die from the diagnosis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Malincotti. We will now take clarifying questions uh, for our guest speaker, Dr. Malincotti. Please use the raised hand icon to indicate that you have a question and remember to lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon after you have asked your question. When acknowledged by the chair, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to Dr. Malincotti. I guess he'd be the speaker here. Uh, if you wish, uh, for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know uh, the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you or that's the end of my question for now. Uh, so we can move on to the next member. So I don't know if we have any questions for Dr. Malakati, but now would be uh, an opportunity. Let me see if I can. Okay, Dr. Vasan. <clears throat> Hi, um, th that was a really uh, uh, elucidating presentation. Thank you. Um, I had a question, you know, I'm a solid tumor oncologist. And one thing we think a lot about is disease free intervals in solid tumor oncology. And there are many studies that, you know, correlate disease free intervals, especially in long indolent diseases like myeloma or ER positive breast cancer with improved or, or, or decreased responses to subsequent therapies. And I was wondering if any of the therapies, I know you presented so many different regimens, but if there's, if that theme um, uh, is manifest in, in myeloma. Uh, thank you, Dr. Watson. So I, I would say that our management of multiple myeloma involves some form of treatment on an ongoing, at least the current management. All of the treatments involve either a component of maintenance or a component of continuous treatments in the relapse refractory setting, such that many of my patients in clinic really don't get a, a complete treatment-free interval uh, throughout the course of the disease. Now, the intensity of the treatment may vary. Uh, they start with combinations of drugs and then single drug maintenance, uh, but uh, most of the, the, the regimens we have available, both newly diagnosed as well as relapsed myeloma, involves ongoing treatments, with the exception, I guess, with the four plus lines with the recent approval of CAR T cells, those patients tend to generally are monitored without any additional treatments after. So yes, we do have disease-free intervals where patients are in remission or response, uh, but, that's, but there is benefit to continuing ongoing treatments for many of these regimens. So there's really no treatment-free interval for many of our patients. But, but so, e but even in, um, for instance, you presented a trial where there's indefinite lenalidomide maintenance. Even even in uh, let's let's say let's let's still consider that a disease free interval in a way yes. because yes. we're calling it maintenance therapy. It, it, it's some micrometastatic or some you know microscopic disease. So so let's just call it that. It, even with that, is there a correlation? Uh, correlation with uh... with improved response to subsequent therapies. 
Oh, sure. Uh, so I guess the question is, uh, if you have a good response to a prior therapy, would you respond also with that indicative of a good response to the next line of therapy? In general, yes, but as the class of treatments change very dramatically, so for instance, we have patients who get CAR T-cells also by specific that have never received a T-cell redacting therapies that are refractory to all other available classes that have had a very long response to it. And so I don't know that because the classes are so different and there are so many different classes that a response or duration of response uh, to a previous line fully informs next line response. That said, there are some common themes to patients who don't, don't respond. So for instance, patients with high-risk cytogenetics, patients who have extramedullary disease, uh, patients who have RS, RSS stage three disease, those patients generally tend to, fewer of those patients respond and respond to a shorter period of time, largely agnostic of the, the treatment classes uh, that we have available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boston. Dr. Frankel? Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on the bridging therapies. I saw that you said low response and limited options. And can you, so could you just tell us a little bit more about how physicians go about that and why the options are limited when there's so, seems like there's so many drugs available? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, um, you know, the current, uh, the slide refers to the current use of CAR T cells, which is for patients who have received four or more lines of treatment. So this is a patient on fifth line uh, that is coming to us to get a CAR T cells. Invariably, they have received a proteasome inhibitor, uh, an immunomodulatory drug, and a CD38 antibody previously. That's the requirement. Many of them have actually received more than one immunomodulatory drug, more than one PI, and a CD38 antibody. So a large proportion of these patients are definitely triple class refractory. Many are what we would consider as penta refractory, which means that they're refractory to five different drugs that are the backbone of many of our treatments. I also mentioned that increasingly we're using all three classes of drugs in the first and certainly in the second line treatment. So you can imagine by the time they come to fifth line, we don't have a lot of effective treatment choices. We have a lot of choices, but they're not necessarily effective. Many of these patients are also progressing on, on available treatment. So, and like I said, there is about eight to 12 weeks that we need from when I think about giving somebody a CAR T cells to them actually getting a CAR T cell because of various logistical other, other bottleneck. And, 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 and so in that setting, even our choices of effective bridging is somewhat limited. And this is borne out by clinical trials. So that led to the approval where bridging therapy was used uh, uh, for these uh, trials and response rates are under 30, 40%. That's also borne out by real world experience and our own experience here. And those responses don't tend to be particularly robust or durable. The second challenge is in our attempt to get deeper responses, if you use multi-drug traditional chemotherapy, which we sometimes do, that can lead to cytopenias, infections in some cases, and further delays in patients getting CAR T cells. So both you know, our, our ability to get a good response and our ability to manage toxicities in this setting is somewhat limited such that invariably some of our patients are going into these treatments with rapidly progressing disease or, or, or symptomatic disease or ongoing toxicities from their bridging therapy. Uh, so I would say it, it is one of the, the key challenges uh, as we think about using these treatments in clinic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Hi, this is Chris Lee, University of Colorado. Thank you so much for that outstanding talk. Um, you know, you showed a, a lot of different trials uh, in, in different settings. And one of the things that struck me was this difference in progression-free survival, which in some cases were extreme differences, right, uh, between treatment arms. But then when you look at overall survival, several of the studies have either no significant difference in overall survival or despite a humongous difference in progression-free survival, the overall survival difference is sometimes, you know, somewhat marginal in comparison. And, you know, I, I understand in, in a kind of indolent disease, and I'm a solid tumor oncologist, so I think about this like a neuroendocrine tumor, I just want to see your or hear your impression about how you as a clinician, you know, treating patients, uh, you know, interpret this difference in progression-free survival, knowing that overall survival may be marginally different or in some cases not different at all and how you perceive the benefit to your patients uh, when thinking about these options if you're not massively in, in, you know increasing overall survival but you have this kind of long progression-free survival period 
Thank you. So I'll give you my perspective, which this is obviously a very important, and I don't know that I know all the answers, but my perspective is the following, which is that if you look at the earliest randomized studies, those were some of the first studies I presented in relapse refractive multiple myeloma before we had the plethora of treatment choices we had available. These are the studies that looked at lenalidomide and dexamethasone as control arm and adding a novel drug or a new drug as combination. There were four studies that I highlighted. Each of them at initial report showed PFS, no difference in OS. And now with extended follow-up, three out of those four studies have also shown overall survival benefit. So I think that reflects that when in an era when these studies were done, where there were limited post-progression treatment choices, both here in the U.S. and internationally where these studies are done, it was a little bit easier to follow patients long enough and have a relatively um, uh, uh, accurate estimate of long-term overall survival. What has changed in the last five to seven years is that, number one, patients are living longer, which is a great great challenge to have. Uh, and they're living longer because they can get multiple other lines of treatments. Uh, and, and so increasingly common that the patients are progressing. Sorry, Dr. Maghali. Um, at this moment, uh, there shouldn't be any discussion in regards to questions um, that's geared towards the committee from your end. Oh, fair enough. Sorry. Dr. Madonna, I hand it back to you. Sorry. No problem. Go ahead. Okay, continue with that guidance, Dr. Malankati. Oh, so I was just going to, to I, should I speak about it? Or? May I introduce, please? May I interrupt, please? Go ahead. Who is this? Yes, hi, good morning. This is Lola Fashona J from the Office of Clinical Evaluation in CBER. I, um, I would like to interrupt and um, just to remind um, the committee and the chair um, that Dr. Malankati is an FDA invited guest and the purview and the scope of his participation today is to provide the disease overview and he should not be weighing in on any questions related to the reason we are convening these ODAC today. Thank you. Okay. So I think we'll move on to, uh, I think we've got two, well, let me see, do we, I think we have uh, two more questions here. Um, or hand still rage, I guess, Dr. Dr. Lattimore. Hi, thank you. Thank you for that background. That was incredibly helpful. Um, you showed a slide that had uh, fifth line treatments or you showed a progression over time of where uptake of subsequent treatments waned over time um, and the use of subsequent treatments really narrowed. Um, and you mentioned in particular access issues um, and access to CAR-T in particular. Can you share a little bit um, and expand on contributing factors to this access to this treatment and what may play into that a little bit more? Um, I, I will clarify that the data I presented from the study was from 2020, so the CAR T cells were not quite widely available quite yet, but the same themes hold true. What the data showed was that uh, I think as you um, as you go further in lines of treatment, patients fewer and fewer patients get you know, subsequent lines of treatment. And the reasons are probably one is patients unfortunately die. Second is the median age, as I showed, is about 69 years for patients with multiple myeloma. So accrual of toxicities, uh, inability to travel to, to treatment sites, other reasons may preclude it, uh, preclude getting other lines of treatment. Specifically about access to CAR T cells, I would say the challenges are that at this point, CAR T cells are available in limited specialized centers. So um, it's not every oncology practice or every oncologist that can give his patient, his or her patient CAR T cells currently, uh, and therefore the patients need to be referred to specialized centers like um, that, that, are, that have access to CAR T cells, so number one. The second is these are autologous CAR T cells, uh, so there's somewhat limited availability of slots to apheres in manufacture that we hope will improve over time, but that also leads to a bottleneck. And, and, and the third, I guess, is that there's significant disruptions to, to patients' own uh, life. They have to sometimes relocate to a different city and live here for four, six, eight weeks uh, to get these treatments, which may not be feasible for all patients or, 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 or uh, maybe may not be considered for all patients. So all, all, all of those factors put together, I think uh, you know, the use of treatments like CAR T cells, particularly and access to them, continues to be a significant challenge. And can you give me an understanding of how many specialty centers exist currently? Uh, I think it's different for different products. I would, I, I don't know the exact number, but I would guess it's somewhere between 50 to 100 sites across the US, but that's my estimate. And it's different for different products because different 
hospitals and health centers um, you know, have licensing agreements with different products and fact accreditation that's required for many of them. But I would say for the different approved indications for CAR T cells in myeloma and other, uh, other diseases is somewhere between 50 to 100 sites perhaps. And they're all largely focused in large, um, larger cities and, 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 uh, and less access in rural areas, smaller cities. So there are certain uh, parts of the country where people may have to travel two, three hours before they get to the closest CAR T cell uh, center. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Malincotti, for that presentation and um, the question and answer session. I think it informed the audience and our panel as well. Thank you. So uh, slide five, I think. Um, both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To insert, ensure such transparency, the advisory committee FD, and the FDA believes, and the FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, the FDA encourages all applicants, including the applicants, non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the applicant, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, and in the interest of the applicant, including equity interests and those based upon the outcome of this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentations to advise the committee if you have not, if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of the presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. So with that, we will now proceed with the Janssen Biotech uh, presentation. I turn the floor over to you. Good morning, Mr. Chair members of the advisory committee, and members of VFDA. I'm Sen Zhuang, Vice President of Oncology Research and Development from Johnson & Johnson. Thank you for the opportunity today to review the data supporting CARVIC-D, which will be referred to as Cell, for the treatment of patients with a relapse and mental little mild refractory multiple myeloma. Cell is a BCMA or B-cell maturation antigen direct CAR-T therapy that is genetically engineered from patients' own T cells to target multiple myeloma. It was approved by the US FDA in February of 2022 for the treatment of patients with a relapse or refractory multiple myeloma who have received four or more prior lines of therapy, including a proteosome inhibitor, a immunomodulatory agent, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. Cytosel is among one of the most active agents ever developed for multiple myeloma. In the pivotal CAR-T1 study, 97 patients with a highly advanced multiple myeloma was treated with sickle cell. The overall response rate was 98% and stringent complete response rate was over 80%. With extended follow-up, the median progression-free survival was 34.9 months compared with historic control of approximately three to five months in a similar patient population. Today, we are here to discuss CAR-T4 study and to seek an expanded indication for the treatment of patients with a relapse and then a little mind refractory multiple myeloma. The CAR-T4 study is an international randomized control phase three study of cell in patients with a relapse or refractory multiple myeloma who have received one, to three prior lines of therapy and whose disease are refractory to lenalidomide. This is a patient population with high unmet medical need with a median progression fee survival of approximately 12 months with the current standard of care. A one-time infusion of pseudocell demonstrates clinically meaningful and highly statistical significant improvement in progression fee survival, the primary endpoint and key secondary endpoints of overall response rate, complete response rate, MRD, or minimum residual disease negativity rate compared with continuous standard therapy. These deep and durable responses are not attainable by the standard treatment modalities, and with additional follow-up, has translated into a strong trend in improvement of overall survival that has further strengthened as data mature. Additionally, 
subgroup analysis demonstrate consistent benefit of citazel in both progression-free survival and overall survival across all subgroups. You will hear that the safety profile observed in citazel in cognitive four study is consistent with its known safety profile in the approved label and is consistent with its mechanism of action as a CAR-T therapy. The observed early imbalance in the progression-free survival and overall survival event are driven by patients who did not receive cell, and it was not due to cell toxicity. In totality, the data we will present today will support a positive benefit and risk for cell for the treatment of patients with a relapse in an olutamide refractory multiple myeloma. Consistent with the study population of CARDI24 study, the proposed indication is a cell for the treatment of patients with a relapse or refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least one prior lines of therapy and whose disease are refractory to the halodomide. With this information uh, in mind, here are the agenda of today's presentation. Dr. Irene Gorbia from Dana Farber Cancer Institute will discuss the continued unmet medical need for the treatment of patients with a relapse and refractory multiple myeloma, particularly in the area of lentolidomide refractory multiple myeloma. Then Dr. Jordan Schechter from Johnson & Johnson will review the efficacy and safety data supporting today's application. Finally, we have Dr. Sandra Jagannath from Mount Sinai in New York City, who will conclude the presentation with his clinical perspectives. With us here are additional experts to help answer potential questions you may have. All outside experts have been compensated for their time to today's meeting. Thank you, and I'll now turn the presentation to Dr. Gobier. Thank you. My name is Irene Gobriel. I'm a professor of medicine at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School. I'm a physician scientist working at Dana-Farber now for over 19 years. In addition to my work with patients with multiple myeloma, I run a translational lab, and I am currently the principal investigator of a clinical trial with Siltacel in high-risk smoldering myeloma. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here to review the background of multiple myeloma and the clear unmet need for this patient population. Multiple myeloma is the second most common hematological malignancy. Over the last 15 years, survival has improved significantly. Before 2010, our patients only survived between two to five years. Since 2011, patients are living a median of 10 years and longer. This improvement is due to the use of ongoing combinations of therapy and the new era of immunotherapy, including CAR-T therapy and bispecific antibodies. This has further strengthened the survival of our patients. Despite all of these advances, myeloma is still an incurable disease. We owe it to our patients to keep improving our therapies. <clears throat> You've already heard about CAR-T2-1 data and how CAR-T therapy has emerged as an important late-line treatment in multiple myeloma and has truly changed the landscape of patient care. The question we need to consider now is do we need to use this beneficial therapy once patients become lenalidomide refractory rather than the current indication following four lines of therapy? I would personally say yes for several reasons. Multiple studies have shown that the use of our best therapy in earlier setting can lead to deeper remission and longer outcome for our patients with myeloma. We also know that patients are lost to attrition with each line of therapy. Biologically, T cells become more exhausted with advanced disease and subsequent lines of therapy. Therefore, the development of CAR T cells from less exhausted T cells in an earlier disease setting would lead to the development of more robust CAR T cells, which would indicate that those T cells would have better long-term outcome. Additionally, the current standard of care in first relapse is used indefinitely and is associated with its own toxicity profile. Using one and done CAR T therapy earlier helps improve the benefit for our patients. Let me review each of these points more closely. 
Initial treatment is the best chance for deep and durable remission. You can see here the high attrition and death rate, which underscores the need to use more effective treatments earlier. Our patients may not live to the fourth or fifth line of therapy. With the current indication, as few as 15% of patients are able to receive Siltacel as a treatment option. Multiple studies have shown that the T-cell repertoire changes over the course of the disease. This is a key research focus in my lab where we are studying single cell sequencing of immune cells. Changes occur in the immune system during disease progression with a significant increase in exhausted T cells with each progression. We see that there are more terminally differentiated T cells at the later stages of the disease. Developing CAR T cells from less exhausted T cells is beneficial. Several studies have shown that naive-like central memory T cells that are enriched in earlier, earlier disease stages are associated with a better clinical response. In addition, the longer PFS observed in CAR T1 was directly associated with a less exhausted stem cell-like phenotype of the CAR product. Here are the current treatment options in the second line of therapy, and many of them are not as effective in lenalidomide refractory disease. All of these options require continuous therapy and therefore come with added toxicity and added burden for the patient who has to think of their disease every day of their life. The potential benefit I can see using Silta cell earlier is not only to provide patients a high response rate, but also a life without continuous therapy. Here's a schematic to better understand the patient journey with Silta cell in the Cartitude 4 study. Upon relapse, we look to see if CAR-T is a viable option for our patients with myeloma. Once selected, we collect the T-cells by doing apheresis, which is a simple one-day outpatient procedure. Then, all patients are put on at least one cycle of bridging therapy to control disease. In the CAR-T2-4 protocol, this was specified to be one of two standard of care triplets. However, in clinical practice, the bridging therapy will be tailored to the individual needs of the patient. The choice of bridging therapy continues to evolve. Our goal is to control the disease with bridging therapy before the patient receives CAR T therapy. Once we have all the T cells back, we perform lymphodepletion for three days with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, and then we infuse the CAR T cells. And finally, we closely monitor the patients for toxicities of the CAR T center. With each successive relapse, symptoms return, quality of life worsens, and the chance and the duration of response decreases. Patients with lenalidomide refractory multiple myeloma have poor outcomes with current standard therapy. Therefore, there remains a significant and critical unmet need for new therapeutic options in these patients to be used earlier in the treatment sequence. I can't emphasize enough that we should provide our patients with the best treatments as early as possible. This will help improve their outcomes, as they unfortunately may never get to later lines of therapy. CAR-T offers our patients a great opportunity to have a deeper remission and a better long-term outcome. Thank you. I'll turn the presentation to Dr. Schechter to review the clinical data. Thank you, Dr. Gobriel. Uh, my name is Jordan Schechter. I am the Vice President for Clinical Development of Myeloma at Johnson & Johnson. And I'm pleased to present the clinical efficacy and safety data supporting Silta cell based on the CAR-T4 study. This study was designed in consultation with the FDA and other regulatory authorities worldwide. The study population in CAR-T4 includes adults diagnosed with multiple myeloma who've received between one and three prior lines of therapy, including prior exposure to a proteasome inhibitor, an immunomodulatory drug, and additionally, who are refractory to lenalidomide. Prior to randomization, investigators selected the standard of care for each patient. With this decision, patients were to be randomized one-to-one -one to receive either standard of care or silta cell. Standard of care therapy consisted of the investigator's choice of either PVD, which is pomalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone, or DPD, daratumumab, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone. Patients randomized to Silta cell underwent apheresis to acquire peripheral blood mononuclear cells, followed by at least one cycle of bridging therapy with the aforementioned standard of care triplet. 
Thereafter, patients receive lymphodepletion consisting of cyclophosphamide and fludarabine for three days. Siltacel was then administered days five through seven after the start of the conditioning regimen. Crossover was not part of the study design. That is, patients randomized to standard of care did not have Siltacel automatically offered at progression, although some patients did receive commercial or investigational CAR-T at the discretion of the treating physician. The primary endpoint of the study was progression-free survival. Key secondary endpoints included complete response or better, overall response, MRD negativity, and overall survival. The primary endpoint and major secondary response-related endpoints were assessed by the International Myeloma Working Group criteria using a computerized algorithm and also an independent review committee. As you can see on this slide, the two arms were well-balanced in terms of baseline demographics, disease characteristics, including in patients with higher risk disease. The median age of study participants was around 61, with slightly greater proportion of male patients in both groups. Most patients in both arms had a baseline ECOG status of zero and an ISS stage of one. Soft tissue plasmocytomas, which are known to be a high risk feature, were slightly higher in silta cell patients compared to standard of care patients. The median time from myeloma diagnosis to randomization was three years, with approximately one third of patients having one prior line, two thirds having between two and three prior lines. About 60% of patients had high risk cytogenetics and all were refractory to lenalidomide as per study entry criteria. About a quarter of patients were refractory to an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. Here you can see the consort diagram. The ITT analysis consisted of 419 patients randomized, 208 to cell, 211 to standard of care. Of these, 416 patients received any part of study treatment. This comprises our safety analysis set. Three patients were randomized to standard of care, but were not treated. Of the 208 patients randomized to Siltacel, 32 patients experienced disease progression or died prior to receiving Siltacel as study treatment. Of those, 20 patients received Siltacel as subsequent therapy after disease progression. This leaves us with 176 patients in the as-treated patient population subset. There are currently 143 Siltacel treated patients who are still in ongoing follow-up for progression compared to only 77 patients who receive standard of care. Now let's turn to our results, starting with our primary endpoint. A one-time infusion of Siltacel demonstrated clinically meaningful and statistically significant improvement in the primary endpoint of progression-free survival as compared to continuous therapy with standard of care. The median progression-free survival for Siltacel was not reached. This compares to 11.8 months with standard of care. In consultation with the FDA, we analyzed the primary endpoint in two ways. The pre-specified primary analysis resulted in a weighted hazard ratio of 0.26. This indicates a 74% reduction in the risk of death or progression compared to standard of care. A weighted hazard ratio includes events which occur after eight weeks. The standard unweighted intent to treat analysis, including all events, results in a hazard ratio for PFS of 0 0.40. Now the PFS curves do cross. This depicts an early imbalance of PFS events. In the first eight weeks of the study, 22 PFS events were observed in the silta cell arm compared with eight in the standard of care arm. However, during this initial period, both arms were prescribed the same exact standard of care treatments. In fact, all 22 events in the silta cell arm occurred prior to silta cell infusion. We'll review the crossing of the curves in more detail shortly. First, let's look at the overall data across subgroups. Here you can see that the silta cell benefit was consistent across every single subgroup tested. These data reaffirm that all patients have the potential to experience a meaningful benefit in terms of progression-free survival. The progression-free survival results are supported by robust secondary endpoints all favoring Siltacel versus standard of care. 
Silt-to-cell demonstrated deep and durable responses following the single infusion. This resulted in a statistically significant odds ratio for obtaining a complete response or better of 10.3 between silt-to-cell and the standard of care for the ITT population. In terms of overall response rate, 85% of all patients randomized to silt cell obtained a response compared to only 67% with standard of care. Importantly, when we consider the 176 patients who received silt cell as study treatment, 99% or 175 out of the 176 patients had an overall response. The depth and durability of response observed with silt cell is something not observed with any other modality and is important for long-term outcomes such as progression-free survival and, of course, overall survival. Now let's look at the DOR curves. Duration of response includes patients who achieve the response of PR or better. The DOR is calculated from the start of a response to the first documented evidence of disease progression or death, whichever comes first. Median DOR was not reached for silt cell and was 16.6 months for standard of care. 85% of the patients in the silt cell arm were in response at 12 months, compared to only 63% in the standard of care arm. The endpoint of MRD, or minimal residual disease, was also met, with an odds ratio of 8.7 and a significant p-value of less than 0.0001 in the ITT population. MRD negativity is highly indicative of long-term outcomes, and therefore it's a very meaningful measure for patients. In patients evaluable for MRD, 88% in the silt cell arm achieved MRD negativity at 10 to the minus five threshold, compared to only 33% in the standard of care. Now, of course, overall survival is a key secondary endpoint. So let's take a look at the most recent data. Our most recent data cut for overall survival was in December of 2023. This was conducted at the request of the European Medicines Agency. At this point, we've observed 48 deaths in the silt cell arm, 77 deaths in the standard of care arm, and the resulting hazard ratio for OS is 0.57. Now, additional follow-up will not change the early portion of the curve. However, we see an increasing separation of the OS curves over time. And when we look at the forest plot in OS using the most recent data cut, we also see consistent effect favoring silt cell for each and every subgroup assessed. Looking further into the deaths, the only period in which we see more deaths on the experimental arm versus standard of care arm is between zero and three months. There were seven deaths in the experimental arm and one death in the standard of care arm. But recall that most patients who progressed early did so prior to silt cell treatment. So a more informative way to look at these data is to break it out by silt cell exposure. Here you can see that six out of the seven deaths prior to three months were in patients randomized to silt cell but progressed prior to the infusion and thus never received silt cell. There was one patient who received silt cell as a subsequent therapy post disease progression. Now it is this imbalance that is driving the initial crossing of the OS curves. Thereafter, OS events are balanced between month three and six, and then tend towards improvement with fewer deaths observed in the experiment alarm compared to the standard of care. Let's take a closer look at these early deaths by cause. This slide presents the ITT analysis, including all events occurring after randomization. We see that most early deaths occurred in patients randomized, but did not yet receive silt cell, and this was driven by early progression of disease. As you can see, more patients progressed on the standard of care arm compared to those who were actually treated with silt cell. Five out of the eight AEs leading to death were in patients with progressive disease and received silt cell in subsequent therapy. As I will review in the safety section, these rapidly progressing patients are more vulnerable and thus more likely to experience serious AEs. This helped reinforce the value of disease control prior to lymphodepletion and silt cell infusion. In patients that obtained disease control and received silt cell as study treatment, there were only three AEs leading to death, 
These were all due to COVID-19 infections. Importantly, these deaths occurred during the height of the pandemic and also occurred in patients who are not fully vaccinated. The same trends are seen in PFS with the imbalance in progression occurring early within the first two months in patients that either never received Silta cell or those who received Silta cell as subsequent therapy after disease progression. None of the 22 patients who progressed within the first eight weeks actually received Silta cell treatment. By month two and beyond, we start to see more PFS events occurring in the standard of care arm. Now we performed an extensive analysis to see if any parameters explained the imbalance in early progression on the Silta cell arm prior to the Silta cell infusion. Some of the parameters we assessed are listed here. But now let me show you a schematic to help visualize these investigations and also provide a summary of our findings. As shown previously, the baseline demographics and disease characteristics, even those indicative of higher risk disease were well balanced at study baseline. We also looked at study related factors such as the apheresis procedure and the time for randomization to start a therapy. The median time for randomization to start a therapy was six days in standard of care compared to seven days in the Silta cell arm. And this was all within the protocol specified seven day randomization window. We assessed the CAR-T manufacturing time as well. The median time from apheresis to product release for patients with early PFS versus those without early PFS was 59 days versus 57 days. The median number of days patients spent off bridging therapy prior to progression was zero, ranging from zero to 15. This indicates that most patients were actively receiving bridging therapy at the time of disease progression. Therefore, it is unlikely that manufacturing time played a major role in the early PFS events. Patients who had early PFS events did not start lymphodepletion. So exposure to lymphodepletion could not have been a cause of early progression. Finally, we looked at the dose intensity of bridging therapy. Of the many analyses we conducted, we found that the lower relative dose intensity of bridging therapy may have contributed to the imbalance in early progression although to what extent is unclear. Per protocol, doses of bridging therapy can be decreased secondary to patient tolerability and at the discretion of the treating physician. We evaluated the relationship between dose of bridging therapy and the occurrence of early PFS events. You can see that there was a lower relative dose intensity of pomalidomide, as well as a lower relative dose intensity of bortezomib in patients randomized to silta cell compared to standard of care. The doses of dexamethasone and daratumumab were well balanced between the arms. And then when we looked at patients who had early PFS events across both treatment arms, a lower relative dose intensity of pomalidomide or bortezomib may have been associated with a higher risk of progression. Again, the clinical impact of these differences is unclear, but these differences do emphasize the need to optimize bridging therapy and provide standard doses of bridging therapy to help control disease before lymphodepletion and CAR-T administration. Now to summarize the efficacy findings, a one-time infusion of Silta cell demonstrated deep responses with statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement in progression-free survival that's expected to contribute to prolonged overall survival. The primary endpoints of PFS achieved a hazard ratio of 0 0.40, indicating a 60% reduction in the risk of death or progression for Silta cell compared to standard of care. Additionally, Silta cell showed significant improvement in measurements of disease burden. And while the overall survival data are still maturing, the data we have to date suggests an improving trend for prolonged survival with Silta cell versus standard of care. And importantly, the beneficial results were consistently observed across every subgroup that we assessed. Now let's turn our attention to the safety data supporting our application. As described earlier, the sponsor safety analysis originally included 208 patients in each arm who received any part of study treatment. The FDA has asked us to base the safety on those who received Silta cell product that met all release specifications. This includes 188 patients in total. 170 out of the 176 patients received a conforming Silta cell product as study treatment. 
and 18 out of the 20 patients that received Siltacel as subsequent treatment received a conforming product. The overall safety profiles between the original safety analysis with 208 patients and the FDA's requested safety analysis with 188 patients is very similar. Therefore, for simplicity, we will present only these data for the FDA safety analysis set. Overall, the safety profile was similar between the arms and consistent with the approved Silta cell label, as well as the known mechanism of action of CAR T cell therapy. All patients in both arms experienced one or more adverse events and most experienced one or more grade three or four adverse events. 35% and 38% of patients reported a non-fatal serious adverse event in Silta cell and standard of care respectively. As of the November 2022 data cutoff, adverse events leading to death were reported in 11% of patients in the Silta cell arm, 8% of patients in standard of care. But using the most recent data cut in December of 2023, Deaths due to adverse events were reported in 12% versus 13% of patients. This helps address part of the FDA's concern regarding the imbalance of AEs leading to death. Of those AEs leading to death, most were due to infections in either arm, most common infection being COVID-19 in the Silta cell arm. Hemorrhage and AML MDS were also seen in 2% of Silta cell patients. The adverse events in the Silta cell arm were consistent with the known safety of approved Silta cell and the known mechanism of action of CAR T cell therapy. Adverse events that occurred at a rate of greater than or equal to 30% in either arm are presented here. All of these events observed are already described in the current label for Silta cell. The most common grade three to four adverse events were cytopenias. This was to be expected based on the mechanism of action of CAR T cell therapy and easily managed with supportive care by the treating physician. Serious adverse events were reported for 38% of patients in Silta cell, 39% of patients in the standard of care arm. The most commonly reported SAEs were pneumonia and viral infection across both arms. Now let me briefly share the adverse events of special interest for Silta cell. <clears throat> We see that CAR T-specific AEs were largely as expected. Most cases of cytokine release syndrome were low grade and resolved in about three days after onset. Rates of neurologic toxicity, including ICANs, cranial nerve palsies, peripheral neuropathy, and movement and neurocognitive toxicity, or MNT, were all relatively low and most had resolved by the data cutoff. We also investigated secondary primary malignancies. The overall incidence of secondary primary malignancies during the study was similar across both arms. In both, the most common malignancies were cutaneous and non-invasive cancers. 3% of patients in the Silta cell arm had a hematologic secondary malignancy, including myelodysplastic syndrome, acute myeloid leukemia, and one patient who developed CAR T positive peripheral T cell lymphoma. The non-cutaneous and invasive solid organ malignancies were balanced between the two arms. We also investigated the safety data for patients who received Silta cell as subsequent therapy after progression relative to those who had successful bridging therapy. <clears throat> you see that all patients reported an adverse event and patients who received Silta cell post-progression, which is denoted in the light blue column, were more likely to experience a serious adverse event. More of these patients also died to adverse events. In contrast, patients that received Silta cell as study treatment, which is in the dark blue column, had a similar risk for fatal AEs compared to the standard of care arm. And it's understandable that patients with early progression of disease would experience more serious adverse events and more adverse events leading to death. The deaths due to adverse events in patients who received Silta cell as subsequent treatment were mainly driven by infections and bleeding events, and this was at a higher percentage than those who received Silta cell as study treatment. We compared CAR T specific adverse events for the patients who received Silta cell as subsequent therapy versus patients who received Silta cell as study treatment. As you could see in this table, there are more AESIs overall and more severe AEs reported 
for patients who receive SILTA cell as subsequent therapy post-progression. This further highlights the importance of controlling disease prior to lymphodepletion and CAR T cell infusion. In conclusion, safety findings from the pivotal CARTITUDE 4 study were consistent with the previous SILTA cell experience and the known mechanism of action of CAR T cells. Our findings suggest a reduction in the rate and severity of CAR T specific AEs in an earlier disease setting <clears throat> compared to heavily pretreated relapse refractory myeloma, as in CAR 1. I'd like to thank the committee for their attention. I'd now like to invite Dr. Sundar Jagannath to share his clinical perspective on these data. Dr. Jagannath. Thank you. I'm Sundar Jagannath, the Director of Multiple Myeloma at Tisch Cancer Institute and Professor of Medicine at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York. I'm happy to be here today to share my clinical perspective on the data I just reviewed and the importance of having SILTA cell as an option for our patients with lenalidomide refractory multiple myeloma. Overall, the data observed in Cartitude 4 were outstanding. The progression-free survival improvements observed were clinically meaningful with strong trends towards improved overall survival. The minimal residual disease negativity or MRD negativity of 88% for evaluable patients further supports the potential for improved long-term outcomes. And data were consistent across all the subgroups. The data do not support exclusion of any subset of patients and all patients have the potential to experience meaningful benefit from cell. As discussed, the imbalance in early progressions occurred mostly in patients who did not receive cell, speaking to the need for disease control prior to cell infusion. For patients who relapse after one to three prior lines of therapy, several triplet regimens have been approved. However, these regimens have largely been tested in variable lenalidomide naive or lenalidomide sensitive patients. Among patients with the triplet regimen, median progression free survival is around 12 months, with longer median progression free survival noted for the CANDOR and IKEMA studies, which were largely not lenalidomide refractory patients. Additionally, the response shown in these studies relies on ongoing therapy until progression of disease, potentially resulting in cumulative toxicity and significant treatment burden. The MRD negativity rates for SILTA cell are impressive, as MRD is an important marker for depth and durability of remission. With a one-time administration, SILTA cell produced responses unattainable with other modalities. Of course, we must consider the safety in our determination of benefit risk. There are risks with SILTA cell, as with any therapy. However, there is a well understood by physicians and are manageable. CRS and ICANS, for example, were mostly mild in Cartitude 4 and all resolved. That is also my experience in clinical practice as we know how to manage these events. Infections are a known risk and well-established management protocols are already in place. Most of the fatal infections observed in Cartitude 4 were due to COVID-19, which has now been minimized through less prevalence of serious COVID, vaccinations, and our understanding of the disease. It is also important to consider that safety profile appears to be even better when used in the early line setting. There is less incidence and severity of CRS and neurotoxicities, including MNT, movement and neurocognitive toxicity, being reported in Cartitude 4 than in the prior Cartitude 1 study. This continues to support the positive benefit risk for patients with one to three prior lines of therapy. Not only are they receiving all the benefits of CAR T therapy before T cell exhaustion, but their safety profile tends to be more favorable. 
and to contextualize the safety profile. Here again, I show Siltacel compared to other available treatments of relapse and refractory multiple myeloma. You can see that Siltacel has fewer serious adverse events versus its counterparts. Siltacel is a one-time infusion However, the other triplet regimens are given continuously until disease progression, importing additive toxicity and treatment burden. Siltacel brings significant clinical benefit compared to other approved therapies based on improved efficacy and has changed the treatment landscape for late stage patient care. Being able to provide these deep and durable responses and the chance for improved progression-free survival and overall survival to patients with melanomide refractory myeloma would be invaluable. Saving the best therapy for last would not be good, particularly in melanomide refractory myeloma, as these patients tend to have worse outcomes. While scientifically we want to understand the imbalance in early progression observed in the siltacel arm, we know from the data this was prior to siltacel infusion. Regardless of the reason for the imbalance of the overall benefit risk remains overwhelmingly positive. Based on the data and my experience with the drug, siltacel would be an appropriate treatment option for all patients who meet the criteria consistent with Cartidude 4 enrollment. I hope to see this transformative treatment option available to early aligned patients. I appreciate your time and consideration. This concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank Good you. morning. Uh, we will now proceed with FDA's presentation, starting with Dr. Halka Pedro Pinto. Good morning. I'm Helga Peredo Pinto, a pediatric hematologist oncologist and the Division of Clinical Evaluation, Hematology in the Office of Clinical Evaluation in CIVR, and the primary reviewer for the Supplemental Biological License Application 125746-74 for Carbicti or Siltacaptagen Autolucel, which I will refer to as Siltacel during my presentation. Siltacel is an autologous CAR T cell therapy approved for the treatment of relapse refractory multiple myeloma. The applicant seeks expansion of the indication, as I will discuss in my presentation. Next slide, please. Listed on the slide are the members of the FDA review team who contributed to my presentation. Next slide, please. The applicant submitted the results of the phase three CARTITUDE 4 trial to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of siltacel for the proposed indication. CARTITUDE 4 compares siltacel to standard therapy in patients with relapse, refractory multiple myeloma, who have received a proteasome inhibitor and an immunomodulator drug, and who are refractory to linalidomide. The trial met its primary endpoint, demonstrating a statistical significant improvement in progression-free survival for patients randomized to the silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. During the review of the application, we identified an increased rate of early death in the silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm as a key issue. This issue is the main topic of discussion as the, at this Oncologic Drug Advisory Committee meeting. Next slide, please. During my presentation, I will provide a very brief overview of the treatment of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma and provide a brief regulatory background. I will then summarize the key efficacy and safety results from CARDI24 and present the main topic for discussion. My colleague, Dr. Wang, will then provide an overview of the statistical considerations pertaining to the main topic of discussion. I will conclude my presentation by briefly discussing FDA's consideration of the PRO data submitted in the application and presenting the discussion and voting question. Next slide, please. As discussed by Dr. Malincodi in the detailed overview of multiple myeloma treatment, shown here is the current treatment landscape for treatment of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. 
Please note, and as discussed by Dr. Malinkodi, the treatment landscape has changed drastically over the last decade with multiple approvals. Combination regimens typically include agents that, fa that fall within in the three main classes. This includes immunomodulator drugs, proteosome inhibitors, and anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. For patients who have received one to three prior lines of therapy, including a PI and an IMIT, several treatment options exist as shown in the slide. Highlighted regimens on the slide were used in the CAR T24 trial. Also available as options for treatment in the relapsed refractory setting are cytotoxic polychemotherapy, cell-based therapies, biospecific T-cell engagers, and also two CAR T therapies. Next slide, please. Siltacel is an autologous CAR T therapy that targets B cell maturation antigen, which is expressed on the surface of normal and malignant plasma cells. Siltacel was approved in 2022 for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after four or more prior lines of systemic therapy, including a IMIT, a PI, and anti CD38 monoclonal antibody. Approval was based on the CAR-T21, a single-arm, open-label trial in 97 efficacy-evaluable patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma with a median of six prior lines of therapy. The overall rate response was 97.9, median duration was not reached. The ORR and the durability were considered a clinical benefit in this patient population. The approved dose is 0.5 to 1 million viable CAR positive cells per kilogram of body weight. The Silta cell product labels include boxing warning for cytokine release syndrome, neurological toxicities, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, macrophage activation syndrome, HLH mass, prolonged and recurrent cytopenia, and secondary hematological malignancies. Next slide, please. With the current with the current submission, the applicant is seeking an indication for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received at least one prior line of therapy, including an IMID and a PI, and who are linalidomide refractory. The proposed dose is the same as the approved dose of 0.5 to 1 million viable CAR positive T cells per kilogram of body weight. The data to support the indication is based on the results from CARDI24, which I will now discuss. Next slide, please. CARDI24 is an ongoing open label randomized control trial that enrolled patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who had received one to three prior lines of therapy, including a PI and an IMID, and who were refractory to linalidomide. Patients were randomized one-to-one, -one, either to a standard therapy arm or silta cell arm. The standard therapy arm included either the PVD or the DPD regimens, which were continued until disease progression or toxicity. The silta cell arm includes leukophoresis, bridging therapy, which is administered to stabilize the disease during the product manufacture, lymphodepleting chemotherapy, followed by the silta cell infusion. Patients could receive one or more cycles of bridging therapy during the product manufacture. Of note, the investigator selected the standard therapy and bridging therapy prior to randomization based on prior therapies. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival per an independent review committee assessment. The key secondary endpoints were overall response rate, overall survival, and patient-reported outcomes. Patients from the standard therapy arm were not allowed to cross over the silta cell arm. The primary efficacy and safety results presented today are based on the clinical cutoff date of November 1, 2022 corresponding a median duration of follow-up of 15.9 months and represents the protocol specified interim analysis of PFS, when approximately 75% of the total planet progression-free survival events have occurred. Next slide. I will summarize the efficacy analysis plan for CAR-T24. The statistical analysis plan pre-specified three interim overall survival analysis. 
The first interim OS analysis occurred at the time of the primary PFS. And the second OS analysis will occur at the time of the final PFS analysis. The third interim analysis for OS is planned when approximately 200 deaths have occurred. A final OS analysis power at 80% will occur when 250 deaths have occurred. The overall type 1 error rate is controlled at two-sided 0.05. Currently, the first interim analysis for overall survival has already occurred. The second, third, and the final OS analysis results are awaited. In the next few slides, I will briefly review the study results. Next slide, please. Shown here are the baseline demographics of the study population. The median age of the study population was 61 years, which is younger than the median age of 69 years at diagnosis in the United States. The older population, racial and ethnic minorities, were underrepresented in the study. Only 15% of the subjects were enrolled from the North America region. Next slide, please. Most subjects enrolled had an ECOF performance status of 0 or 1. It is important to mention that baseline disease factors that are indicative of poor prognosis, such as high risk cytogenetics, presence of extramedullary plasmocytoma, and ESS stage 3, were balanced across arms. The majority of the subjects had received one or two prior lines of therapy. Only 20 6% of the subjects have received a prior anti-CD38 anti monoclonal antibody, and 15% of the subjects were triple class refractory. Only 40% of the patients has had a high risk cytogenetic feature. None of the subjects were received four or more lines of therapy. The population currently approved to receive Silta cell. Overall, the study population enrolled in CAR T24 was not heavily pretreated. I will now describe the primary efficacy analysis. Next slide, please. Treatment with Silta cell is associated with a statistical significant improvement in the PFS per IRC assessment compared to the standard therapy arm, as noted by the applicant. The median PFS was 12 months for the standard therapy arm, and it was not reached for the Silta cell arm at the time of the data cutoff date. I would like to, I would like to draw your attention to the early part of the Kaplan-Meier curve, which indicates inferior PFS in the Silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm, and to the data in the table highlighted by the red box, which indicates that a greater proportion of PFS events in the Silta cell arm are due to deaths compared to the standard therapy arm. I will discuss this issue in a subsequent part of my presentation. Next slide, please. Overall survival was a key secondary endpoint. The first interim OS analysis done at the time of the primary PFS analysis is shown in the slide. 20% of the study population had died at the time of the primary PFS analysis. The results show a lower overall survival in the Silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm that appears to extend to 10 months with the curves crossing after that. The crossing pattern of the Kaplan-Meier course for overall survival renders the average hazard ratio not interpretable. There is a significant censoring after the curves cross, indicating that the data are immature. I will discuss the FDA concerns with the OS-related results in detail later in my presentation. Next slide, please. In summary, a statistical significant improvement in median PFS with Silta cell is observed compared to standard therapy. Median PFS was not reached for Silta cell compared to 12 months for the standard therapy. We observe a higher proportion of PFS events in the Silta cell arm are due to deaths compared to the standard therapy arm. There were 17 deaths in the Silta cell arm versus only four deaths in the standard therapy arm. Immature overall survival with 30% information fraction. We observe an early OS detriment in the Silta cell arm with a pattern of crossing of the curves. I will now present a brief overview of safety. Next slide, please. 
Safety was assessed in all subjects who received conforming silta cell in the investigational arm, including subjects randomized and treated under the study, and those randomized and treated after disease progression. Overall, the rate of grade 4 adverse event was higher in the silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. In the safety population, the deaths due to adverse events were higher in the silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. 11% in the silta cell arm compared to 8% in the standard therapy arm, as it's shown in the last row of the table. Next slide, please. Cytokine release syndrome, neurotoxicity, HLH mass, and secondary malignancies are known safety concerns for silta cell. Overall, the rate of grade three or higher CRS, neurotoxicity, HLH mass, was higher in the silta cell arm, as was the rate of grade three or higher neutropenia and thrombocytopenia. The overall rate of hematological neoplasmas was higher in the silta cell arm. At the time of the 120-day safety update, two new cases of myelodysplastic syndrome in the silta cell arm were also reported, bringing the number of patients with secondary hematological malignancies to five, with 2.6% in the silta cell arm versus none in the standard therapy arm. Next slide, please. The major issue we would like to focus on today is the increased rate of early death in the silta cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm noted in the CAR-T24 trial. Next slide, please. Before I review the FDA assessment of the major issue, I would like to briefly highlight the multiple steps between randomization and CAR-T cell infusion. Although traditionally the safety risks due to the treatment are considered in subjects who actually receive the treatment, for CAR T cell therapy, the risk associated with administration of CAR T cell therapy is a, is a process. It starts with the risk of leukophoresis, bridging therapy, which in CAR T24 consisted of the same choice of regimens as the control arm either PVD or DPD, delays in manufacturing resulting in adverse clinical outcomes, and toxicity from lymphodepleting regimen. All these risks should, this risk should be considered integral to the benefit-risk assessment of CAR T cell therapy. Since randomization balances for known and unknown pronostic factors, an assessment of overall survival and safety of randomized patients informs the benefit-risk assessment of any investigational therapy in a randomized clinical trial. Next slide, please. Although PFS has been accepted as a primary endpoint and has supported traditional approval in multiple myeloma trial, trials, OS is always evaluated at the time of the primary PFS assessment. Particularly for therapies with significant toxicity, assessment of overall survival is important to ensure that there is a favorable benefits risk assessment. As I mentioned before, the data in CAR T24 indicated that a greater proportion of PFS events in silta cell arm were due to deaths compared to the standard therapy arm, as shown in the table highlighted by the blue box. The progression free survival plot shows a crossing hazard pattern as well. FDA conducted additional analysis to evaluate the increased rate of early death observed in CAR T24. Next slide, please. If the analysis indicated an increased rate of death in the silta cell arm in the first 10 months post randomization. As shown in the table, 14% of the patients in silta cell arm die in the first 10 months compared to 12% in the standard arm therapy. This includes an increased rate of death primarily for adverse events. Next slide, please. Due to the increased rate of death in the silta cell arm, FDA further analyzed deaths occurring in the first 10 months post-randomization. It is notable that almost 5% of the patients randomized to silta cell arm die without receiving the intent CAR T cell infusion within 10 months compared to almost none of the standard therapy arm. Although we know that the difference in early deaths in patients who did not go on to receive silta cell, as stated previously, these patients started the process to silta cell therapy and had received leukophoresis and bridging therapy. These are still relevant in the assessment of the benefits risk of silta cell. 
Within the treated patients, the rate of death from adverse event is higher in the Silta cell arm in the ITT population, as is highlighted in the last row of this table. Next slide, please. Analysis of the patients who die within 10 months post-randomization demonstrates that patient attrition occurs at different steps in the process of receiving CAR T cell therapy. This includes patients who were randomized to proceed with leukophoresis and did not receive a lymphodepletion, therefore could not proceed to receive SILTA cell infusion. Next slide. 32 subjects in SILTA cell arm experienced progressive disease or death prior to receive the study treatment. However, there is no clear reason for this 32 early progression disease or deaths. 12 patients never received SILTA cell. 10 out of those die within 10 months of randomization. 20 subjects went on to receive SILTA cell as a subsequent therapy after progression. 8 die within 10 months of randomization. Next slide, please. Since the role of region therapy is to stabilize the disease while awaiting product manufacture, we conducted an exploratory analysis of the recipients of region therapy in the patients who progress or die early and compare it to the patient that received SILTA cell. I would like to point out that while the protocol allows one cycle of region therapy, additional cycles could be administered based on patient status and SILTA cell availability. Cycle two and following cycles of region therapy could be truncated to allow for adequate washout prior lymphodepletion. In CAR-T24, investigators selected the optimal region therapy from the two protocol specified regimens based on clinical considerations similar to the standard therapy R. All the subjects received, and while there were minor difference, the overall region therapies in both groups were similar. There are limitations to this analysis, including a small number and post-hoc analysis. Next slide, please. <laughs> to further analyze the early deaths in CAR-T24, FDA conducted exploratory analysis to assess whether any particular pronostic subgroup was associated with the higher early mortality in the SILTA cell arm. This slide demonstrates that the increased early mortality with SILTA cell was observed across multiple prognostic subgroup and was observed even in the absence of individual poor prognostic factors. The, the study was not designed to characterize a heterogeneous study population, which may have contributed to a higher early mortality in the SILTA cell arm. Next slide, please. Since most of the CAR T cell therapy related toxicities have onset within 90 days of product infusion, and given the higher early death rate in the SILTA cell arm, we analyzed deaths within 90 days of treatment start in the safety population, patients that receive conformal SILTA cell or any treatment in the standard therapy arm. The overall death rate for adverse events in the safety population was higher in the SILTA cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. 11% versus 8%. Similarly, death due to adverse events within 90 days of treatment star was higher in the SILTA cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. 4% in SILTA cell arm versus zero in the standard therapy arm. Next slide, please. This table shows the cause of death from uh, treatment, emer uh, treatment emergent adverse events in the safety population in CAR T24. Overall, the most common cause of death in both arms was infection. Next slide, please. In summary, we observe a higher rate of death in the first 10 months after randomization in the intent to treat population, 14% in the SILTA cell arm versus 12% in the standard therapy arm. Additionally, additionally, there is a higher rate of death in the safety population due to adverse events. Similarly, a major difference is observed between the two arms when analyzing death from adverse events within 90 days of treatment star, which was 4% in SILTA cell arm versus zero in the standard therapy arm. Next slide, please. Overall survival is the ultimate clinical benefit endpoint because it is not subject to bias assessment, and because prolongation of life in the setting of life-threatening and fatal disease is a clinical benefit. OS not only provides an estimate of efficacy, but also a safety. 
Particularly for therapies with significant toxicity, evaluation of overall survival is important to ensure that there is a favorable benefit risk assessment. Next slide, please. During the FDA review period, the applicant provided updated, uh, updated Kaplan-Meier course based on the clinical cutoff of April 17, 2023 for the 120-day safety update, the figure on the left with the information fraction of 44%. Most recently, the applicant provided another overall survival update with the cutoff of December 13, 2023, as shown in the figure on the right with information fraction of 50%. Of note, both OS analysis were unplanned and no statistical testing was performed. While there is a further separation of the corpse, the OS data is still immature with only 50% information fraction at the latest unplanned data cutoff. In addition, as we can see from the, from the two Kaplan-Meier curves for OS in this slide, our major concern regarding the early OS detriment is still evident with longer follow-up of, of OS data. Next slide, please. While CAR-T24 demonstrated a statistically significant effect on PFS and overall response rate in the relapsed refractory multiple myeloma population enrolled, an increased rate of early death was observed as described. Given the higher rate of early deaths in Silta Cellar, there is uncertainty if the overall benefit risk assessment is favorable. I will now invite the statistical reviewer, Dr. Wan, to provide the biostatistical considerations on the OS analysis for CAR-D2-4. Thank you, Dr. Porto Pinto. Good morning, everyone. I'm Chong Wang, the biostatistical reviewer for CARVEC-D application. I'm from the Division of Biostatistics, Cyber FDA. In the next few slides, I will present FDA's biostatistical considerations regarding the OS analysis on CARNT24 study. Next slide, please. This slide shows FDA's efficacy results on the primary endpoint PFS and key secondary endpoint OS, as discussed earlier in the presentation. The figure on the left shows the kaplan meier curves for PFS per IRC based on the ITT population. As mentioned by my colleague, Dr. Porto Pinto, it shows a statistically significant result with a hazard ratio of 0.41 and p-value less than 0.0001. The figure on the right shows the kaplan meier curves for OS based on the ITT population with data cutoff date of November 1st, 2022. In the presence of a crossing hazards pattern in survival curves occurred at approximately 10 months after randomization. A single average hazard ratio across the entire course of a study is not able to accurately capture the overall treatment effects profile at different time points. Therefore, it is difficult to interpret and can be misleading. We calculated the piecewise hazard ratio for overall survival. The piecewise hazard ratio is 1.04 before the crossing time point. There is heavy censoring afterwards indicating that the OS data is immature. Of note, there was a similar crossing hazards pattern in PFS as in OS. However, the crossing occurred much earlier and was followed by a large and sustained PFS benefit. Next slide, please. The observed early OS detriment is FDA's major concern. We evaluated the potential causes for the early death in the cell cell arm. One concern with subject-specific cell therapy is that subjects may suffer morbidity or mortality while waiting for the product to be available. This may have contributed to the early mortality seen on CAR-T4 study in the subjects randomized to the cell cell arm. It is also possible that there are product-specific toxicities leading to the early death. 
As discussed earlier in the presentation, this subject started the set cell regimen and had received leukophrisis, breathing therapy, and lethal depletion. As mentioned by my doctor, um, by my clinical colleague, Dr. Proto Pinto, there were 32 subjects who experienced progressive disease or died prior to receiving the set cell infusion. Among these 32 subjects, 20 subjects went on to receive the set cell as subsequent therapy after progression. <clears throat> of these 20 subjects, 10 died as of the data cutoff date. It is difficult to determine which deaths had a set of cell toxicity as a contribution factor, or for which the delayed administration of set of cell was the main cause. Next slide, please. Another key question for this application is the duration of the period of increased risk of early death in the set of cell arm compared to the standard therapy arm. Because the capillary survival curves cross, a single average has a ratio does not provide an interpretable estimate of the entire time dependent on the effects profile of set cell on overall survival. There are statistical analysis, such as piecewise hazard ratio assessment, conducted based on selected landmark time points that may provide alternative ways to estimate the treatment effect. Next slide, please. For example, as presented in this slide with FDA's additional analysis on piecewise hazard ratio assessment based on different time cutoffs. On the top, you can see the piecewise hazard ratio for overall survival with three months cutoff. While at the bottom, you can see the piecewise hazard ratio with cutoffs of five or 10 months. Based on this assessment, the increased risk of death on the set cell arm goes beyond three months after randomization. It appears to persist until at least five months and possibly up to 10 months. While analysis such as this piecewise hazard ratio assessment may provide information to support a benefit risk assessment, such analysis have limitations. For example, Choosing the cutoffs for such approaches retrospectively based on observed outcomes limits generalizability of the findings and lacks the clinically or biological rationale, leading to unreliable estimates that are unlikely to be replicated in the future studies. Now I will turn it back to my clinical colleague, Dr. Perl Pinto, for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Next slide, please. I will now briefly mention the PRO data presented by the applicant. Because the purpose of a PRO measure is to capture the patient's experience, FDA welcomes the inclusion of PRO data in regulatory submissions. PRO endpoint time to worsening of symptoms in the MIS MQ total symptom score was not formally tested since it follows OS in the statistical hierarchy. Therefore, no conclusion can be made. Some of the limitations are infrequent assessment of PRO early in the trial during acute CAR T toxicity, and that longitudinal PRO data does not include the experience of patients with early mortality. Next slide, please. In conclusion, the overall survival result from CAR-T24 study demonstrated a benefit in the PFS and overall response rate in a relapsed refractory multiple myeloma population who had received one to three prior lines of therapy and was linalidomide refractory. An increased rate of early deaths was observed in the SILTA cell arm compared to those randomized to the standard therapy arm. The study was not designed to identify predictive factors for early mortality observed with SILTA cell. The higher rate of early deaths appears to be an inherent risk of autologous CAR T cell therapy. Overall, there is an uncertain benefit risk of SILTA cell in the proposed, proposed population. Next slide, please. Please. Discuss whether the results of CAR-T24 are sufficient 
to support a positive risk-benefit assessment of siltacaptogen autolucel for the proposed indication. Is the risk of early death associated with siltacaptogen autolucel acceptable in the context of the PFS benefit? Next slide. Display on this slide is the voting question. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, please pull up slide four. We will now take clarifying questions for Janssen Biotech and the FDA. Please use the raised hand icon to indicate that you have a question. And remember to lower your hand by clicking the raised hand icon after you have asked your question. We acknowledge, when acknowledged, please state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific speaker. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let the slide number uh, be known if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you or that is all for my question. So we can move on to the next panel member. So if I could use the maybe the chair's prerogative, one that exists to maybe ask the first question uh, of the FDA. Um, and this is in reference to slide 15 and slide 20. You know, it, it, you, you, you highlight that the primary concern here is early deaths. Um, and I think you, you display a lot of numbers on slides 15 and 20 and maybe 26 as well. But, um, but the statistical focus is really on survival, which isn't necessarily what you guys have said is what, what the FDA has said is their primary interest here. So I, I'm, I'm assuming, well, I'll, I'll just ask you, are there st statistics that can show us if, if the numbers of deaths that you guys report um, displayed on slides 15 and 20 are indeed statistically s significant? or is it just numerical? Hello, this is um, Nicole Verdun. I'm the Super Office Director in the, um, in, in the Office of Therapeutic Products. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Perito Pinto. Um, thank you for the question. Um, so what we are going to um, try to address uh, with our uh, response is that the overall survival data is immature. Therefore, we cannot, um, we cannot conclude uh, a statistical value at this point yet. That's why uh, we uh, mentioned that uh, the maturity of the data is relevant uh, for this uh, situation. Right, so just to clarify though, the, di the differences then in debts that are displayed on slides 15 and 20 are numerical only, correct? Yes, those are numerical, and that's the way that we analyze for the safety of, of the okay, great. CAR-D24. Yes, correct. Thank you. Let me, all right, I think Dr. Spratt will be next. Sorry, one more um, point of clarification on that. Thank you. Yes, hi. Good morning. It's uh, Lola Fashoyna J. Um, clinical. Um, I just want also like to add that, you know, when we evaluate uh, progression-free survival, um, we consider the overall survival uh, when it is immature as an endpoint um, that can contribute to our assessment of safety. Um, and in the context of a safety evaluation, we're not looking for statistical significance. Um, analysis of safety is typically descriptive. So I just wanted to add that for context. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for our next question, uh, Dr. Spratt. Thank you, uh, Dan Spratt, University Hospital Sydney Cancer Center in Case Western Reserve uh, University. This is for the FDA. Um, because you have done this recently for various, and I won't mention the drugs, but um, in uh, prostate cancer, there was one in kidney cancer, there's things outside of the oncology space where supplemental sensitivity analysis for uh, restricted mean survival times have been calculated, which usually are never pre-specified in studies, but has been used when especially non-proportional hazard is met. And I'm somewhat surprised, and neither of the sponsors or especially the FDA's analysis can show us the RMST difference at 24 or 36 months. Again, I think that's probably a more appropriate way to understand over that time period, what's the gain or loss in survival time given the focus here. Do you have that calculated? If so, can you please show it? And I, I don't feel I need to hear from the sponsor unless the FDA doesn't have it. 
Thank you for the question. Yes, hi, this is uh, Dr. Kanapuru. I'm the um, oncology review team lead. Uh, no, uh, we did not conduct those analysis, and I would just like to reiterate, as pointed out by Dr. Fashoy and Ajay, a safety analysis. The overall survival is an important safety metric, and uh, all of these analyses, such as restricted mean survival, again, they are generally used when there is a crossover, uh, and they're all considered sensitivity analysis. Here in our analysis, we were looking at the safety based on the observed early overall survival detriment as noted in the KM curves. Just to follow up, again, following up on the chair's comment is if there was, because there's numerically superior outcomes after where the Kaplan Meier curves cross, it just seems that this would be an appropriate as FDA has done previously to, to show that data so we can better understand because there may be statistical significance, although I, I realize this is a sensitivity analysis, um, to understand the total uh, mean, you know, restricted mean survival time gain or loss in, in that duration of follow-up we have, but thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, it's Rob Sakalik. Um, the you're correct. The analyses are uh, sensitivity analyses. They're post hoc. They're they could f be the basis of uh, hypotheses, but they're not something upon which we would be able to make a regulatory decision. And that goes with what I was saying that the data are uh, yet somewhat immature. We want to show. Okay, thank you. Dr. Spratt, does that address your your question? Yes, uh, partially. I, I wish the analysis was done. Um, the FDA has done that for many other products, so um, it'd be great if that could be done prior to the decision, but uh, I appreciate their responses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spratt. If, um, if, sorry. Uh, Jordan Schechter uh, with the sponsor. Uh, Dr. Spratt, if you wish us to show the analysis, uh, that's something that the sponsor has prepared. So we are able to show that. Uh, should that be helpful for the committee? If, if you have that analysis, I would greatly appreciate it, just to be brief. Thank you. Sure. Let me turn it over to my statistical colleague, Sue Minye, to bring us through this data. Thank you. Hi, Zhu Mingye, statistically for Sota Self, Johnson & Johnson. So we do have uh, the RMST um, analysis that I would like to show you. Um, bring this up. Yeah, so as you said, it, um, this is a, this is a RMST on the PFS. Um, and the difference in the restricted mean survival time uh, is a gain of 4.7 months in the period uh, up to 22.4 months. And we've also had the uh, restricting mean survival analysis for the overall survival. As I said, this is a post hoc sensitivity. And after a follow up of uh, th three years, um, the difference in the restricting mean survival is a gain of approximately 2.3 months with a confidence interval of 0.1 to 4.5. Thank you, appreciate it. That addresses my comment. Thank you, Dr. Spratt. Um, doc, F, FDA to want, okay, you guys are good. Uh, Dr. Vossen, you're next. Hi, Neil Vossen, Columbia. I, ha I had two um, broad questions. Um, the first uh, is on the question of, is there a subset of patients who are who are not benefiting? And the FDA presented in their analysis um, as to the sponsor that um, it, it didn't really seem like there was. And so, but I in the FDA briefing document in page 31, figure 10, where the there's a stratification by the prior line of therapy, I wanted to ask the FDA if they had point estimates for the hazard ratio for the patients who had gotten one prior line of therapy versus two or three, it just looks like on visual inspection that this is a, a higher um, hazard ratio for the patients who had received only one prior line of therapy. Dr. Wang? 
Hi, this is Chong Wang Bao, that's reviewer. Thank you for the question. Uh, the answer is no, uh, we don't have such um, hazard ratio estimates because all the subgroup analysis are post hoc, uh, just only can be considered as exploratory and um, post hoc um, hypothesis generating. Thank you. And, and the second the second question has to do um, with uh, with post progression therapies. So I uh, this is the FDA. Um, excuse me. Sorry, I'm trying to pull up the page. FDA briefing document page 14, table five. So I'm just trying to understand the balances and the hetero both the balances and the heterogeneities in these post progression therapies as it impinges on OS and I, I think there are several issues here. I mean the first is that it seems that more patients on the silta cell arm receive who progressed received post progression therapies and so I'd like a little bit of guidance on that from both the FDA and the sponsor and the second is that and I think this points to the heterogeneity in treatments that Dr. Mylan Cody described it's very hard to interpret these different post progression therapies you know given the heterogeneity also given the fact that 20 patients in the silta cell arm got subsequent silta cell uh, who, who didn't actually receive the drug, but they were on the variable arm. And then also noting that the study did not have crossover. I, I'd like a little more clarity on how to interpret these post-progression data since it impinges on OS. I would like to invite Jansen to answer that question. Great. No, thank you for the question and for the opportunity to uh, present our perspective. Uh, I think we first need to look at the overall OS data, uh, which is contained on sponsor slide number 27, which uh, is our most recent data caught off and shows the uh, hazard ratio for OS of 0.57. And our perspective is that this data, while not fully mature, uh, should be easier to interpret since there was no crossover as part of study design. Uh, you asked specifically what the patients got after disease progression. I do have a backup slide, which is PF29 on the screen here. Um, so the uh, subjects, the 32 subjects who had early progression, 20 of them in the silta cell arm, which you could see there, uh, cellular therapy received silta cell. In the standard of care arm um, at the interim analysis for PFS, there were zero who received silta cell, but there were some patients who received other cellular therapies, including IDACEL or investigational CAR-Ts. Uh, with additional data follow-up, uh, as of the four-month safety update, there were additionally two subjects who had silta cell in the uh, control arm. Um, but you know, in, in total, uh, the data for the OS we think is strong and shows that uh, strong hazard ratio for OS at the most recent data cut, December 2023. And, and can you comment also on the, uh, this is FDA um, briefing document page 13 in table four. So there were 30 patients in the silta cell arm who had progression of disease and then 117 who had standard therapy. And then of those patients, this is table five, 43 re received one or more subsequent anti-myeloma therapies and 112 received the standard therapy. If you could comment on those ratios. For table four? Table four versus, so, so table four, uh, I, I wanna make sure I'm interpreting these data correctly. So table four says that 30 patients on the silta cell arm had progressive disease and 117 on the standard arm. So then of those patients, 40, it says 43 subjects received one or more subsequent anti-myeloma therapies, and then 112 subjects received anti-myeloma therapies in the standard therapy arm of those 117. So I'd like a little clarity on what exactly, what exactly that means. I could bring up the list of the subsequent therapies that were offered to the patients who had disease progression on the standard care arm. In addition to cellular therapies, which I mentioned, uh, some patients received novel therapy, uh, patients received uh, standard of care therapy, patients sometimes went on clinical protocols. 
Um, so I, I'm not sure exactly if I'm answering your question, but uh, the subsequent therapy, obviously there was more patients who went on to subsequent therapy in the control group because there's more progression in the control group as evidenced by the progression-free survival curves. I, I guess the question is, is it's, if there are 30 patients who had progressive disease, then, but then it says 43 subjects with one or more subsequent antimyeloma therapies in the silta cell arm. Right, so I, I think I could explain this by going back to the consort diagram. Uh, which is on slide 21 in the sponsor deck. <clears throat> so I, I think where a possible confusion lies is, is that when patients started bridging therapy, there were uh, 32 patients who developed progression or death before silta cell. Uh, and 20 of those went on to subsequently receive silta cell as kind of a compassionate care. 12 never retreated with silta cell. Of the patients who received silta cell as study treatment, those 176, there were patients that progressed. They may have progressed, you know, a year later, two years later, uh, and they may have gone on to subsequent therapy. So there's there's two separate populations. There's those early progressors who progressed on bridging therapy, and then there's progressors who had silta cell as study treatment and progressed, you know, well into the future. Permission from the chair to to comment from yeah, the yeah. FDA. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, so thank you for all the questions. Uh, I think, you know, I want to sort of re-emphasize that the purpose of today's meeting isn't really to evaluate the benefit as described by the overall survival as an efficacy endpoint. We're convening this meeting because we have concerns about the rate of early deaths. Um, and so in this context, we're evaluating and assessing uh, overall survival as a safety endpoint. Um, and as supportive to the main concern uh, around the early deaths in the silta cell arm compared to the uh, standard of care arm. Um, that is really the main concern. And while all these additional analyses around post-progression therapies may be interesting, I would like to reorient us back to the main purpose of today's meeting, which is to discuss the high rate of early deaths in the context of the PFS benefit, which is the, the uh, efficacy endpoint uh, that would support uh, uh, the efficacy assessment in this application. Thank you. Thank you, no further question. Okay, thank you for that guidance. Um, Dr. Nieva is next. Dr. Kwok, you will come thereafter. Hi, George Nieva, University of Southern California. Um, I find the, um, the data here very clear that this drug has a great deal of front-loaded risk relative to late benefit. And that's not something new to medicine. We see that in allogeneic transplantations, thoracic surgery. We see it in coronary artery bypass grafting. Has either the FDA or the sponsor done any kind of comparison of the front-loaded risk seen with this product relative to other procedures that are commonly used in medicine that are associated with front-loaded front risk. That, thank you, that concludes my question. I can answer that for FDA, this is Dr. Sakalik. So I'm a bone marrow transplant physician um, and that's exactly what I said when I saw these curves, this looks like an allogeneic transplant curve. So an allogeneic transplant, we counsel patients, we ask them to accept an upfront burden of increased mortality because we know that down the line, overall, there's a benefit in survival. So in this setting, we know there's a benefit in PFS, we know there's a safety concern in overall survival upfront that's not balanced by uh, by a overall survival balance at on the tail end. It may be when the data are more mature, but it's not there yet. Did that did that did that help? Yes. Yes, sponsor thank you. The sponsor would like to Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the recognition. Um, I'd like to call up the slide uh, CO30, which presents our analysis and you know, perhaps presents a, 
uh, counter discussion and uh, counter argument with the comments uh, we just heard from Dr. Sakalik. Um, the, the sponsor and the data show that it's not silta cell toxicity. Uh, when we looked at different time periods, the only period in time where we see more deaths, those early deaths, are between zero and three months, with seven deaths in the experimental arm, one death in the standard care arm. And six out of the seven patients never received silta cell. Uh, the one last patient received silta cell as a subsequent therapy. Every period thereafter, the deaths are either balanced, as in uh, the months three to six, or more deaths observed in the uh, standard of care arm. And those deaths are really attributable to three causes. Number one, patients who progressed because they didn't get silta cell, they didn't have effective bridging. Patients who received silta cell as subsequent therapy. And third, due to COVID-19. And risks one, one and two could be mitigated by more effective bridging therapy. And risk number three for COVID-19, we're in a much different period in the pandemic. And the patients that succumbed to COVID-19 were not vaccinated, not adequately treated, did not have the supportive care. And of course, the COVID-19 was much more lethal then. So uh, I, I would just enter into the record that the data in our assessment do not show that there's a specific silta cell toxicity in the early period. Thank you. From the FDA, um, can I please call up Dr. Pierdo Pinto? Thank you. Thank you. Um, one might consider that since the subject did not receive silta cell, there is no treatment causality. However, it is consequence of proceeding to receive treatment in the investigation arm. This case, a CAR T product, therefore, is relevant to the subject outcome. This brings to light a persistent consideration on the current CAR T treatment pathway, in which subjects will die while waiting to receive the product. As it is clearly shown in this study trial, the early OS detriment in the subjects in the context of an autologous product that requires the subject to go through multiple steps prior to CAR-T is an important determinant of the overall benefit risk. Early mortality in subjects who die, who did not receive siltacer, raises issues in the subject selection, optimal disease control while awaiting CAR-T product, and manufacturing issues as well. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I may yeah, be recognized. Just, the heart of the issue, so go ahead, but be on point briefly, please. Uh, sure. No, to answer the question, I, I'd like to ask Dr. Irene Gobriel to provide her comment specifically about the, optimi the optimization of bridging, because I think that really could improve the overall profile. Uh, Absolutely. Dr. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, I'm not a statistician. I'm a clinician who sits down with patients and tell them whether they are allowed to get silta cell or not. And I can tell you that these days we are giving very different bridging therapy compared to what we had on the CARTITUDE 4 trial. And this is great because we have now options that we did not have before. I believe that the current bridging therapy could potentially optimize our patient care, can improve the way that we treat our patients and make them uh, capable of getting into the CELTA cell. That's a huge difference because the loss of patients early on was truly because we could not uh, have those patients respond well to therapy. And unfortunately, myeloma is a very aggressive disease. Even when it is first line of therapy, those patients are refractory to lenalidomide and sometimes even refractory to everything else, even after the first line. So this is not an indolent disease where we we have the option of waiting and giving them other things. This is why they were progressing so fast while we're trying to rescue them with bridging therapy. But we do have better bridging therapies these days. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to get to the next question then um, from Dr. Kwok. And uh, Dr. Bradashiri, you're next. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Mary Kwok from University of Washington. I just have a few um, uh, clarifying okay. questions. I guess the first one is, um, um, were, how were adjunctive therapies used? Like, uh, was IVIG and things like that mandated um, in the protocol? I'm happy to take that question. Um, as per protocol, we had supportive care being uh, suggested, IVIG, prophylactic antibiotics, uh, antivirals, growth factor. Uh, this was done at the discretion of the treating physician and also subject to local hospital practice or availability, depending on the region. Um, 
Thank you. Um, just, I have just a couple other questions. Um, for the patients that went on to um, progress and subsequently receive Siltisil, did they receive any therapy in between um, their progression in Siltisil or did they go straight to Siltisil, meaning did they go into Siltisil refractory already? 20 such patients who received Siltisil as subsequent therapy, approximately eight received additional therapy between bridging and lymphodepletion silta cell. Thank you. Dr. Kwok, does that answer your question? Um, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Dr. Gratisher, you're, you're, you're up. Yeah, I have a, Bill Gratisher, Northwestern University. I have a question for Dr. Schechter. And it relates to uh, what you talked about a little bit with, in, with respect to dose intensity. But do you have uh, more uh, granular information about the people who either had deaths or were progressing? Um, you know, do we have a better understanding of what fraction of the intended dose intensity of the bridging therapy they actually received? Because there was a clustering of a lot of the uh, you know, COVID cases among that group. And I'm just wondering how much of they actually got and not the entire group, but specifically those who are having the events. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. And, and this is somewhat of a, a complicated um, question. So I'll, I'll be brief, but hopefully on target. So the methodology used, so we, we took all patients who received the bridging therapy. We ranked the patients based on dose intensity and then we took the lowest 25% who received POM or Bortiz. <clears throat> for, for POM, there were 104 patients in the lower quartile. For Bortiz, there were 13 patients in the lowest quartile. <clears throat> Excuse me. Looking at the 104 patients within the lowest quartile of pomalidomide, uh, 12 out of 104 had an early PFS event. Looking at the patients who were in the lowest quartile for Bortezomib, seven out of 13 had an early PFS event. So the patients who were in the lowest quartile had twice the rate of early PFS for uh, the pomalidomide, five times the rate of early PFS versus those without this level of dose reduction. And there were twice as many patients in the lower quartile for POM and Bortis in the silta cell arm. So we're, we're not saying that this is the obvious uh, smoking gun, so to speak, but we do think that there's an association between the lower dose of, of, of uh, pomalidomide and bortezomib and the early progression that was seen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grasher. Dr. Hunsberger? Yeah, Sally Hunsberger. Um, so in the curves that were shown, I think like slide C227, uh, uh, there's four censored uh, observations in the standard of care arm in the first three months, but there's no censoring in the um, treatment arm. And so I'm, I'm a little bit worried about those censoring, that censoring pattern, because it's all about those early events. And so if there's four early events or censoring in the standard of care arm, you know, that, that's a lot of numbers compared to the number of deaths. So do we know anything about those, um, those events that were censored? So there were, were four patients in the standard care arm that withdrew consent to study participation. Uh, there were also seven subjects who received subsequent anti-myeloma therapy uh, prior to disease progression. So uh, in total, 11 censoring in the standard of care arm. And no censoring in the, uh, in the treatment arm. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think actually that completes our questions. Oh, Dr. Kwok, I think your hand is up again. So we'll, we'll go ahead if you have a question. Sorry, I, um, I just have one more kind of clarifying question and this gets back to the comment from um, the FDA review reviewer about um, the potential delays um, that might be built into the silta cell arm. Um, I guess um, my first question is, do we know when the progressions happened? Did it happen on therapy or during the delays um, or breaks, you know, washout period? Um, and then two, um, I guess, 
I understand the idea that for a need for a washout period before um, leukapheresis um, in order to like preserve T cells and things like that. I don't quite understand the need for a washout period between bridging therapy and initiation of lymphodepletion. And so I was just wondering if someone could clarify that. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, perhaps I could take the, the first question and then, you know, perhaps uh, turn it over to our clinical experts to comment on the second. Um, the, you had asked about that uh, potential longer vein-to-vein -vein time. Um, there was a lot of complications treating patients during the pandemic, mostly logistical. Um, so what we've looked at is the receipt to release timing. So when we received the product here at Janssen, when it was released, you know, back to the study site, and we found that the, uh, the timing was actually very similar between the patients who had early progression events, patients who had later progression events. The average time off of therapy was essentially zero, right? So most patients progress while on bridging therapy. The majority, those 22 patients who had early progression, the majority, 19 out of 22, had progression events within the first five weeks. So it's not like they spent an inordinate time off of therapy, they're waiting around for their product. These are progressing on DPD. And we know DPD should have a PFS of about 12 months. Having a PFS of one and a half months or 1.3 months, I mean, that, that's a very high risk patient. So our conclusion is that the, uh, the vein to vein time or receipt to release time did not inordinately contribute to that uh, early progression events. And perhaps I'll ask uh, Dr. Yi Lin from Mayo Clinic to help comment on your second question about why a washout period is so common in CAR-T studies, specifically that washout between the bridging therapy and then the start of lymphodepletion. So that would be great. I just think we should try to keep this brief because we do have to get to a break. We have uh, the OPH session starting at 1120. So um, probably a high level summary here would be good in a minute or less. Thank you. Elin from Mayo Clinic. On clinical trials, there is often a washout period from the stop of bridging therapy to start of lymphodepletion chemotherapy to allow patients to potentially recover for any of the side effects of the bridging therapy and um, any potential effect of the bridging therapy on the CAR-T therapy. We do know in real world practice that that is certainly not mandatory. We would have more options to consider patients overall fitness and status from bridging therapy to the start. So in real world practice, we do not necessarily mandate a bridging period. And we do have um, data from real world practice to show the um, benefit of the treatment despite the lack of washout period. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. FDA would like to clarify. Uh, a quick uh, on point clarification would be great. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, is the applicant's responsibility to demonstrate or prove that a more adequate bridging therapy has the capacity to prevent the early progression disease or death? Given that the study stands as a single pivotal trial to support the marketing application, unlikely the scenario with two confirmative trials, it represents a challenge for the agency to make a conclusive regulatory decision based solely on a speculative assessment of the benefits risk profile rather than robust scientific evidence. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, with respect to Dr. Advani, who's got a question, We'll try to come back to that after the OPH session. I apologize for not getting to that now. Um, we will take a quick nine minute break as it stands. Panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the break. We will resume for the open public hearing portion of this session at 11.20. Um, thank you.
In the open public hearing session, both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for the information gathering and decision making. Recording in progress. I'll restart for this. Uh, we will now begin the open hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or, or oral comment to advise the committee of any financial relationships that you may have with the applicant. For example, if the financial, um, for example, this financial information may include hearing session, both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent. It may include applicants payment uh, of your travel, lodging or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of the statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and this committee place a great importance in the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. Our, one of our goals for today for this open public hearing is for it to be conducted in a fair and open way where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, dignity courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please only speak when recognized by the chair. Um, we thank you in advance for everyone's participation and staying on time. We do have 10 speakers, so we'll go ahead and get started with speaker number one. Uh, go ahead, I see you're already on. Please introduce yourself and uh, state your name and any organization you're representing. You will have three minutes. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. I have no disclosures. Hello, my name is Mary Durham, and I'm the Senior Director of Medical Communications and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, or MMRF. The MMRF is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to accelerate a cure for each and every myeloma patient. We are the number one private funder of myeloma research in the world and have raised over $600 million in support of this mission over the last 25 years. On behalf of the hundreds of thousands of patients, family members, and friends that the MMRF represents, we would like to express our support for the availability of therapies with a positive risk-benefit ratio to less heavily pretreated patients, particularly these agents that show efficacy in high-risk populations where there is still considerable unmet need. Despite decades of progress, the five-year survival rate for multiple myeloma patients is still only about 60%. Myeloma is a disease of remission and relapse, with some patients cycling rapidly through many lines of therapy until their treatment options are exhausted. Due to the increased use of quad therapy in the upfront setting, many patients arrive at their first relapse already refractory to many effective therapies, and the majority of patients, as we have seen in today's presentations, do not survive to receive fourth or fifth line therapy, which is where many of the newer, most effective therapies are now approved. It is also clear that the more lines of therapy a myeloma patient is exposed to, the more compromised their immune system becomes, making immune therapies less effective. The use of therapies such as CAR-T earlier in a patient's disease journey, as shown in the briefing of today's discussion, can lead to higher response rates and rates of MRD negativity, longer progression-free survival, and improved quality of life, as patients do not resume therapy again until they relapse. These significant benefits, however, must be weighed against the risks for short-term adverse effects, effects such as CRS and ICANS and long-term effects of cytopenias, serious infections, and second primary malignancies. It is our hope that the committee will appreciate that despite the significant progress made in myeloma in the last 20 years, more options are urgently needed. In addition, we encourage the FDA to provide guidance on optimizing bridging therapy for patients eligible for CAR-T therapy in earlier lines to maximize disease control and enable patients to achieve the best possible outcome. In conclusion, there remains a significant unmet need for effective therapies for relapsed refractory myeloma patients, and making more effective therapies earlier in the disease course will help to address that need. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number one. Speaker number two, please unmute your mic and turn on your webcam. 
Well, speaker number two, please introduce yourself. Okay. Please state your name and any organization for the record. You will also have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Indisha Molesky and I'm a multiple myeloma patient and a research advocate. I am, a num I am on a number of the patient advisory boards and receive honoraria for the work from various pharmaceutical companies, including J&J, &J, but I am not being com compensated for speaking at today's meeting. We all know that myeloma is a disease of relapse and remission. As such, it is a disease of continuous therapy. CAR-T is the only treatment now that allows patients to have a break from continuous therapy. I believe it's important to have access to this therapy earlier on in a patient's myeloma journey when they and their T cells are healthier. I attend a lot of medical meetings. Doctors are always talking about T cell health saying that the healthier your T cells are, the more likely you are to have a longer duration of response. Continuous therapy can exhaust your T cells. It makes sense to me to have this therapy available earlier when T cells are healthier. Wouldn't it be nice if someone in a second or a third line could get access to CAR T therapy and have a deep remission so they wouldn't need another therapy for maybe years? And as we heard today, unfortunately, not every patient will make it to the fourth line of treatment. So why wait? Right now, patients typically have shorter and shorter remissions as they go through successive lines of therapy. These patients live from blood work to blood work. Every lab could be the one that tells them they're out of remission. I know that firsthand, and it makes it hard to live your life and plan for your future. CAR-T treatment early on when T cells are healthier, could change that. A longer treatment-free interval could help you plan ahead. In my case, I have not had Carvicti. Now I am on a monthly maintenance therapy. I am very thankful for that treatment option, but to be honest, it's a pain in my neck. I have to figure out where I'm going to be so I could schedule the next shot. I am tied to a treatment center. If I could have a drug-free period I would be able to travel for business and pleasure freely and to visit my family more easily. My life would be much less complicated. Making Carvicti available earlier could improve patients' lives. I appreciate this committee's review of this important data, and I want to assure you that whenever I start a new therapy, I always examine the risk and the benefits of the product and how it may affect my future options down the line. I am comfortable doing this with my doctor. What I want are treatment options and the information to be part of that decision-making process over my disease. Thank you very much. Thank you, speaker number two. Speaker number three, please un unmute your mic and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number three, please introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You will also have three minutes. Thank you so much for the opportunity, um, uh, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, my name is Saad Usmani. I am a myeloma physician who's been treating patients for about 17 years. Um, I have served as an investigator and consultant for Janssen as part of what I do as a researcher, and uh, they are not compensating me for these comments. I'm speaking as a physician taking care of patients uh, every day in clinics. While we've seen an improvement in myeloma outcomes in the last two decades, we know that myeloma is a very heterogeneous disease. And even in patients who are at, at their first and second relapses, we see very aggressive nature of disease. Um, a lot of what I've, uh, I've been hearing you know, in the uh, ODAC so far uh, is a testament to that heterogeneity. Um, the clinical trial data as a simpleton clinician, um, I see um, a, a therapy that is highly effective, clearly demonstrating uh, PFS benefit and meeting its primary endpoint. Um, the early death events, again, as a simple clinician, are included in those PFS events and also demonstrate how quickly the disease can turn and, and uh, you know, create challenges for both patients and clinicians. Uh, looking at these data, you know, I, I, I do support uh, the notion that this option needs to be there for my patients. Um, our patients uh, you know, can have discussions with their physicians about the pros and cons of 
um, the therapies that they have at hand, um, they can uh, be well informed and make their decisions uh, for themselves. Um, based on these data, uh, you know, what I take away is that uh, the silta cell therapy is effective when compared to standard of care uh, in this early line of treatment. Um, I did not see any data that uh, shows me that the OS is any worse with silta cell. Uh, if anything, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it may appear similar. And as a clinician and patient, um, advocate, I think that is a discussion that uh, you know I need to be allowed to have with my patients. We have seen so many examples in clinics uh, of patients cycling through available treatments within months, uh, but benefiting tremendously uh, from these therapies and subsequent lines. I'd like to offer that option to my patients who have that aggressive relapse in earlier lines who otherwise won't be able to get this therapy. Thank you so much. Thank you, speaker number three. Speaker number four, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Will speaker number four go ahead and introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you are possibly representing for the record. You will also have three minutes. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Aprajita Puri, and I'm going to share the story that me and my father, Ajay Puri, has, has been, have been through in the past few years with myeloma. Ajay is a patient of myeloma. He was diagnosed in 2021. We speak purely as patients. We're not associated with any organization. Ajay has gone through the Carvicti treatment in May 2022, and we're here to just share our experience. As a family member and as a daughter, um, we went through a torrid time when Ajay was diagnosed in 2021. He went through a bone marrow transplant, and within a few months of the transplant, the disease had record again. He also went through a second-line treatment of KPD, but only to see that the disease had come back once again. Um, and then within 18 months of diagnosis, we were staring at a path which had very few options. And that's when Janssen and MFK and Dr. Usmani allowed us a chance at the, at the Carvicti trial. And for us, that was a life changer. Um, Ajay went through the treatment in 2022 of May and, and almost two years down with, with the Almighty's blessings and all the care that we received. He's doing very, very well. Um, the treatment process uh, was, e was relatively easier than the transplant. I was with him through the process. Um, the only the only adverse side effect that he continues to live with is the risk of infections. But within a few months, um, we were able to get him back to his normal life, um, including getting to work, spending time with family, and and honestly, sort of going on as he would uh, before he was diagnosed. As a family member and as a daughter, um, I would only say that this treatment for us has been a blessing. And, and if we're able to make that choice available for more and more patients um, for this disease that is most unpredictable, and sometimes in, in the cases of high-risk patients, very quickly takes, takes, a, takes a, a dangerous path, this treatment option can, can you know, give patients uh, another chance at life like it's given us. I'll just let Ajay quickly share his thoughts. Thank you very much for uh, letting us in for this, this uh, you know, for sharing our experience. I... I had a, a successful corporate life. I was a COO for Bharti Airtel, the leading telecom operator in India. And in January 21, as Aparita said, I uh, figured out that I have the uh, myeloma care. And then as Aparita said, we went through the treatment phase one, then the bone, bone marrow transplant, and then the stage, you know, third treatment. And then we were fortunate enough to be uh, you know, uh, come in, coming in contact with Dr. Usmani, who's been like a godsend uh, figure for us, and went through the the, the CAR-T uh, transplant. I must say that during the transplant and post-transplant, the experience, experience has been extremely smooth. I would rather risk myself by saying it was better than the uh, stem cell transplant experience in terms of after effects and in terms of during the treatment effects. Uh, I just had one impact, which was a little low uh, blood counts and all that, but I think it was very, very well managed uh, in the US that we were there for three months post-treatment. And since then we've come back to India and I'm completely drug-free. That's a, that's a blessing. Uh, for the last 19 months, I'm completely drug-free. I just don't take any drug at all uh, and uh, live a normal life. I'm on boards of few companies. I- That's, you know, that's wonderful. Support. It's really yeah, I support I support some of the government initiatives. I support some of the philanthropic initiatives. So it's been wonderful. I would only urge that a treatment like this, which can be a lifesaver and a game changer, should be brought into the many more people 
at Thank a stage you. when it has lesser impact and immunity is strong in the human body, rather than depleting the immunity first by other treatments and then giving him this life-saving treatment, which could only risk the life a little more. So I would urge that it should Thank be opened you. up globally and across the economic strata. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much for sharing your story. I, we have to move on to our next speaker, but we do appreciate your perspectives as a patient. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, speaker will be speaker number five. Well, please, uh, speaker number five, uh, unmute your mic and turn on your webcam. Please introduce yourself and state the name of uh, any organization you may be representing. You'll have three minutes. Speaker number five, go ahead. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present. I'm Surbi Sadana. I'm a myeloma physician and researcher at Stanford University. And I am an investigator on j, &J sponsored trials and do work with them as a consultant, but I'm not being paid for this testimony. I would like to share my experience of treating myeloma patients every day, trying to get them to CAR-T. And per the current label, I cannot emphasize how challenging it is to get patients to CAR-T from when we think about CAR-T to CAR-T because our options for bridging therapy by the time the patients are at fifth line are very limited. Given the manufacturing time, you know, patients are often progressing and never make it to CAR-T or start CAR-T with very high disease burden, which we know is associated with increased risk of side effects. In contrast, I was an investigator on CARTITUDE 4, and I have to say the experience of treating patients early line was completely different. I know there were some patients progressing on bridging therapy on CARTITUDE 4, but when I see my real clinical practice, that is a stark contrast. And I would like to share with you an example of one such patient I had on CARTITUDE 4. He's a young man in his 40s. I saw him at, for transplant consult, but he progressed within two months of starting frontline therapy with bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone. We know historically these patients do very poorly. He was randomized to the siltacel arm and is in a stringent complete response three years later. And he's back to work full time, which for him was very important as he has a young family to support and he's enjoying an excellent quality of life. So given that we have many more effective bridging options earlier line, there's lots of logistical issues with CAR-T where we need more effective bridging options. I would like to urge the panel to consider allowing earlier line use of CAR-T given the progression-free survival benefit and improve quality of life with this limited duration treatment. And the option whether to use it as second line, third line, or fourth line should be a discussion between the patient and the physician considering the side effects and the logistics and the circumstances of each patient. Thank you. Thank you, speaker number five. Um, speaker number six, um, please un unmute your mic and turn on your webcam. Uh, please introduce yourself and state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jack Io. Regarding any conflict of interest and honoraria, I sit on several pharma myeloma patient advisory councils, including Janssen, BMS, Carrier Farm, Genentech, and GSK. But I'm not being compensated for my testimony here. And I'm also on the International Myeloma Foundation's Board of Directors. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in early 1995 and given two to three years to live. As such, I've been fortunate to participate in multiple clinical trials and have seen the FDA approve 19 new drugs in the last 21 years for myeloma treatment resulting in tripling survival rates. Thank you, FDA, investigators, pharma companies, NCI, and patients who have made this happen. However, we still have no cure. And nearly all of these treatments are given till progression. And when a treatment stops working, patients hopefully are immediately moved to another available treatment option. Unfortunately, studies have also shown that responses are typically shorter with each new line of therapy. For the last 20 years, I have facilitated our large San Francisco Bay Area myeloma support group. Last year, I convened a panel of six of our CAR-T patients, a mix of folks who received CAR-VICTI or VECMA within trials or commercially. They shared a mix of responses ranging from four months and relapsed to four years and counting. 
They experience different side effects, including CRS and neurotoxicities. But when I asked each of them if they would go through a CAR-T again, everyone said yes. And the one reason they all strongly indicated was the opportunity to be off treatment for months or years. Patients get so physically tired from treatment after treatment that a treatment holiday was incredibly beneficial to feeling better. In so many cases, Carvictia has been shown to work well, resulting in excellent responses. I hope you'll consider giving patients a chance to feel better sooner by approving Carvictia usage rather than waiting until after four lines of therapy. This is a difficult disease to battle and giving patients, giving patients a chance to stop treatment sooner rather than later would mean a better quality of life. Until you've experienced myeloma treatment, you can't believe how the side effects can wear you down. The benefit of a treatment holiday means so much to patients. Thank you for listening and your consideration of this request. Thank you, sir. Um, appreciate your perspective. So I think that brings us to speaker number seven. Will speaker number seven please unmute and turn on your webcam? Please introduce yourself and state uh, your name and for the record, any organization you are representing. You will also have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Yalak Baru. I serve as president and CEO of the International Myeloma Foundation. I sit before you today as a myeloma patient, a survivor and an advocate. I was diagnosed at the tender age of 25 in 1995, a few months after uh, the previous speaker 28 years ago. My journey with multiple myeloma has really been one of ups and downs requiring resilience, hope, and treatment and treatment and retreatment. The International Myeloma Foundation, where I serve as president and CEO, receives funding from various sources, including industry partners like Johnson Biotech. I have not been compensated for expressing my opinion today. My sole motivation is to champion a treatment that can change patients' life like mine. My role at IMF allows me to hear the voice of hundreds of patients from across the US and globally. They yearn for more treatment options at different stages of their journey. They are, are all aware that no treatment is a magic bullet. Every option comes with its own set of challenges and a potential side effect. Their goal, to find the best outcome with the least side effect allowing for a better quality of life and bridging the gap to the next treatment until a cure is finally found. Myeloma is really a formidable adversary. It infiltrates our bones, disrupts our immune system, and threatens our very existence. As a patient, I have witnessed firsthand the devastating toll it takes on individuals families and communities. We need more treatment options, innovative solutions that can offer a lifeline to those who face this relentless opponent. I'm not just an advocate, I'm a beneficiary of car victim. Close to 18 months ago, I underwent this transformative therapy. The results were nothing short of remarkable. MRD negative, mass spec negative, M spike negative, with a clean PET CT sustained over 15 months, approaching 18 months. Carvicti allowed me to break free from the cycle of treatment, experience the deepest remission I have known in years, and reclaim my life. It was a second chance, a lifeline that renewed my determination to live fully. The Cartitude 4 approach mirrors how autologous stem cell transplants are used, administered early for maximum impact. Early use of Carvicti had the potential to prevent T cell function, a crucial element of the immune system for future treatments. In closing, I stand here not just as Yalak Baru, but as a collective voice of patients, caregivers, and advocates. We implore you to consider the evidence, the science, and the human stories behind Carvicti. Approving this therapy is not a mere decision. It is a lifeline, an opportunity to change the trajectory of myeloma. Thank you for your attention, your dedication, and your commitment to advancing medicine. Thank you, sir, for sharing your perspective. Brings us to speaker eight. Please unmute and turn on your webcam. Please uh, begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name into the record and any organization you may be representing. You will also have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Deb Holstein and I'm actually a retired oncology nurse. I live in a beautiful little town along the St. Croix River in Hudson, Wisconsin. I am thankful for the time to share my story with Carvicti 
I'm speaking on my own behalf and I'm not being compensated for my testimony. I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma in 2014 and went through the usual Revlimid dexamethasone regimen, followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. I had a poor response to this transplant and after only a few months was back on treatment. It was then 2015 and I was on one treatment after another from then until May of 2020 when I was offered a CAR T therapy with Carvicti. In total, I received seven different lines of treatment in six years. I feel strongly that it is important to approve Carvicti sooner instead of later, waiting for patients to go through four, five, or six lines of treatment, or even seven as in my case. I received my CAR-T therapy with Carvicti two years ago. It was successful and I am still in remission today. This is the longest I have been in remission since being diagnosed. It is the longest I have gone without needing some type of treatment, without being totally impacted by constant fatigue, frequent treatments, numerous daily medications, constant medical appointments and tests and side effects. I am in remission because of Carvicti. But it is more than that. It has given me a normal life again. I'm not wearing rose-colored glasses by any means. I know there might be a day in the future when my Loma will come back, but that day is not today and hasn't been for two years of today's and counting. It feels really good to not wake up every morning knowing that I have cancer. I feel like I can take a deep breath again. I can now make plans with my husband, children, and grandchildren. I can actually plan vacations. I can even book a European river cruise without having to look at my calendar for appointments and treatment dates that might interfere with these plans. I can plan things. What a great way to celebrate. I feel normal and have a normal life again. Cancer patients will understand how important that is to feel normal. Thank you for your time and for letting me share my story and why I believe the benefits of this treatment outweigh the risks. Thank you. Thank you for your 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 story and sharing that with us. Speaker number nine, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Please begin and introduce yourself and any organization you are representing into the record. You will have three minutes, thank you. My name is Jenny Alstrom and I'm the founder and CEO of Health Tree Foundation, a patient advocacy organization supporting multiple myeloma. More importantly, I'm a multiple myeloma patient who was diagnosed in 2010. As a disclosure, I participate on many form of patient ad boards, including Johnson & Johnson's, and Healthtree receives funding support from many companies, including Johnson & Johnson, but I'm not being paid for my testimony today. When I started therapy at the age of 43, I looked for something that was a one and done approach that would allow me to take care of my six young children without constantly being on therapy over many years. I chose tandem transplants, and it turned out to be one of my best decisions. For almost 10 years, I was off all therapy and able to be an advocate for others. About six years after that treatment, however, my myeloma did begin, begin relapsing, but it was slow growing and I had sufficient time to make a decision about my next major therapy while doing what was needed to manage my disease. This time, my strategy was once again to look for a one and done approach. I've spent the last many years understanding the science of myeloma in order to serve my myeloma peers. After a decade of study, consults with experts and careful consideration, I decided I wanted to receive CAR-T therapy and CAR-VIC-D in particular because of the impressive data. What I consider miraculous is that I qualified for and was able to join the car 4 study testing this CAR-T in earlier lines of therapy with the help of my doctor, Doug Saborov. The trial was open in my hometown and I was fortunately randomized into the treatment arm. In November, 2021, I received car in that trial. I had grade one CRS and no ICANS. I'm still MRD negative after two and a half years and hope that will continue for many more. For me, it was a fabulous, effective and safe approach. The timing of this strategy was important in my decision. I chose it because it would be more effective when my immune system was stronger. I chose it because my disease is not yet highly aggressive. I chose it because I believe it is one critical step on a curative path for my multiple myeloma. Like other myeloma patients, I'm not comparing it equally against standard of care options. I'm looking at it strategically. When is a patient's immune system stronger so this immunotherapy has more utility? It's in earlier lines. When is a patient's disease less aggressive and lower risk? It's in earlier lines. 
Our standard of care options today are not curing patients and they place wear and tear on the immune system, making immunotherapies weaker in later lines of treatment. New approaches are critically needed. To, be, to sit in last year's spring ASCO session in person to hear the data readout for CARTITUDE 4 was a memory I won't forget. May other patients be so fortunate. I highly recommend you approve this therapy for patients in earlier lines to open new doors of hope to myeloma patients in the United States. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for sharing your story. Speaker number 10, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Please begin and introduce yourself and state into the record your name and any organization you may be representing. You will have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Doug Keller and I've been a multiple myeloma patient for 12 years. I'm representing myself and have not been compensated in any form for speaking today. My main message today is that currently multiple myeloma patients must go through years of debilitating treatments before they can get CARBIC-D. As is the case for many myeloma patients, I had a bone lesion that caused a broken bone when I fell. After surgery and radiation, I had induction therapy, a stem cell transplant, and lenalidomide maintenance. Over the next eight years, I was on a series of treatments that included belatuzumab, daratumumab, lenalidomide, pomalidomide, carfilzomib, dexamethasone, and various combinations thereof, a clinical trial, and a second stem cell transplant, all without, without achieving remission. I had constant trips to the clinic for blood work and never more than two weeks between treatments. My quality of life during this time was only fair. I suffered from sleep disturbances, rashes, cardiac abnormalities, peripheral neuropathy, fatigue, neutropenia, and the anxiety of a cancer burden. My, con my condition also affected the lives of my caregiver and family. In early 2022, I was able to get a slot for Carvicti. At that point, my serum light chain level was very high at 10,500 milligrams per liter. I had Carvicti at the end of May, and one month later, my serum light chains were three milligrams per liter. I've been in remission ever since with few of the side effects of previous treatments, and my quality of life is excellent. I think what is not well recognized by FDA and the medical community is the often debilitating nature of the standard of care treatments that are available to myeloma patients. According to a 2022 Health Tree Cure Hub study, even the successful quad induction therapy comes with a high level of side effects, including fatigue, neuropathy, neutropenia, anemia, bone pain, and GI effects. While overall survival is important, Myeloma patients don't want to simply survive. They want to live a full life. The response rates of the standard of care treatments are not as good as Carvicti's. Carvicti can give a patient significant time off without treatments and has a better side effect profile than standard of care. Having Carvicti as a fifth line treatment or later is not in the best interest of patients who suffer from years of debilitating treatments before they can get their potential for relief. Carvicti can cause serious AEs, but they're usually temporary in contrast to the standard of care. Patients deserve to have the opportunity to make an informed choice about the use of Carvicti early in the course of a disease that has no cure. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your perspective, sir. So with that, the open public hearing portion of this meeting has now concluded, uh, and we will no longer take comments from the audience. What I'd like to do now is, I know we're we're right at schedule, maybe a little bit behind, but I did promise Dr. Advani that she may ask her question that was a holdover from our earlier session of clarifying questions. I'd like that to be the final question, and then we can move on to our discussion questions. So Dr. Advani, I see you up there. Please go ahead with your question. Thank you, Ranjana Advani from Stanford. Since most of the deaths were people who didn't get to the uh, product, you've clamped patients, this is for the sponsor, a one prior line and then two and three have been clumped together. Was there any difference between those who had one versus two versus three? And then second question is, was the PFS different between one versus two versus three? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. To, to paraphrase, you were in, interested in the, um, the, the aspect of the patients who had one prior line of therapy. Um, before we take a look at the subgroup, I, I, I would like to uh, review again uh, slide 22. 
which has the overall patient population uh, of patients with one to three prior line showing that uh, the primary endpoint was met with a statistically significant hazard ratio of either 0.4 for the unweighted or the 0.26 for the weighted. Um, the subgroups were analyzed. We, we did look at uh, this in slide 23, if we could bring it up. In the one prior line subset, uh, you could see there on the left-hand side of the screen, sort of two-thirds of the way down, with a uh, statistically significant hazard ratio for uh, PFS, uh, which does not cross one, which is significant. If we look at the similar data for OS, uh, we could see the same the performance of that one prior line uh, setting. Uh, if we could look at the uh, OS across subgroups on slide 28, and you could see in the one prior line subgroup, uh, again, hazard ratio for OS in favor of the silta cell arm versus standard of care. Our study was not powered specifically to look at that one prior line subgroup. Uh, we had about a third of patients who received exactly one prior line. So any differences between the performance of the one prior line, two to three prior line uh, is hypothesis generating uh, at best and uh, therefore is not something we could base firm conclusions on whether there's better uh, effect on the one prior line versus two to three. Uh, what I can say, though, is if we look at the one to three prior line in totality, the CART-4 study, compared to the CARTITUDE-1 study, uh, we do get a hint at a uh, better response rate, better uh, durability perhaps, but also equally important, if not more so, better safety. So the adverse events of special interest that are attributable to silta cell are better. Uh, this was a slide that uh, was shown previously um, for, sorry, the adverse event slide. Oh, well, I'll just speak to it in the interest of time. Uh, the incidence of cytokine release syndrome, the incidence of ICANS, the incidence of uh, MNT, uh, the, the Parkinsonism syndrome, uh, all better tolerated in the uh, one to three prior line setting as in CARTITUDE 4 than the later line setting in CARTITUDE 1. Yeah, and then of the people who didn't make it to the, uh, to the product, were they mainly those who had one prior, two prior, or three prior? Right, so I think you're you're specifically asking about the uh, 32, is it the 32 patients yes. who had disease progression? Certainly. Prior so, to starting, prior to starting CETASA. Right, so I could bring this up. Uh, this is uh, PF34. Uh, so on the uh, light blue column all the way on the right, you could see the demographic factors of those patients, those 32 who had early disease progression. And it's not as if they're only in uh, stage three, only in stage two. Uh, you can see that the demographic factors are very similar to the entire patient population, which is the dark blue column, the 208. Uh, so we actually agree with the FDA assessment uh, that was uh, discussed in their slide deck that there are not demographic factors or other variables that we could identify at study baseline that would identify those patients for early risk of progression. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask, request the chair if FDA can also respond. Yes, that would be fine. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Thank you. This is Tong Wang, Bass Stats Reviewer. Um, I just would like to highlight that there are important limitations for the forest plot for both the OS and PFS. First, um, the hazard ratio assessment within each subgroup was calculated based on unstratified log rank tests, ignoring all the stratification factors. And second, based on FDA's exploratory subgroup analysis, in the presence of a crossing hazard pattern or a prolonged overlapping uh, hazard pattern in the capital curves for most subgroups. Um, the average hazard ratio reported within each subgroup is unreliable and uninterpretable. So we would like to um, please ask the committee to interpret the first plot for both PFS and OS um, for subgroup analysis with caution. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That will end the clarifying portion or clarifying question portion of our discussion. And the committee will now turn to its, att its attention to the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We will now proceed with the questions to the committee and panel discussions. I would like to remind public observers that while the meeting is open for public observation, 
Public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. After I read each question, we will pause for any questions or comments concerning wording. We will proceed with our first discussion question, or our first question, which is a discussion question. And we see it displayed here. I will read this. Um, discuss whether the results of Cartitude 4 are sufficient to support a positive risk benefit assessment of silta cell for the proposed indication. So I, I will, if I will ask the committee now, the panel, as we em embark on our discussion, if there are any questions concerning the wording of the question or, or requests for clarity from the FDA before we proceed with our, our discussion. Okay. I'm not really seeing any 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 um, requests for cl clarification, so I think we, we can understand. I would just like to say that oftentimes during the discussions, we start talking about endpoints or, you know, it's conversations with the FDA, other approved agents, FDA approval. I think we just have to remember that the focus of this discussion is actually the questions before us. So, you, you know, the, the question here is clearly asking about the risk benefit assessment of siltal cell. And so if we can keep it on point with that, that would be great. I would like to, I guess, open the floor um, for any comments or, or in the absence of any lead off comments, I would like to lead into the expertise of our invited panel members who probably deal more with multiple myeloma than many of us on this panel. And so that would be Dr. Kwok and Dr. Lattimore. Um, if, you got, if one of you would like to volunteer to give us your thoughts on this specific question at hand. Dr. Kwok, I saw your camera come on, so by all means. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to um, kind of weigh in. Actually, a lot of the testimony that we heard from um, people who treat myeloma and the patients of myeloma echo also my personal. Right. Dr. Kwok, just for um, procedure, just state your name and. and your my name is Mary Kwok. I'm from University of Washington. Um, um, and I actually um, also had the very similar thoughts as. Um, I forgot his name, but the person who said he was a BMT uh, physician, um, that the curves really remind me a lot of um, transplant associated toxicities and things like that, that are high early on. Um, I think it's, um, and a lot of the uh, thoughts on disease heterogeneity and rapid relapse of disease and things like that um, really, really echo um, what I also see in my practice. I think that the, uh, treatment option, um, bringing car, uh, Carvicti or CAR T-cell early on is an important consideration um, uh, for a variety of reasons that were already stated. Um, one, that it's an effective therapy. Sometimes it takes a lot of creativity to get to four lines of therapy. Um, sometimes giving therapies that you think might not be very effective. Um, I also, um, recognize the importance of a one and done treatment. Um, I think uh, I practice in Washington state where I see patients who come to us from outlying states where they might not have access to clinical trials or um, more intensive myeloma therapies. They come to us from Alaska or Montana or Idaho or wherever. And um, to be able to give a one-time treatment and without requiring them to come back and forth is a really important treatment option. I think the, um, it's interesting, and I'm just trying to reconcile in my head, um, like why there would be a difference in the initial overall survival when the um, patients were um, given the same treatments. Um, I wonder if it's just kind of bad luck um, or if there's a more scientific um, explanation. But I think that beyond that, the separation of the survival curves is really striking and impressive to me. So, Dr. Kwok, I think you brought up an interesting point um, and it, it's kind of not been probably touched on a lot, but is it true that my multiple myeloma patients with, you know, who, who face, you know, autologous transplant early on also face a mortality risk? And how would you characterize that risk in the context of what we're seeing here? I would say the risk for with associated with autologous stem cell transplant, it's very, very low, <laughs> like um, probably close to 1%, um, but it's not 
zero, right? And then in terms of, um, you know, we know from studies like the determination study that there's a significant quality of life decrease that goes on during a period of stem cell transplant because of toxicities related to their, you know, intensity of therapy, cytopenias, et cetera. Um, and so it, you know, conceptually, I think that toxicities that go into um, a cell therapy, like receiving CAR T cell where you're getting lymphodepletion and, you know, we know that you're going to have cytopenias and infections. It seems inherent in, you know, the design of the study that that would happen. But if you can get past that, that um, the long-term benefit pays off. Thank you. Dr. Lattimore, Dr. Ivani is also a hematology expert here on this panel. Would either of you like to weigh in specifically on this question of, of the CARTITUDE data and how it is able to support or not a risk-benefit assessment? Yeah, I just want to be, um, I'm Susan Lattimore. I just want to be clear that I'm here as a consumer representative on this oh, okay. panel. That's my, my role apologies. on this committee. Um, but I do want to say in, in, um, in lifting Dr. Kwan's comments, I think we can't understate the ability of individuals who have this period of um, non-treatment that allows them higher quality of life, um, which the data did support, um, and uh, moving into more of a disease-free state. I think that um, certainly there's some confounding data around um, uh, outcomes, um, but I think there's some disclosure from a patient perspective that allows those discussions to really be um, lifted in a physician and a treating physician and a patient realm um, that also allows the opportunity for people to have more ability to have choice in treatment um, and then certainly have that choice earlier on where quality of life may be overwhelmingly improved, but also the opportunity for a higher quality of life to be available to begin with. Um, I don't think that that can be understated. Um, I do think it's difficult to say uh, supporting a positive risk benefit assessment. Some of the data, again, um, from a patient perspective might be very challenging to understand and interpret. Um, and so I think that um, if the committee can come to you or if um, some labeling could come to the opportunity to be overtly transparent about what that risk benefit looks like and entails, in more lay terms, um, I think it would allow for more opportunity of choice on a patient perspective. The chair recognizes Dr. Vassen. Yeah. Neil Vassen, Columbia. Uh, I, I think that this comparison to transplant, I think met metaphorically is, is, is powerful and, and relevant for this patient population. I guess I would just add and wanted to get Dr. Kwok's thoughts on this. You know, obviously with transplant, we do have risk stratification factors as to who is a better candidate than others, age and um, other molecular factors and 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 whatnot. Here, the the discussion has really focused on the fact that there really isn't a stratification factor we can point to to identify the patients who would or would not benefit, uh, or sorry, the patients who would not benefit. And so, um, I wanted if you, to ask if you could comment on that, and if more time. Uh, for, you know, given the heavy censoring, if this longer term follow up may sway that decision also. Um, thanks for the question, but I'm not sure that I'm the best person to answer this. I will just say that in general, like when we think of like stem cell transplant, right, we use kind of age and performance status probably as our biggest like cutoffs and determine, determining eligibility. That doesn't exactly exist for CAR T. I mean, yes, you consider performance status, but you know, the oldest patient I think on this study was 78. And in other types of CAR T cell therapies, like you've seen, you know, we've heard of people getting it in their 80s and things like that. Um, you know, I would wonder if there's more data <laughs> in this setting, but I don't know that I would like take it off the table necessarily for someone purely based on like an age cutoff or something like that. Um, I do wonder, um, you know, about, um, about, you know, just kind of, if I could say something about age, you know, myeloma, people are living longer and longer with myeloma these days, right? And so if there is a consideration that, um, that, uh, 
things like maybe age or other comorbidities will play a role into whether or not they can get CAR T cell. Like it makes me wonder if somebody kind of like is diagnosed, say at age 69, the average age, and then they, you know, get six years out of their initial therapy and then they get, you know, another like two years or three years out of the next subsequent lines of therapy. By the time that they are fourth line therapy, like it's currently FDA approved, they're quite elderly and may have more, you know, comorbidities and things like that. And I wonder if things like that contribute to whether or not somebody can tolerate something like CAR T. Um, and so I think that thinking about bringing it earlier on certainly makes these types of options available to people. Um, although to answer your question directly, I'm not sure that there are strong cutoffs in terms of like who we would necessarily give it to or not. I think we think about things like kidney, um, you know, you know, what's appropriate someone with chronic kidney disease or maybe end-stage renal disease, which is not uncommon in myeloma. Um, you know, whether or not somebody can tolerate the cytokine release syndrome that comes on early on. But um, um, I, I mean, I think these are interesting questions. I just, you know, don't exactly have the answer to them. No. So just, to, just to follow up a little bit on your answer, this is Ryan Med NCI. Um, would you say that age is a, hard, a harder cutoff for a transplant um, than it would be for this, this type of agent? Is that what I heard you say? I think so. Like we, we kind of have like a, we draw a line in the sand. I think because a lot of clinical trials looking at um, autologous stem cell transplant in Europe, it tends to be a little bit on the younger side, like 65 or 70. In the US, we push it a little bit more 70, 75. And it's like a physiologic age, but you know, usually it corresponds well because the risk for transplant related mortality and stuff like that increases. I don't know if that kind of data exactly exists with CAR T cell. And, you know, clearly they were not excluded from this clinical trial for age. And so I think it's an important, you know, option, regardless of age, if somebody's able to receive the treatment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Neil Boston, Columbia, just, just the, the point I was trying to make was that it's an interesting metaphor. And I think that there are a lot of similarities, but it does seem like one difference is the fact that with transplant, we have decades and decades of experience. We have very mature stratification factors for who may or may not be a great candidate. And, and I think with CAR T cells, we have, we have less of that, just given that, that these are new therapies. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Frankel, I see your hands up. Yes, I have a question, maybe back to Dr. Bassan, just to understand his perspective a little bit more on this, because when I am interpreting the data, for me, after the patient receives, or for the patients who receive it, to me, they have a very clear benefit based on the PFS and the, and the trending OS. So I'm wondering if you're, when you're thinking about stratification, are you thinking about people who can kind of make it to the therapy, or are you actually thinking about it for the patients on therapy? Because for me, the bridge, for me, the when I look at the study, it's really the maintenance of the patients during bridging that is critically important and maybe something that requires more transparency and education or um, that we need to allow the physician and patient to decide what's best for them based on the heterogeneity of the population and also the emerging treatment landscape. But again, so my question is, are you talking about up, up until bridging or, or after with this specific drug? Yeah, I guess, I guess both. And also if the question of if longer follow up, given that the information fraction was lower, I think it was about a third, right, on this interim analysis, if if longer, uh, that was my question to Dr. Quox, or I guess I'm answering your question with the question as well. Uh, if if longer term follow up would sort of shed light on on these separations. I, I mean, I guess to answer your question, Dr. Frankel, um, you know, I think that for those patients who are um, not receiving therapy, I guess the question is just, you know, to what extent does that confound the data? And I think we've we've seen a lot of um, sub analyses, sensitivity analyses that have that have pointed to 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 what that is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. May I make one more comment? Uh, Go ahead, Dr. Frankel. I mean, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'll just say that I think that with the OS, the OS curve, the crossing of the OS curves, right, is not going to change. That has like long passed, but we could continue to see there's see further separation or or lowering of that you know with continued follow up but the crossing is done right based on the timing of the study yes yeah that it does seem in the in the early stages yeah thank you so dr advani i wanted to give you an opportunity to weigh in as more of a heme, heme special or heme malignancy specialist did you have any thoughts you want to add to this question specifically 
and I think it's a difficult comparison because uh, we have a lot of experience with transplant and. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, you can answer that question if you like. I just meant the FDA question about the the data and how it supports a positive risk benefit assessment. Not necessarily the. Tra if you want to talk about the transplant, you can as well. But I, I meant more the either one. Quite frankly, go ahead. I mean, I think the. Uh, I think the. the, the I don't have questions on this right now or to how to clarify it better. It's a little gray area because it's, we're referring to those 32 patients who didn't make it predominantly because otherwise the data looks great and there's no stratification factor which came across as you know, separate, helping us understand who those patients were compared to the rest of the population. So I don't know how to sort of think of it any differently. Okay. Yeah, and we'll get to the early, early uh, you know, events um, with the second question that we have for discussion here today. Does anybody else have any additional comments? You know, I, I think Dr. Frankel did bring up the point that, you know, probably isn't said, but, you know, the curves have crossed and, and that was in the past. And we have seen that with immunotherapy trials sometimes in the, in the past. Dr. Nieva? Yeah, I just want to add that, um, you know, part of this issue of, of the startup time um, is a somewhat going to be ameliorated when it leaves the clinical trial setting, uh, because we have consent processes and an authorization process, and we, you know, we we've looked at, you know, how long it takes to get people started up on clinical trials, and and it does add about thirty days, uh, and for these patients, that thirty days may actually have been. Actually, a difference you know, I'll, just, I'll just ask you to hold this thought. You'll be the first one to talk in the second question. Because that the second question actually focuses on the on the early the early the risk of early death, so that's actually a great way to kick off that. But do we have any other discussion points specifically on discussion question number one here? I, I think just to summarize this discussion, I think there you know there is a sense that there is benefit. Um, there there are risks here um, to this population, but in some ways, somewhat modulated, the risks are a little bit similar. Uh, in some ways, to the risks of transplant that this population has faced before. Um, you know, something that's lost in the curves, but really came out in the discussion, not just amongst the panel, but also the patients, is, you know, the progression-free survival is, is really also like a, a, a freedom of treatment. And these, these patients are liberated from therapy as well. And I think that was something that resonated with the panel discussion here, that some of the, the benefit here is indeed... Um, you know, being able to get a therapy and then kind of coast for a while. I do think that the risk component will take on um, a, a another discussion component here as we get to the second discussion question, which we will now, uh, I guess, move on to that, um, which talks about the early deaths. And I think that's kind of where the risks has been, hi has been highlighted. Um, and so here is the discussion question that's now displayed. I, I think that at this time, we will not be taking any any uh, comments from uh, the sponsor. Um, it is this is the discussion point for um, the panel here again, um, and the question is: Is the risk of early death associated with siltal cell treatment acceptable in the context of the PFS benefit? And so I cut off. Um, are, is, before we move on to this, are there any requests for clarifications from uh, the FDA on this question? And again, I'd like the, the discussion here really to focus on the early deaths um, that we're seeing on this as the question is asking us to focus on. So in, in the context of what was seen later in the trial. So any questions for clarifications from the FDA? Okay, I think those two hands that I see were up before my request for questions. So please let me know if that's incorrect. No. Okay. So with respect to Dr. Nieva, who I somewhat rudely cut off earlier, and I apologize, sir, but I will allow you to kick off this discussion with the points that you were making, which I think are very relevant to this question. So please go ahead. Uh, thank you, George Nieva, USC. Um, so, so I was saying that, you know, in the clinical trial context, there's going to be more delays than there will be in actual practice. Uh, because of the, the consent process and everything else associated with trial enrollment. So, so we expect that problem of delays to, to go down. Now, I, I think we've heard some comments from, from the FDA that, 
you can't analyze the survival, the OS curves, um, because uh, we don't have a priori rules and formal testing at this level of events. Uh, but those curves are pretty wide. Um, they don't look like they're going to cross again. And I think the MRD data that we have also supports they're not going to cross again. So I, th I really think this is, this is a case of front-loaded risk, much like we see with many other things in medicine. Um, and I think as long as the, the patients understand the magnitude of the front-loaded risk, um, then, then I think these risks are acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nave. I appreciate you holding those comments for this section. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Spratt, your hand was up uh, next. Thank you, Dan Spratt, uh, UH Simon Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University. Yeah, so uh, when I look at this, it, it's very interesting, the early deaths, because there's also, right, it, it, because we're talking about a PFS benefit, there's also um, a worse or inferior PFS early on as well. And so you have to look at this uh, in the context globally, and both by, as the FDA appropriately stated, we'll say a, a flood, assuming proportional hazards analysis, but even in their analysis, which I, of course would never be pre-specified, looking only zero to three months, there statistically was not statistically significant. And looking over the whole curves, it is. And by, as the, the sponsor showed, the restricted mean survival time is a benefit kind of at various cut points, which I, I still very much, I don't think any trial will ever be able to pre-specify for non-proportional hazards because you would not know that necessarily a priori. And so given it's widely accepted in the statistical community that that is probably a more appropriate way of looking at this, I, I think that for patients treated, there is a non-significant increase in early deaths, and there's a significant improvement in survival and PFS. So I'm not overall concerned, and I think Dr. Nieva hit the nail on the head, is just I think these are delays related, and we talked about COVID and talked about real world versus clinical trials. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Spratt. Dr. Liu. Yeah, I'll keep my comments short because I totally agree with Dr. Nieva and Dr. Spratt. I'll just make mention, you know, when you look at the context of the progression-free survival benefit and the sheer number of patients that you see on the tail of that curve, along with the duration of durable response, and then you put that into context of, you know, what could be harm, you know, and for sure in the first, you know, three to six months, but I'm just, you know, I keep going back to the sheer number of events that we see. Uh, and it's a really small number. And that's why, to Dr. Spratt's point, when you look at the confidence intervals, and I, I know safety is descriptive, we shouldn't rely on statistical analyses here, but those confidence intervals are unbelievably high when you look at the hazard ratio. And that really just reflects uh, the, the small number of events, you know, in that period of time. And so, you know, to answer this question, when you kind of look at the context of the harm and a handful of events in the early months, compared to the tail of the curves that we're seeing, um, I think it's a pretty clear signal of a uh, benefit. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Dr. Hunsberger? Uh, Sally Hunsberger. Yeah, and I just think, I, I just want to emphasize again, the, those the, the censoring only in the control arm is problematic to me, especially again, in that the fact that there are just so few in the first three months and there's four censored events that could totally make up. Those could be the people that, that would have died they're you know going off treatment to get something else. So I again the the imbalance in the centering is also a problem to me. So I, I think I I also feel that that the risk is, is probably acceptable. Hi, um, this is FDA. We would like to respond as well. Is that okay? Yes. Thank, thank you. I'd like to bring Dr. Scott from Statistics. Thank you. Thank you, John Scott Statistics. Um, yeah, we appreciate the committee's discussion of the RMST. We just wanted to point out that the interpretation of RMST does very much depend on when you're looking at it, what the cut points are, and that we're not yet 
fully convinced of a long-term advantage on overall survival, um, although certainly there is separation visually in the curves after the crossing point. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying. I, I think, you know, the committee accepts the uncertainty of the data as it stands, but we're doing our best, I think, and I, I don't, if I'm not speaking for everybody, go ahead. Um, but I think we're doing our best to wrap our heads around it. But I think Dr. Sprat can maybe go ahead and say something more eloquent than what I just said. Go ahead, Dr. Sprat. Yeah, I mean, just for discussion point um, to the FDA, right? I mean, there's obviously the clinical, oh, sorry, Dr. Spratt, uh, Dan Spratt from uh, UH Seven Cancer Center. I, I, I think that statistical tests, while none of them are perfect, there is conventional statistical significance using both, you know, a log rank, a hazard ratio, um, I assume they use some type of Cox proportional hazard, um, as well as it, the sponsor presented. It wasn't in the, the packet provided. It was statistical significance. I realized for RMS, you have to pick a time point. And so picking something around 20 some odd months were decent follow up, um, or the 36 months, I, I believe. So I think by any standard statistical test, realizing most of all of this is not pre-specified. They all are directionally consistent and reach statistical significance. So it just seems that we're digging really, really hard to focus on a non-statistically significant, very, very few events early on. And I would just sort of state that, are we looking in contrast at survival curves that separate early on in favor of, let's say, the investigational agent, but come back together or maybe cross later on. How do we handle th that? And I don't want to be tangential here, but they often come back together and we often don't follow patients long enough to see if they end up flipping. So it, it just seems that there may be a little some inconsistencies here to be putting so much weight on a, a couple events early on. Thanks. Um, John Scott, FDA Biostatistics. Yeah, I, I certainly appreciate your comments. Um, I can't really speak to the second part of that about curves um, coming together later, but I, I would say there's a variety of statistical significance tests that can be used, but we always put a very strong premium on the pre-specified primary analyses of trials to um, support regulatory decision making, because looking post hoc and choosing cut points after all the data have been observed um, does tend to inflate the false positive chance of, of being misled. Um, having said that, uh, we support the committee using all the evidence they have in front of them to, uh, to make up their minds. Thank you. And Ravi Madden and CI, I think from my perspective, I don't know if this is shared across the committee, but it's it's almost unsatisfying because we have these six or eight early deaths before treatment, uh, but we, we really can't pin down exactly what happened. We, we can chalk it up to bridging therapy or COVID and, you know, both of those things leave the door open for, you know, things to, to get better in the future, which we hope, but, you know, I think we're used to having more of a, a, of a direct tie. And depending on how you see this a little bit, and it's actually, I think, dictated by the long-term outcomes, you know, what do you do when you have so much unknown around such a small number of, of patients in the beginning? Um, and how does that balance with the long-term potential benefits here? That's at least have my thoughts on this question. Any other comments um, from the panel? So I, I think, in, in summarizing this, the panel is struck by the, the panel is struck by the fact that there are numerically increased deaths early on. You know, it's hard with descriptive statistics to really understand, you know, the the implications and the ultimate determinations here. But there is a sense of long term benefit as well, um, and so I, I think the the sense of the panel's discussion here has been that you know they are there are issues up front but they are small and perhaps balanced by the long term benefits and if any, if anyone wants to clarify that characterization of this discussion further please let me know but but i also think we have to acknowledge that statistically we can't be as certain as as maybe we'd like to be with the final polished results of a phase 3 trial or something so and i think that that is well understood by the panel as well and that's part of the reason why it's a discussion point 
here. Um, the FDA wants to make a final comment. Go ahead. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. We'd like to make one additional comment. Thank you. Hi, it's Lola Fashwena J again from FDA. Um, I, I guess I just want to um, to emphasize and, and clarify um, sort of our uh, view of these data. We, we may never know why there was this increase uh, early deaths in the cell to cell arm compared to the control arm. Uh, this trial was not designed in a way that allows us to know with certainty which population uh, is uh, experiencing um, these uh, increased deaths in the treatment arm. This trial was a randomized trial. We do see these early deaths. And what we're asking the committee really here is to consider whether in light of the clinical benefit um, shown in this trial, which we agree is clinically uh, meaningful, um, whether um, those uh, that benefit um, outweighs these risks, which are you know risks associated with um, cell to cell treatment, uh, whether it's uh, before the treatment is administered or after the treatment is administered, it's a risk when a patient um, is referred to receive this treatment, they're foregoing other treatments that may not result in deaths. Um, and so the totality of the risks uh, associated with the treatment should be considered as part of the benefit risk assessment. Now, there was a lot of discussion around um, the overall survival curves and the data provided um, for survival. And, um, you know, I think another consideration for the committee may be whether or not um, at this time um, it is your assessment um, that those additional data um, provide uh, more support and uh, reassurance uh, around the, the clinical benefit in a way that um, uh, outweighs, again, those risks that we don't completely understand uh, why uh, the, these early deaths occurred. Um, so that's ultimately the reason we convened this uh, committee, is for you to say, you know, these PFS data, this evidence uh, of uh, effectiveness, um, how do we uh, consider these early deaths in that context? Um, but this trial is not going to tell us who for whom CAR T in this line of treatment is, uh, you know, more favorable than, than another group. Thank you. Right. I, I think our discussion point, Ravi, Matt, and NCI, I think our discussion points have really wrestled with those, those six or eight patients early on that we don't know that are before the therapy. I think that's actually been um, the crux of a lot of our discussions here. And my sense is, you know, generally there is a sense of, of benefit in terms of PFS here. But, but I welcome anyone from the committee uh, or the panel, I should say, who would like to, to join in or... Um, have any other comments in addition to, to that context. But, but I think our discussion's been within that context. And if they, anyone wants to chime in on, on, go ahead, Dr. Frankel. Go ahead. Coming. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll just say like the rate, like when I look at the FDA slide on slide 21, the rate of death in the first 10 months after randomization, which, I think is the context of what we're talking about here, but I also appreciate the sponsor's demonstration of the data where it was really in the first like two months, right? That accounted for the difference in the death, but let's, um, with, which of course they didn't re receive the drug yet. But if I look at that data that the FDA showed on slide 21, right? It's 14% versus 12% um, in the rate of death. And that's in the beginning before treatment, First of all, I, I don't know, 14 to 12%. It's hard to know how if that's really a meaningful um, difference. And then it's driven by progressive disease prior to treatment, which makes sense. And then after treatment, the rate of death is actually lower in the cytosol arm. It's 9.1% versus 11.3%. Um, so overall lower. And then that AE of the AE rate of 7.7% versus four point so sorry the I'm just trying to remember from that. So the um the, the slide's up, I think they put it up. Oh the, the slide is up. Okay. Oh thank you. Yeah. So here where it's sorry, the um after treatment, the higher rate of death um is due to AE is 7.7% versus 4.2%, but then that's traded with death from PD, 
right? And results in the overall, right? So to me, it, it, it's, it's definitely a positive kind of risk benefit ratio here when we're looking at it. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, and I think you've, you've highlighted a slide that's kind of pinpointed a lot of what we've been discussing here, Dr. Frankel. So I thank you for doing that. Does anyone else want it? Dr. Spratt, go ahead. Yes, Dan Spratt, Case Western. Again, just trying to make it a discussion here is just again to respond, I appreciate uh, what the FDA said that they want for regulatory approval to focus on pre-specified endpoints. And just going back to here, uh, the question here, discussion point, right? So the PFS benefit pre-specified was positive. Um, I don't know if they can pull up on the FDA's presentation slide 30, uh, which is the OS data with the longer term follow-up data cut off from December 13th, 2023, if, if that can be shown. But um, in, in the context, perfect. So on the right, you know, we're talking about the early deaths. I, I think, uh, again, there's not, they showed, and I realized the common intervals are incredibly wide because the so few events early on, there is no statistical difference. I think many of us early on, if you saw curves that just sort of floated around there, we would say that's probably just negative, no difference. Um, but there's plenty of events happening, um, you know, after that. So I think in this pre-specified secondary endpoint of overall survival was also statistically significant. Um, so I am still a little bit confused here. The pre-specified a priori endpoints were positive. Right, and I think that that factors into a little bit of our discussion here um, because we have some positive long-term uh, with, with survival and PFS signals, but the, the short-term focus of this question is really the early risk of death. And so we're struggling with that a little bit, but I, I think that's actually been the heart of the matter this morning and, and not something lost on the panel. And, and I, I do think that Dr. Spratt in, in a lot of ways summed it up very nicely that, you know, we're seeing those curves, we're seeing the PFS benefit and, you know, the deaths up front are, are concerning and, and definitely factoring into our decision, including the, uh, the deaths before treatment. Um, and, and that's factored into our discussion here. My sense again from this conversation that we're having about specifically question two, just as a summary, is that there is an acknowledgement of early risk some of what may or may not be clearly mitigated in the future. You know, there, there is optimism that that's possible, but there are no guarantees, but, but it does sense that it, it does lead to long-term benefits here. And I think that's the sense of the, the panel, although I think we'll, you know, have a vote coming up with our third question. So that's how I would kind of summarize our discussion point here. I appreciate everyone for contributing. I think this was good. Um, so with that, uh, unless there are any last comments, we will now proceed to question three, which is a voting question. I don't see any hands. So Dr. Joyce Frimpong will now provide us instructions for the voting question. And again, just should pay attention to what the question's asking and make sure that we go ahead. So Dr. Frimpong, you're up. Thank you, Dr. Madan. This is Joyce Frimpong, DFO. Question three is a voting question. Voting members will use the Zoom platform to submit their votes for this meeting. If you are not a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room while we conduct the vote. After the chairperson reads the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, we will announce that voting will begin. You should select, a voting window will appear where you can submit your vote. There'll be no discussion during the voting session. You should select the button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Please note that once you click submit, button, you will not be able to change your vote. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Please note that there will be a momentary pause as we tally the vote results and return non-voting members into the meeting room. Next, the vote results will be displayed on the screen. I'll read the vote results from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. Voting members should address any subparts of the voting question, including the rationale for their vote. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? Since there are no questions, I will hand it back to Dr. Madonna so we can begin. 
Okay. So I'll ask for slide four to come up and here it is. This is the voting question that we are being asked to vote on. Is the risk benefit, benefit assessment of Siltal cell for the proposed indication favorable? And I'll ask the committee or panel if they have any requests for clarification on voting question number three. Not seeing any hands requesting clarification. I think uh, we'll move forward uh, with voting on question three. We will now move non-voting participants to the breakout room.
Voting has closed and is now complete. The voting results will be displayed. Ready to display, sharing the results. Thank you. Um, we will, I think, uh, not seeing the Excel voting list, but we will now go down the list. Oh, Dr. Madan. Um, go ahead. I'll be able to read. Go ahead. There go ahead. are 11 yeses, zero noes, and zero abstentions. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Frimpong. We will go down the list and have everyone who voted uh, um, state their name into the record. Uh, you may also include the rationale for your vote. Um, it looks like I am up first, so I will go ahead and do that. So I think that uh, I voted yes. Uh, the data from the, the Cartitude 4 is still somewhat immature, but it appears to be favorable in its totality at this time. While the risks of death, early death, often prior to therapy, are not ignored in this discussion or this vote this morning, it does seem to be outweighed by the long-term potential benefits here. Uh, ideally, emphasis in the further development of this therapy could be placed in better understanding how to optimize bridging therapy and guarding against infection um, for, the, for patients with multiple myeloma to further optimize this therapy. Um, our second vote comes from John DeFelice. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my perspective is for, uh, from a myeloma uh, perspective. I've had myeloma for 13 years, and I know most of the people that gave testimonials um, for um, Carbicti um, based on the Cartitude 4 study. I've been a um, facilitator of a support group in New Mexico for greater than 10 years, and we've had attendees at the last meeting from California and New York. Um, We've also started a support group through the IMF, a Spanish support group, which is mostly international, uh, and I also um, volunteer for the LLS. Um, as we witnessed, it, we, we were informed that the deaths were not related to Carvicti, but were related to other issues, and it was during the pandemic. And... Um, we were also informed that there may be um, variations and options for uh, bridging therapy. So I uh, wholeheartedly voted yes. Thank you, Mr. DeFelice. Dr. Advani? So I, I voted yes uh, for very similar reasons that I think the uh, benefit uh, uh, is uh, pretty robust and there's a uh, the small number of patients in the beginning, largely the deaths are related to not getting the treatment or inadequate bridging or delay or COVID, not completely understood, but I think overall it was a very positive trial with significant benefit to most patients. Thank you. Dr. Liu? Hi everybody, this is Chris Liu from University of Colorado. I voted yes. Uh, to me, I thought that the data that was striking was the tail of the PFS curve and the duration of response. And if patients have a chance to get a durable response while being off of therapy, the question is whether or not the patients are willing to undertake the risk that we see uh, in the data so far of early progression or death. And so the old adage is, is the run worth the slide? And the run here, it's not trivial. We're talking about potential increased risk of death in the early months. There's no question that these patients are going to experience cytokine release syndrome, the possibility of ICANs, other long-term toxicities. If there's only a minimal improvement in PFS, the answer here is always no. You know, it's too short of a, you know, quote, slide. However, there's a chance for a long, durable response while not receiving toxic therapy during that response time. The answer may be yes. And I honestly believe the answer will likely be yes for patients who may want just a chance at a long, durable time off treatment uh, for multiple myeloma. And so, therefore, I believe the benefit risk profile is favorable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Dr. Grash here. Yeah, much the same. I felt that the long-term PFS was compelling. The survival is going in that direction. Furthermore, the upfront risk, I remain unconvinced 
that that's directly attributable to the therapy itself. Uh, I think there are other factors that are likely contributing rather than the, um, the, the therapy in question. So I think the totality of the data is what uh, uh, motivated me to vote oh, yes. Thank you. Dr. Vossen? Hi, Neil Vossen, Columbia. I voted yes. So for me, this came down to acknowledging the very real but small risks of early death relative to the large benefits. And I believe that the benefits here do outweigh the risks. I, I think that the analogy to bone marrow transplant is relevant and that in further years, as we obtain more experience with CAR T cells and myeloma, we'll have a better understanding of all of these risks and benefits. Uh, that being said, I do have concerns about the balance in post-progression therapies in this trial, which would directly impinge on OS. Um, I'd like to thank the FDA and the applicant. I think this was a productive discussion today on endpoints. It's clear that there are challenges in getting patients to CAR T therapy in myeloma, and I hope that all stakeholders can further define the subgroups of patients who uh, who can and cannot make it to therapy and expedite the timeline to receiving CAR T cells. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vassen. Dr. Nieva? Uh, George Nieva, USC, I voted yes. Uh, you know, people want to be cured, and this treatment induces long-term eradication of minimal residual disease. But I, I think it comes at an upfront cost, and I, and I don't think it's entirely it's, I don't think it's entirely the delays. I think it, it's also the, uh, the preconditioning regimen. Um, but, you know, this is something that can be individually decided between patients and physicians. Uh, and I think each person can uh, decide for themselves if uh, uh, the run is worth the slide, as uh, Dr. Liu said. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nee. Dr. Spratt? Uh, yes, Dan Spratt, UH Simon Cantor Center at Case Western Reserve University. I voted yes. Um, I, I think the FDA was very appropriate to focus on these uh, early deaths. Uh, however, seeing the totality of the data, I think both the pre-specified primary and at least all the presented secondary endpoints, so PFS, CRs, minimal residual disease I just mentioned, and even including overall survival, clearly favor um, this, this agent. I think the benefit um, outweighs the, the risks, and I think there's a lot of learning lessons to continue to optimize this as well as I think the discussion today is, is worth further discussion also on, you know, uh, design of endpoints and pre-specification of, of analyses and how to actually um, in, embed these in, in a realistic way. Thank you, Dr. Spratt. Dr. Lattimore? Um, thank you, Susan Lattimore. I also voted yes. Um, I just want to lift the comments of um, others on this committee in that um, the opportunity for off-treatment time um, is incredibly compelling for patients and families. Um, certainly improving access to this treatment will improve overall outcomes um, for all individuals. So I um, appreciate the conversation and um, a second look at this data. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore. Dr. Hunsberger? Uh, Sally Hunsberger. Yes, I, I voted yes. I, I agree that the, um, the the PFS data is very strong. Um, I, I think it was appropriate for the FDA to to want to explore the early deaths and um, ask you know this question. So I, I do applaud that. So I I affirm Dr. Spratt's comments, but I do think the long term survival curves that are looking to separate are are really important and kind of outweigh the early deaths. But I think we we do need to explore what's going on early. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hunsberger. Dr. Kwok. Um, Mary Kwok, University of Washington Fred Hutch Cancer Center. I also voted yes. Um, I think uh, the separation of the curve showing improvement of, um, of PFS with uh, this regimen early on is impressive. It's an important therapy. And I just echo um, other, other comments from this panel. Um, I also agree that um, the treating oncologist will have to have a serious conversation with the patient when it comes time to um, choose this option to kind of explore um, um, the increased risk of death. And then I also look forward to future data to help us understand 
what's going on and what we can do to improve. Thank you, Dr. Kwok. So I think just to summarize, we see that the votes were 11 for yes and, and zero for no. I, I think the committee in this discussion today clearly recognize that the early deaths uh, are a concern and something that really needs to be worked on to be mitigated in the future. Um, but I also think that the committee recognized that uh, despite our best efforts, we probably don't have one clear cause for, for that. And on top of that, the PFS data is, is encouraging. And then the added dimension of the fact that those aren't just curves, but are patients free of therapy, I think really resonated with the committee today. And I think there was some optimism that these survival curves are giving us a glimpse into truly longer dur duration of, you know, flattening of the curves or tails on the curves, as, as we like to say, which maybe indicates a, a much more longer disease-free survival. Um, but I think that everybody agrees that, you know, we need to pay attention to these upfront deaths and also optimize this and, and continue to follow this data. Taking a step back, though, I think I agree with the committee here. This was an important um, question to ask, and I appreciate the FDA for their balanced uh, discussion and, and helping us understand the data in an added dimension as well. I, I appreciate the openness of, of Janssen Biotech in, in sharing their data and, and the presentations that I thought were very good on both, both the FDA and the, and the sponsor side. We had 10 open public hearing speakers, um, and you know they shared their stories, and I do think that, again, it resonated with the committee so I just want to say thank you um, to everybody for joining this morning session. Uh, we still have an afternoon session to come, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but before we do adjourn this morning session, I just want to make sure that there are no last comments from the FDA. So thank you. I think uh, I, I would just like to, on behalf of the FDA, really thank the committee for the robust conversation and discussion this morning. It was extremely helpful to us, and we appreciate your time and the thought that you put into that discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so we are now going to adjourn uh, this morning session. We went a little long, so um, you know I would like to reconvene at 1:30 instead of 1:25. Um, the FDA has given us uh, an opportunity to do that, so. Um, we can reconvene then at 1.30. Panel members, please remember that there's no discussion or chatting of the meeting topics with other panel members during this break or lunch. Additionally, uh, panel members should plan to join back at 1.20 p.m. Eastern time uh, to ensure that we are connected before we reconvene to start the afternoon session at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, everybody, for a productive morning session.
Good afternoon and welcome. I would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you are not speaking. And uh, uh, slide two, please. My name is Ravi Madden, and I will be chairing uh, this afternoon's uh, session and meeting. I will now call the afternoon session of the March 15th, 2024 Oncologic Drugs and Advisory Committee, Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee meeting to order. Dr. Joyce Frimpong is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting and will begin with introductions. Thank you, Dr. Madan. Good afternoon. My name is Joyce Frimpong and I'm the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation. I will start with our standing members, Dr. Advani. Uh, Ranjana Advani, I'm a, a hematologist oncologist at Stanford. Thank you. Dr. Gratishar. Bill Gratishar, Northwestern University. Thank you. Dr. Liu. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Liu, GI medical oncologist from the University of Colorado. For our chairperson, Dr. Madan. Ravi Madden, Medical Oncologist, National Cancer Institute. Thank you. Dr. Nieva. Hello, I'm George Nieva, Thoracic Medical Oncologist, University of Southern California, Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Spratt. Uh, Dan Spratt, I'm the Chair of Radiation Oncology at University Hospital Seidman Cancer Center in Case Western Reserve University. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vasan. Hi, Neil Vossen. I'm a breast oncologist and physician scientist at Columbia University Cancer Center. Thank you. And now for our industry representative, Dr. Frankel. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Tara Frankel. I'm the head of oncology development at Bayer Pharmaceuticals. Thank you. And now for our temporary voting members. Um, first for our patient representative, Dr. DeFlace. Hello, I'm John DePlice. I'm a gastroenterologist and I'm a 13 year survivor of myeloma. Thank you. Dr. Hunsberger. Sally Hunsberger, bio, sorry, biostatistician at NIAD. Thank you. Dr. Kwok. Hi, my name is Mary Kwok. I am at the University of Washington and Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Thank you. And now for our consumer representative for the meeting, Ms. Lattimore. Hi, I'm Susan Lattimore. Thank you. And now for our FDA participants, Dr. Pazder. Hi, uh, Dr. Richard Pazder, Director of the Oncology Center of Excellence. Thank you. Dr. Thierry. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. I'm Mark Thierry, Deputy uh, Director, Oncology Center of Excellence, FDA. Dr. Verdun. Good afternoon, Nicole Verdun, the director of the Office of Therapeutic Products. Thank you. Dr. Kanapuru. Hi, uh, Bindu Kanapuru. I'm a hematologist, oncologist, physician, and Oncology Center of Excellence Medical Oncology Review Team Lead. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Skolik. Hi, Rob Sakalik, Chief of Hematologic Malignancy Branch at uh, CBER. Thank you. Dr. Sharma. Good afternoon. I'm Purnima Sharma, a hematologist oncologist in the Office of Clinical Evaluation, CBER, and the primary reviewer for this application. Thank you. And Dr. Lin. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Xue Mary Lin. Um, I'm a mathematical statistician at the uh, Division of Biostatistics at CBER. Uh, I'm the primary uh, statistical reviewer of this BLA supplement. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Madan, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Dr. Frimpong. For topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions, some of which are strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting will be a fair and open forum for discussion of these issues and that individuals can express their opinions and views without interruption. Thus, a general reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting this afternoon. 
In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and the Government in Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open form of the meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, FDA will refrain from discussing the, the details of this meeting with the media until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topic uh, uh, during breaks. Thank you. Dr. Fringpong will now uh, read the conflict of interest statement in, uh, for the meeting. Thank you. The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's meeting of the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by, but not limited to those found at 18 USC section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it's determined that the agency's need for a special government employee services outweigh their potential financial conflict of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect, expect from the employee. Related to the discussion of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children. And for the purposes of 18 U.S.C. Section 208 for their employers, these interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents, and royalties and primary employment. Today's agenda involves discussion of Supplemental Biologics License Application SBLA 125736.218 for a BECMA at a Captagen Vibusel, suspension for intra intravenous infusion submitted by Celgene Corporation, a Bristol Myers Squibb company. The proposed indication is for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multimyeloma who have received an immunomodulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The committee will have a general discussion focused on the overall survival data in study MM-003, CARMA-3, and the risk and benefit of idacaptogene vicucel in the intended population. This is a particular matters meeting during which specific matters related to the supplemental biologic application 125736.218 will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, a conflict of interest waiver has been issued in accordance with 18 U.S.C. Section 208B3 to Dr. Mary Kwok. Dr. Kwok's waiver involves a consulting interest under negotiation with the firm. The waiver also involves 10 of the employer's research contracts for various studies funded by the party to the matter or competing firms. Dr. Kwok's employer, employer receives between zero to 50,000 per year for each of the four total studies from Janssen, Siagen, Celgene, and a competing firm between 50,000 and 100,000 per patient enrolled for one study from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, between 100,000 and 300,000 per year for each of the two total studies from Janssen and Sanofi, between 100,000 and 300,000 for enrolled patients for each of the two total studies from Janssen Research and Development, 1001 and Abbevy, and between 300,000 and 500,000 per year for one study from Harpoon Therapeutics. The waiver allows this individual to participate fully in today's deliberations. FDA's reasoning 
for issuing the waiver are described in the waiver document, which is posted on the FDA's website on the advisory committee webpage, which can be found at www.fda.gov and by searching on March 15, 2024, ODAC. Copies of the waiver may also be obtained by submitting a written request to the agency's Freedom of Information Division, 5630 Fisher Lane, room 1035, Rockville, Maryland, 20857. All requests may be sent via fax to 301-827-9267. To ensure transparency, we are encouraging all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements they have made concerning the product at issue. With respect to the FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Tara Frankel is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative, acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Frankel's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Frankel is employed by Bayer Pharmaceuticals. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and the exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with the firm at issue. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Madam. Thank you, Dr. Primpon. We will now proceed with FDA introductory remarks from Dr. Robert Sokoluk. Thank you. My name is Rob Sokoluk. I'm the chief of the malignant heme branch at uh, the Office of uh, Clinical Evaluation in CBER. I will uh, briefly introduce the purpose of the, of the convening of this Oncology Drugs Advisory Committee meeting. Next slide, please. Thank you. During this meeting, we'll be discussing the clinical development program for Idacabdachine Viclucel, also known as Idacel and Abecma, for the treatment of relapsed multiple myeloma. Idacel is an autologous T cell immunotherapy for the treatment of myeloma. Cells are engineered to express a chimeric antigen receptor directed against BCMA, a protein expressed by benign and malignant plasma cells. Idacel is currently approved for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after four or more prior lines of therapy, including an immunomodulus Hoya agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The applicant, Celgene, submitted a Supplemental Biologics License Application, or BLA, seeking expansion of the Idacel indication to the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received an immune modulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 antibody. Next slide, please. During my brief remarks, I will describe the meeting purpose, provide an overview of the trial whose results provide the basis for the applicant's request for approval, and conclude with the questions for which we are requesting the committee's discussion. Next slide, please. Next slide. The applicant submitted the results of the KARMA-3 trial to provide evidence of the safety and effectiveness of Siltacel for the proposed indication. KARMA-3 demonstrated an improvement in progression-free survival in patients randomized to Idacel compared to patients randomized to standard care therapy. During the review of the application, FDA identified the higher rate of early deaths in the Idacel arm compared to the standard therapy as a major review issue. Specifically, visual inspection of the Kaplan-Meier curves for overall survival indicates a crossing hazards pattern with an early decrement in overall survival through the first 15 months. As you'll hear from my colleagues in the subsequent FDA presentations, the crossing hazard pattern renders the average uh, hazard ratio uninterpretable. We asked the members of the committee to discuss and provide input on the adequacy of the data from the KARMA-3 trial to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of Siltacel for the proposed indication, taking into account the effects on, on progression-free survival and the increased rate of early deaths observed in the Siltacel arm. Next slide, please. I'll now briefly review the KARMA-3 trial. Next slide, please. 
CARMA-3 is an ongoing open-label randomized phase three clinical trial. A total of 386 participants with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after two to four regimens, including an imidaproteasome inhibitor and daratumumab, who had disease refractory to the last regimen, were randomized. Participants were randomized to either a single infusion of IDASEL after having undergone lymphophoresis, bespoke product manufacturing, and lymphodepleting chemotherapy, or to standard care immunochemotherapy until progression or intolerance. Treatment response is assessed in CARMA-3 using the 2016 IMWG criteria. Next slide, please. Shown here is the Kaplan-Meier plot for progression-free survival for the intention to treat population at the interim analysis. CARMA-3 demonstrated a statistically significant effect on PFS with a hazard ratio of 0 0.495, indicating a 50% reduction in the hazard rate of progression for patients randomized to IDASEL compared to patients randomized to standard of care. Median PFS was 13.3 months in the IDASEL arm and was 4.4 months in the standard of care arm. Next slide, please. CARMA-3 demonstrated a numerically increased overall survival in the IDASEL arm, although the crossing hazards pattern makes the hazard ratio uninterpretable. Median OS was 32.8 months in IDASEL and was not reached for the standard of care arm. My colleague, Dr. Sharma, will review these data in greater detail in the body of the presentation. Next slide, please. So I'll now present the questions for the committee. Next slide, please. The review issues are that idacaptogen and viclucel led to a significantly improved rate of progression-free survival, but with a decrement in overall survival in the first 15 months of the trial, and that the decrement in overall survival calls into question whether the risk-benefit assessment is favorable. Next slide, please. We ask the members of the committee to discuss whether the results of CARMA-3 are sufficient to support a positive risk-benefit assessment of IDASEL for the proposed indication, and whether the risk of early death associated with IDASEL treatment is acceptable in the context of the PFS benefit. Next slide, please. Shown here is a voting question, which I'll now read. Is the risk-benefit assessment for IDACABGG and VicLucel for the proposed indication favorable? Thank you for your attention. I now invite representatives of Celgene to give the presentation. Thank you. It's Ann Kerber. I lead late clinical development. Oh, oh, excuse me. Hold on a sec. I will sure. be speaking for a moment. Um, both the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the advisory committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages all participants, including the applicant's non-employee presenters, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that may, uh, they may have with the applicant, such as consulting fees, travel expenses, honoraria, and in the interest of the applicant, such as equity, or those that are based on the outcome of this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your presentation to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address these financial relationships at the beginning of your presentation, it will not preclude you from speaking. We will now proceed with the Celgene presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Can we bring up our presentation, please? Thank you. My name is Anne Kerber. I lead late clinical development for hematology, oncology, and cell therapy at BMS. I would like to thank FDA and the ODAC members for your time today to review study results of the CARMA-3 trial. Today, we will first present disease background and unmet need, CARMA-3 design, and results of the primary endpoint of PFS, then over survival and safety data, and we will close with the clinical perspective. At the heart of our discussion today is making a BACMA available to the many patients who in the current treatment landscape exhaust their therapy options much earlier, as you will hear from Dr. Loniel and Dr. Raji. 
A current indication for abegma is in the treatment of patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after four or more prior lines of therapy, which must have included an immunomodulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. This excludes many patients who by then are too frail to successfully undergo CAR-T therapies. The indication we are seeking is for patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who are triple class exposed, meaning they received an immunomodulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. This indication allows access to CAR-T therapy to patients at any time after they exhaust all three classes of therapy and often when they are more fit to receive and benefit from CAR-T treatment. As you've heard, IDESET is a genetically modified cell therapy targeting the BCMA antigen on the surface of the myeloma cells via the chimeric antigen receptor. Upon binding to the target antigen, the CAR T cell is activated and leads to T cell mediated killing of the tumor cell. IDESEL is an autologous product that is manufactured individually for each patient from their own T cells. Now let me show you the cell therapy treatment journey as it provides important context for the interpretation of the study results. Patients identified for CAR T cell therapy first undergo leukophoresis a process during which white blood cells are collected from the patient's blood. These cells are shipped to a manufacturing facility where CD4 and CD8 positive T cells are first separated, activated, transduced with a lentiviral vector that carries the CAR construct, then expanded and cryopreserved for transport back to the treatment center. During this time, patients need anti-cancer therapy to control disease progression. We call this treatment bridging therapy. Subsequent to bridging therapy, the patient undergoes a washout period. Once available at the treatment center, patients receive three days of lymphodepleting chemotherapy followed by the CAR T cell infusion. In summary, this is a multi-step process that takes about three to four weeks to complete. The CARMA-3 protocol was initially submitted in 2018 and amended in January 2020 to introduce crossover and to add two additional standard of care options. At that time, evolving data showed unprecedented benefit risk for CAR-T in relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, and as such, both physicians and patients were not supportive of enrollment into the control arm. As a result, we decided to offer crossover for patients. In addition, also based on the advice from our investigators, we added two standard of care options, which reflects the lack of a defined standard of care for this patient population. We submitted the SBLA for CARMA-3 in February 2023 after meeting the primary endpoint of PFS at the second interim analysis. Since December last year, IDESA was approved in Japan, Switzerland, and received a positive CHIP opinion in the European Union based on the CARMA-3 trial results. What you will hear today is a detailed analysis of the CARMA-3 trial, the first and only randomized study of CAR-T in patients with triple class exposed, relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma, a patient population with very high unmet need. We will review data on the primary and key secondary endpoints showing clinically meaningful benefit across all pre-specified subgroups. We will take a deep dive into the overall survival data with a focus on the crossover design as well as the numerical imbalance in early deaths in the trial. These early deaths were driven by patients who never received IDESEL. I would also like to highlight that at 15 months, when the Kaplan-Meier curves cross, two-thirds of the patients in the standard of care arm had already crossed over to receive IDESEL. You will also hear from Dr. Loniel and Dr. Raji how CARMA-3 fulfills a critical unmet need, especially for patients who are exposed to all three classes of antimyeloma therapy earlier in their treatment course. 
Using IDASEL earlier in the treatment course offers patients a better chance to bridge to CAR T therapy and lowers their risk of not receiving IDASEL, as you will hear later today from Dr. Raji. It is important to note that in the CARMA-3 study, bridging therapy was restricted to allow us to better isolate the IDASEL treatment effect. However, as our clinicians will discuss, in clinical practice, bridging therapy is individualized and can be optimized beyond what was permitted in the protocol. And time without anti-multiple myeloma control can be minimized. With that in mind, BMS is committed to making adequate information and support available to both patients and physicians. Data on the potential for early deaths and the need to effectively bridge patients will be included in the USPI to allow for informed decision making. The administration of IDSL will continue to be restricted to qualified centers as part of our REMS program. And as such, all treating physicians are specifically trained and have deep expertise with respect to the identification of the right patients and the selection of the best bridging approach. We will continue to monitor commercial patients for 15 years in the context of our registry. Importantly, we have made significant progress to get product to patients faster and more reliably. Our turnaround time is currently 25 days in the US, which is much shorter than the 34 days in the trial, and we have a manufacturing success rate of more than 90% in the commercial setting. I would like to conclude that the benefit risk profile of IDASEL in patients with triple class exposed relapsed refractory multiple myeloma is favorable and supports the use in an earlier treatment line setting. Dr. Loniel will now give a brief overview of multiple myeloma and where we are in treating patients with this incurable cancer. Thank you, Dr. Kerber. My name is Sagar Loniel and I'm the Chief Medical Officer at the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University, and I'm Professor and Chair of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology, also at the Emory University School of Medicine. I appreciate the opportunity to give you the disease background on myeloma as part of this presentation. While I do serve as a consultant for BMS, I have received no compensation for preparing and participating in today's ODAC, and I have no financial interest in the outcome of the meeting. Multiple myeloma is a progressive disease that presents with both hematologic and non-hematologic complications. In recent years, there have been great advances in outcomes for patients with multiple myeloma, as evidenced by numerous studies and collaborations between academia, industry, the FDA, and patient groups. But despite these advantages, the numbers of patients that need access to novel therapies continues to increase. This is particularly of importance when we look at the prevalence of myeloma increasing dramatically in the last year, last 10 years, because while patients are living longer as a consequence of these advances, their need for additional therapies has become greater. Here is data from our own center looking at a retrospective analysis of 325 patients in black who received DARA-RVD 300 uh, at the top, uh, transplant and then risk-adapted maintenance, compared to a group of patients who received RVD 1000 in green below, triplet versus quadruplet induction with much longer follow-up in the triplet uh, induction group. To really address the question that Dr. Liu asked in the morning session, Progression-free survivor is a main driver of treatment choices for myeloma patients in their first one to three lines of therapy because median overall survival for many patients is in excess of 10 years and for standard risk myeloma, maybe in excess of 15 years. Overall survival is important as we assess toxicity over time, but progression-free survival in myeloma drives time with family, time being productive, and in the context of CAR T-cells, time off of therapy. What you can see from this figure is that there's a significant improvement, again, with the addition of quadruplets in black compared to triplets in green. However, even in frontline, patients are now becoming triple class exposed, thus impacting the efficacy of their subsequent therapy. 
And as we heard from Dr. Malincody this after this morning, it's clear that many of our salvage therapies are effective, but being triple class exposed was not a prerequisite for most of those studies. So that data will be more limited. What remains a challenge is that there is no true plateau on either the remission or the survival curves, suggesting that what we are doing is perhaps converting myeloma to a chronic disease. That chronicity, however, does not eliminate the need for highly effective therapies later on in the treatment paradigm. Thinking about the remaining unmet medical need, this slide compares two different groups of patients, standard risk in black and high risk in green, all treated on that RVD1000 retrospective series that I previously mentioned. On the left, you see a significant drop in overall survival in the first two years that is attributable to patients who have unexpected early relapse, also defined as functional high risk. Management of these patients remains a significant challenge. We know that the median duration of remission for the average patient is greater than five years for their first remission, particularly with the use of high-dose therapy and autotransplant. But as you see, there's about 20% of patients that die or relapse despite that aggressive therapy within the first two years. On the right side of the graph, the box that shows patients continue to relapse and die of myeloma despite all the treatment advances in the last decade. These deaths are a consequence of either attrition or the development of drug resistance. A high unmet medical need thus remains for patients with myeloma, and it really boils down to these three categories. The first is resistance. Early resistance in the context of functional high risk, as I mentioned before, and the fact that 20% of patients die within the first two years of their initial induction therapy. Second are patients who are triple class exposed earlier in their disease course, as early as frontline therapy in 2024 which sows the seeds for subsequent drug resistance following induction therapy. And finally, the concept of attrition, which is important from an access and equity perspective. We know that with each line of therapy, 20 to 30% of patients do not get to subsequent treatments, limiting the patients that can ultimately benefit from highly effective therapy, including agents such as Idacel. At the bottom of this slide is an example of what might be treated, of a patient that might be treated at any center around the country. And what you'll often see is that DARA RVD or a quadruplet as induction, followed by transplant, followed by lenalidomide, plus or minus daratumumab as maintenance therapy. This was recently published in the New England Journal. The brown shading starting from the left shows how these patients are already triple class exposed at the time of their initial frontline therapy, and many of them may become triple class resistant at the end of their first line therapy as well. When you get beyond salvage number two, available treatments become quite limited and are associated with significant toxicity, which is why moving treatments like Idacel earlier in the disease course becomes even more important. In addition, effective bridging is critical to outcomes, as you're gonna hear later today, effective bridging therapy increases the fraction of patients who can receive CAR T cells. And yet as patients become more resistant, access to bridging therapy becomes more limited. The attrition seen here in blue demonstrates that with each line of therapy, one loses 20 to 30% of patients. With each line of therapy, you lose the efficacy of treatment, T cell health, effective bridging, and ultimately more patients die. In order to improve outcomes, highly effective therapies such as CAR T cells need to be brought earlier in the disease course. So to wrap up, the three unmet medical needs remain. First, there is a significant treatment gap with limited agents available beyond third line therapy. Many patients are becoming triple class exposed as part of frontline therapy, raising the need for more effective therapies earlier. Second, due to significant attrition, many patients don't even get a chance to receive highly effective therapy options. 
And finally, we know that efficacy of bridging is directly limited, linked to getting more patients to CAR T-cell infusion successfully, as opposed to unfortunately relapse or dying before they get the product. Moving CAR T-cell access to earlier in the treatment course allows patients to be treated with a broader range of more effective bridging therapies, particularly in the context of refractoriness. And we've seen this in the context of real world data where the, fra the frequency of patients going from a collection to infusion is a much greater percentage than in most clinical trials. Thank you very much for your attention. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Bleicher. Thank you, Dr. Loniel. My name is Dr. Eric Bleichart, and I'm head of late clinical development cell therapy at Bristol Myers Squibb. I would like to show you important data demonstrating a clinically relevant benefit of Ida cell in patients with triple class exposed relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. First, let me describe the KARMA 3 trial design and guide you through the primary and key secondary endpoints. The intent of the KARMA 3 trial was to evaluate a highly effective and safe therapy in a patient population where a treatment gap exists. KARMA 3 included patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who had two to four previous regimens, including an immunomodulatory agent, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody daratumumab. Thus, all patients were exposed to all major classes of myeloma therapy or triple class exposed. Patients were also refractory to their last regimen. Stratification factors included age, number of previous regimens, and high-risk cytogenetics. Patients were randomized two to one to receive Idacel versus one of the five standard regimens. The two to one ratio was included to improve accrual to the trial given emerging data from Idacel in a later line setting from the previous KARMA trial. In the Idacel arm, a single cycle of bridging therapy was allowed during the manufacturing process. A minimum 14 days of washout was required prior to lymphodepleting chemotherapy. On the standard regimens arm, patients began one of the five selected regimens prior to randomization and continued until disease progression or unacceptable toxicity. Patients in the control arm could cross over to receive Idacel upon confirmed disease progression. The primary endpoint in this trial was progression-free survival as assessed by a blinded independent review committee, an endpoint validated for clinical benefit in multiple myeloma. The key secondary endpoints were objective response rate also by an independent review committee and overall survival. Additional secondary endpoints included complete response rate, minimal residual disease, patient reported outcomes, and safety. The primary endpoint of progression-free survival and key secondary endpoints of overall response rate and overall survival were evaluated using a group sequential hierarchical testing strategy. It is important to point out that the trial was designed to have a 50% power for overall survival. Therefore, the ability to show a difference in overall survival was limited from the outset. The data we are presenting today is interim progression-free survival efficacy which is the primary PFS analysis, as well as overall response rates. The information fraction was 84% for the primary PFS analysis. These were the data submitted and reviewed by the FDA. Overall survival data will be based upon an updated cut of the data when the PFS analysis was final. The information fraction for overall survival was 74%. Final PFS data were consistent with the interim PFS data cut. The patient population in the KARMA-3 trial was reflective of patients with high-risk, triple-class exposed, myeloma refractory to most of the available therapeutic options. The majority of patients were enrolled from the United States. The revised International Staging System 3, comprising the worst prognosis, were noted in more than 10% of patients. About a quarter of the patients had extramedullary plasma cytoma. More than a quarter of patients had high tumor burden, and nearly half the patients had high-risk cytogenetics. Importantly, two-thirds of patients had triple-class refractory multiple myeloma, and the vast majority, 93 to 95%, were refractory to daratumumab. The time without antimyeloma therapy at the beginning of treatment, shown here with red, 
was different between the treatment arms. In the standard of care arm below, within seven days, patients receive the standard regimen, which they continue in either 21 or 28 day cycles. Patients randomized to the IDICEL arm above had no therapy prior to leukapheresis to ensure optimal T cells for manufacturing. The bridging therapy for IDICEL was optional, limited to one cycle, and was restricted to one of the five regimens. These were the same five regimens used in the control arm. Importantly, there was a minimum of a two-week washout period between the end of bridging therapy and the start of lymphodepleting chemotherapy. Patients receive fludarabine and cyclophosphamide over three days, which is not particularly effective against myeloma. Then there were two days off before the IDICEL infusion. The primary endpoint was met with a statistically significant and clinically relevant improvement in progression-free survival and a hazard ratio of 0 0.49. With a median follow-up on the trial of 18.6 months, the median progression-free survival was 13.3 months on the IDICEL arm and 4.4 months on the control arm. The table at the bottom highlights the expected median progression-free survival for patients with triple class exposed relapse refractory multiple myeloma from seven external control series, including contemporary real-world evidence and a subgroup of patients in the recently published CARTA 2-4 trial. The median progression-free survival is in the range of four to five months, which is exactly what we saw in the control arm of the KARMA-3 trial, providing further external validation. The progression-free survival benefit was consistent across all the pre-specified subgroups, including the triple-class refractory patients, those with RISS stage 3, high tumor burden, extramedullary plasmacytoma, two, three, or four prior lines of treatment, as well as high-risk cytogenetics, all favoring IDICEL. In the key secondary endpoint of objective response rate, there was a significant benefit with an objective response rate of 71.3% on the IDICEL arm versus 41.7% on the control arm. This key secondary endpoint is one of the highest response rates seen in a randomized trial for this particular patient population. There was a striking difference in the complete response rates between the two arms favoring IDICEL. The median duration of response also favored IDICEL. Looking at the very deep responses of minimal residual disease among patients with a complete response, again, there was a dramatic difference between treatments with IDICEL leading to MRD negativity in 20% of patients compared to 1% in the standard regimen's arm. In a trial that met its primary endpoints of progression-free survival and response rates, but overall survival is confounded by crossover, patient-reported outcome data take on a crucial role in understanding the clinical benefit. IDICEL led to improvements in quality of life, according to several validated patient-reported outcome instruments, including the European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer Quality of Life Questionnaire C30 and Multiple Myeloma Questionnaire. This analysis looked at overall score change from baseline to month 20 in the intention to treat patient population. In particular, IDICEL led to a meaningful improvement in pain, fatigue, physical and cognitive function, and overall quality of life. And this was seen throughout the time on the trial. A patient's quality of life is significantly impacted by myeloma and the ongoing chronic therapies. One of the critical features of CAR T-cell therapy is that it's a one-time treatment with a long treatment-free interval. And this translates into an important improvement in quality of life. In summary, the KARMA-3 trial demonstrated a clinically meaningful benefit of IDICEL. It is the first randomized trial directly comparing a CAR T-cell therapy with standard regimens in a triple-class exposed relapse refractory myeloma patient population. IDICEL demonstrated a significant and clinically relevant benefit in the progression-free survival with a reduction in progression or death of 51%. IDICEL also led to an increase in the objective response rate over the standard regimens. The PFS and ORR benefits were consistent across all of the pre-planned subgroups. Important and meaningful for patients is that a one-time infusion of IDICEL led to an improvement in quality of life with a prolonged respite from myeloma therapy. Overall survival was a key secondary endpoint in the KARMA-3 trial. The crossover design confounded the comparison of overall survival. Let's look at the results. 
In the KARMA-3 trial, 386 patients were randomized, two to one, with 254 assigned to IDA cell therapy and 132 assigned to the standard regimen arm. 225 patients in the IDA cell arm received the treatment, which includes three patients that received an out-of-specification product. Among those in the comparator arm, 126 patients received a standard regimen. On the bottom right, we see of those 126 patients on the standard regimen arm, 74, or more than half, crossed over to receive IDA cell upon IRC confirmed progression. Not surprisingly, this confounds the comparison as it reflected in the overall survival results. The median overall survival on the IDA cell arm was 41.4 months, and on the standard regimen arm was 37.9 months. Crossover affected the overall survival curve very early in the trial. Recall that 56% of the patients on the standard regimen crossed over to receive IDA cell, and that happened as early as three months. This is expected with a median progression-free survival on the standard regimen arm of 4.4 months. The overall survival hazard ratio is one. There's no perceived benefit or detriment in either treatment arm. Furthermore, to adjust for crossover, we use two pre-specified and one post-hoc statistical analysis. Acknowledging their limitations, notably each of these analyses showed a hazard ratio less than one, which further supports the absence of a detriment in overall survival. Patients in both arms lived longer than expected. In the intention to treat curves, both arms showed a median overall survival close to 40 months. In the table at the bottom of the slide, the median overall survival among the triple class exposed patients from six different sources shows that the expected survival for this patient population. The median overall survival is 18 months with over 2,600 patients. Since most patients in the KARMA-3 trial received IDACEL, both arms of the trial exceeded the median overall survival expected for this patient population. We are often asked how well the standard regimen treated patients do if they cross over to receive IDACEL. We cannot answer that question perfectly, but here is an analysis that endeavors to answer that question. These overall survival curves show patients who progressed only on the standard regimen control arm of the trial. Patients who crossed over to IDACEL in green were required to meet the same criteria for IDACEL infusion as the patients who originally randomized to the IDACEL arm at the beginning of the trial. The patients are re-baselined at the time of their disease progression. Acknowledging this analysis is not protected by randomization, patients in the standard regimen arm who cross over with the intent to receive IDACEL have a favorable overall survival. Among the patients who do not cross over in blue, the median overall survival of 20 months is expected for this patient population. We saw in the intention to treat overall survival analysis that the curves cross at 15 months. Upon careful evaluation of the overall survival curves, it is clear that the perceived difference at the beginning of the curve is driven primarily by the results in the first six months. The bar graph on the left shows the rates of death by different time segments early in the trial. In the first six months, the rate of death was numerically higher in the IDACEL arm. The rates become similar in the six to nine month time frame at 7% and 5%, and after nine months are higher with the standard regimen arm. A landmark analysis at six months further confirms that the difference is driven by the first six months, and the curves on the right are similar until month 15, where they begin to separate. You will see that the FDA focused on the first nine months from randomization in their briefing book. I will show you the nine month data demonstrating that the conclusion is similar. Here is the same figure, but with the analysis by nine month increments on the left and the landmark analysis on the right. The point is that the overall survival curves cross at 15 months. The vast majority of the difference in the curves is driven primarily by patients in the first six months after randomization. Next, we ask which factors drive the overall survival results in the first six or nine months. I will show you in the next few slides there were factors that did not contribute to the results and factors that could have played a role. Specifically, the parameters around bridging therapy and random variation could account for the early overall survival results. Regarding the imbalance in early deaths, we look closely at these data to understand why there was a difference. Here is a very critical difference, and we have displayed this with both cutoffs, the six months in the BMS briefing book and the nine months in the FDA briefing book. 
While the numbers are different and the, tr the trend and interpretation are similar. First, let's focus on the deaths in the first six months in the first two columns. First, we look at the total number of patients who died. Within the first six months, the rates were 11.8% on the IDASIL arm and 6.8% on the standard regimen arm. Among patients who received study treatment shown in the second row, the early death rates were similar, 5.1% for IDASIL versus 6.8% for the standard regimens, with progression of myeloma as the leading cause. Where we see the big difference is among patients who do not receive study treatment. More than half the patients who died early, 6.7% of the overall IDASIL arm, never crossed the bridge to receive IDASIL. This is in contrast to the standard regimen arm where none of the patients were in this category. Looking at the right at the deaths within nine months, the difference is 20 patients versus zero patients in the IDASIL arm and standard regimen arm, respectively. This explains the difference in the early death rates. It is not a direct IDASIL related mortality, it is the patients who do not receive IDASL. Protocol restrictions led to more time without antimyeloma therapy in the first two months in the IDASL arm. The median time off therapy was 26 days in the IDASL arm versus six days in the standard regimen's arm. Patients were randomized to the standard regimen at the bottom, had a median of five days until the start of therapy and continued for three or four week cycles. In the IDASL arm above, let me show you the time off therapy. There was a median of seven days from randomization to bridging. Bridging was not utilized in 17% of the patients. The median time from bridging to IDASL infusion was 24 days. This could account for the differences in the early deaths on the IDASL arm, driven by patients who do not cross the bridge and were not able to receive the IDASL infusion. Additionally, we are able to see who these patients are. Patients who died within six months of randomization were not surprisingly enriched for high risk factors. These included more patients with RIS as stage three, high risk cytogenetics, extramedullary plasma cytoma, and high tumor burden. The conclusions are also the same for patients who died within the first nine months. Since the difference in early deaths are driven by patients who are unable to bridge to ida cell infusion, it highlights the importance of bridging therapy, particularly in this subset of patients. Finally, we looked at the precision around the survival curves. On this graph, the lines represent the point estimates and the shading represents the confidence intervals. As you can see, the confidence intervals considerably overlap even in the early part of the curve. Finally, I will summarize the overall survival results. The KARMA-3 trial allowed crossover, which confounds the overall survival interpretation. There is no perceived benefit or detriment in either treatment arm. In fact, the early deaths in the IDASL arm are driven by patients who do not receive IDASL. There is no increase in early deaths from IDASL infusion compared to the standard regimen's arm. Most patients in the KARMA-3 trial from both arms received IDASL, and the resultant overall survival in both arms is better than expected for this patient population. The KARMA-3 trial demonstrated that individualized bridging is required to allow patients to receive IDASL. IDASL is prescribed at qualified centers by experts able to apply the insights from KARMA-3 to bridge and treat patients. Dr. Mark Cook will now review the clinical safety data from the KARMA-3 trial. Thank you, Dr. Bleicher. My name is Mark Cook, and I'm the Senior Clinical Trial Physician for Karma 3 at BMS. <coughs> I will review the safety profile of IDASL in the proposed indication. For the Karma 3 study, these are some of the key adverse events of special interest, which were immediately reportable as serious adverse events. These AESIs were predefined based on our learnings from Karma and other studies. They include an adverse event of greater than or equal to grade three of cytokine release syndrome, neurologic toxicity, infection, as well as a new diagnosis of malignancy, including second primary malignancies, known as SPMs. Within the IDASL population, the rate of cytokine release syndrome, CRS, was just under 90%. The vast majority were grade one or two, with much fewer at grade three or higher. Two grade five CRS events were observed, one in a subject who developed multi-organ failure day six after IDASL infusion, and one in a subject with concomitant grade five candida sepsis on day 21 after IDASL infusion. The median time to onset of CRS was one day, 
with a median duration of three and a half days. CRS was managed in the majority of patients with tocilizumab, which was given to just over 70% of Ida cell recipients, and just over a quarter received steroids as well. The overall incidence, severity, onset, and resolution of CRS was consistent with the previously reported safety profile. In CARMA 3, neurotoxicity related to Ida cell was recorded as investigator identified neurotoxicity, IINT. Neurotoxicity rates were low at 15%, and in particular were mainly grade 1 or 2, with no grade 5 events. The median time to first onset of IINT was three days, and the median duration was two days. Just under a half of subjects with IINT received steroids as treatment for their neurotoxicity. There was no Parkinsonism or Guillain-Barre syndrome reported. Overall, the severity, incidence, onset, and time to recovery for IINT was consistent with the previously reported safety profile of IDASEL. Hematologic adverse events were the most common adverse events seen, of which neutropenia was the most common grade 3 4 event in both arms. Whilst the grade 3 4 rate of neutropenia seen in the IDASEL arm is double that seen in the standard regimens arm, we do not see the same proportionate increase in grade 3 4 infection rates. The rate of grade 5 AE is due to infection alone. 58% of subjects recover their neutrophil count to grade 2 or better within one month of infusion, and 83% within two months of infusion. Similarly, 62% of subjects recover their platelet count to grade 2 or better within one month of infusion, and 85% within two months of infusion. In the treated population, rates of adverse events and serious adverse events were similar between the IDASEL and standard regimens arms. The rate of death due to adverse events was also similar across both arms. In the ITT population, death rates were similar between the two arms. The most common cause of death seen in both was disease progression. Importantly, very few deaths due to second primary malignancies were reported. They were balanced between the two arms, and there were no second primary malignancies of T-cell origin in the IDASEL arm. Overall, the safety profile of IDASEL remained consistent, with no new safety signals identified. Second primary malignancies, or SPMs, are malignancies that develop in patients with myeloma and relate in part to the chronic immunodeficiency seen in multiple myeloma and the antimyeloma treatments used, including alkylating agents and other drug classes, such as immunomodulatory agents. In CARMA 3, we can see that whilst the crude rate is slightly higher in the IDASEL arm, the rate per 100 person years, which reflects exposure time on study, is very similar between the two arms, and lower than recently reported rates of 19.3 SPMs per 100 person years in triple class exposed patients. The rate of hematologic SPMs seen is in line with the literature, where rates of anywhere between 1 and 8% are reported. Of note, no T cell malignancies have been seen on the study. In summary, the CARMA 3 study showed that IDASEL has a consistent safety profile as documented previously, with no new safety signals identified. Death due to adverse events were similar across the IDASEL and standard regimens arms. There were no cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, Parkinsonism, or T-cell malignancies reported. There was no increase in SPMs compared to the expected rate. Rates of both CRS and CAR-T-associated neurotoxicity were in line with the known safety profile of IDASEL and were generally low grade and manageable. I will now hand over to Dr. Raja to give her clinical perspective. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Cook. Good afternoon. My name is Nupur Raja, and I am the director for the Center for Multiple Myeloma at Mass General, and I'm also a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and I take care of multiple myeloma patients. I'm going to share my perspective on the benefits and risks of IDASEL in the treatment of triple-class exposed multiple myeloma patients. I'm a consultant to the sponsor, but I have no financial interest in the outcome of this meeting. The CARMA-3 trial addresses a growing treatment gap in patients with myeloma. An important aspect for me as an investigator for the CARMA-3 trial was the fact that this was a very patient-centric design which allowed for crossover. 
But having that crossover does confound the overall survival assessment, specifically when close to 60% of patients on the standard of care arm crossed over to receiving ILSL. Trial restrictions presented several challenges. For one, this was a pretty relapsed refractory patient population. Also, bridging therapy was limited to a single cycle, and there was also a mandated 14-day washout period. I want to draw your attention to the fact that Karma 3 patients were triple class exposed, and importantly, over 65% of these patients were triple class refractory to an IMID, a PI, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The question posed by the FDA today is whether the benefit risk of IDACEL is favorable for multiple myeloma patients who are triple class exposed. Karma 3 showed a very significant benefit with IDACEL in this patient population. You see a median progression-free survival of 13.3 months compared to 4.4 months with a hazard ratio of 0.49, essentially tripling the progression-free survival in this patient population. To me as a clinician, PFS is an established endpoint because it guides our treatment decisions. There is significant morbidity associated with progression, such as bone disease, renal dysfunction, et cetera. So the goal of treatment is to try and prolong the time to progression in these patients, and IDACEL significantly improved progression-free survival. In addition, IDACEL is a one-time therapy where patients are otherwise treatment-free. In contrast, the standard of care for these patients is basically continuous therapy. Importantly, we saw that the health-related quality of life outcomes were in favor of patients who received IDACEL. So can we manage the safety profile of IDACEL? We've been using CAR T cells now for over five years, and to me, the biggest learning is that the toxicity specifically for IDACEL is predictable and manageable. We know about the cytopenias, about CRS, we know about ICANs, and in fact, CAR T cell products are given in specialized centers with expertise in managing these adverse events. It is also especially reassuring that we haven't seen any new safety signals in Karma 3, and we know that this imbalance in early death was not due to cell related toxicity. Even more important for me is that we don't see any new safety signals, even in real-world data, which has been presented in over 821 patients. So to me, a very reassuring safety profile with cell. So the next obvious question is, why should we be using IDACEL earlier in the course of disease? As Dr. Lonial has presented very nicely with the natural history, you see there's an increasing dropout rate of patients who start developing relapse refractory disease. In the context of IDACEL, you see a large drop off even from the start of leukapheresis to the time of infusion. If you've had two prior lines of treatment, the drop off rate is 5%. And if you jump to four prior lines of treatment, it more than doubles. Part of the reason is that increasing disease burden of these patients, and so the bridging therapy in these patients becomes less effective. I think the greatest PFS benefit is seen when IDACEL is used earlier. These pink lines here highlight patients who've had two lines of therapy, and as you can see, the PFS is significantly in favor of IDACEL, looking at the solid line for IDACEL. Here is the comparison for three lines of treatment, and here you see four lines of treatment where you see a PFS benefit in earlier lines with IDACEL, making the case that the earlier we use effective treatments, the better the outcome and benefits for our patients. So how can we bridge patients to IDACEL effectively? I will tell you that this is something we do in clinical practice all the time. In the real world, we treat lots of patients and less than 5% of them are unable to not bridge to IDACEL. Recall the Karma 3. This was a registration trial and was designed to isolate the treatment effect of IDACEL. The protocol thus put limitations on the types of bridging therapy and the number of cycles for bridging therapy. It also mandated that 14-day washout period. 
These limitations do not exist in clinical practice. And as clinicians, we have a broad range of access to different bridging therapy options, depending on what the patient's individual needs are. So the answer is absolutely yes. In clinical practice, we can actually successfully bridge the majority of patients to CAR T cells. To underscore the earlier use of Idacel, I will share a patient story with you. This is a patient of mine, 64-year-old professor, who presented acutely with significant bone disease, high risk cytogenetics, and a borderline creatinine clearance. We started treatment with bortezomib, deratumumab, and dexamethasone right away. As soon as her kidney function improved, we added lenalidomide. Unfortunately, she progressed within three cycles. In second line, we continued with the deratumumab, but ended up having to add carfilzomib and pomalidomide. We were able to get her to transplant, but unfortunately that didn't hold her and she progressed. I would have loved to have access to Iracel at that time, but I couldn't and therefore she went through third and fourth lines of treatment wherein we continued to recycle some of these treatments. After the fourth line, because of the product label, we were able to get Idacel for this patient. In this context, I was able to bridge her with DCEP chemotherapy. She's now been in a stringent complete res remission with no evidence of disease for 18 months post Idacel therapy. This patient illustrates a very difficult situation in getting patients to effective treatments such as CAR T cells. We were fortunate in this case, but given that we've used triplets and quadruplets early on from the get-go, having Idacel approved earlier would have been ideal in this situation. To summarize, there's a high unmet medical need, specifically in triple class exposed relapsed refractory multiple myeloma patients. This is a growing segment because we're using triplets and quadruplets at the outset. Idacel extends progression free survival, and there is no doubt that this represents a clinically meaningful benefit to our patients. The long term treatment free interval actually contributes to improved health related quality of life for our patients. The earlier use of effective treatments is exceedingly important for optimizing progression free survival and to more effectively bridge patients so that they can get these effective treatments in the relapse setting. What is most reassuring to me is the fact that we haven't seen any new toxicity signals with these treatments, even after close to over 800 patients being treated in the real world setting. With respect to the observed early deaths, we know that they were not driven by idacel related toxicity. The overall favorable benefit risk profile of idacel in patients with triple class exposed multiple myeloma is pretty clear in my mind. And for that reason, I think moving idacel early on would be a benefit to all our patients. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. We will now proceed with the FDA's presentation, starting with Dr. Purnima Sharma. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Purnima Sharma, a hematologist oncologist in the Office of Clinical Evaluation in CBER and the primary reviewer for the Supplemental Biologics Application 125736-218 um, for a Beckmauer idacaptogene Beclusal. I will refer to the product as Idacel in the presentation. Idacel is an autologous CAR T cell therapy approved for the treatment of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. The applicant seeks expansion of the indication, as I will discuss in my presentation. Next slide, please. The members of the FDA review team are listed here, and my presentation represents their collective input. Next slide, please. My presentation will start with a brief overview of the treatment background for relapsed refractory multiple myeloma and the overview of IDACEL approval. I will then summarize the key efficacy and safety results from KARMA-3 and present the main topics for discussion. My colleague, Dr. Lin, will then provide the statistical considerations pertaining to the main topics of discussion. This will be followed by conclusions, discussion, and voting questions. Next slide, please. The applicant submitted results of the phase three trial, KARMA-3, to demonstrate the safety and effectiveness of Idacel for the proposed indication. 
Karma 3 compared Idacel to standard myeloma therapy in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who had received two to four prior lines of therapy and who had been exposed to an immunomodulatory drug, a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The trial met its primary endpoint, demonstrating a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival for patients randomized to the IDSL arm compared to the control arm. During the review of the application, we identified an increased rate of early deaths in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm as a key review issue. This increased rate of early death and the uncertainty of the clinical benefit in the context of PFS improvement are the main topics for discussion at this Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee meeting. Next slide, please. This slide shows the current treatment landscape for patients who are triple class exposed and have received two to four prior lines of therapy, the population treated in Karma 3. The treatment landscape has evolved over the last two decades with multiple approvals, as described earlier by Dr. Malin Cody. Drugs and combinations within the three main classes of IMID, PI, and anti-CD38 antibodies can be used in triple-class exposed patients if they are not refractory to these agents. Two BCMA-directed CAR T-cell therapies, Siltacel, and the therapy under discussion in this session, Idacel, are approved in patients who have received four or more prior lines of therapy and who are triple class exposed. In addition, several bispecific T-cell engagers have been approved in this population. Other options include selenexor-based regimens, high-dose therapy followed by autologous transplant, and chemotherapy combinations. Highlighted regimens on the slide were used in Karma 3. I will now begin my discussion of Idacel. Next slide, please. Idacel is an autologous CAR T cell therapy that targets B cell maturation antigen, which is expressed on the surface of normal and malignant plasma cells. Idacel received traditional approval in 2021 for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma after four or more prior lines of systemic therapy, including an IMID, API, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The approved dose is 300 to 460 million CAR positive T cells. The approval was based on KARMA, a single arm open label trial in 100 efficacy valuable patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma with a median of six prior lines of therapy. In the single arm trial, the clinical benefit was determined based on an overall response rate of 72% with a median duration of response of 11 months. The IDACEL product label includes boxed warning for cytokine release syndrome, neurologic toxicities, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis or macrophage activation syndrome, and prolonged cytopenia with risk of bleeding and infection. Next slide, please. With the current submission, the applicant is seeking an indication for the treatment of adult patients with relapsed or refractory multiple myeloma who have received an immunomodulatory drug a proteasome inhibitor, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. The proposed dose is 300 to 510 million CAR positive T cells. The data to support the indication are based on results from KARMA-3, which I will discuss now. Next slide, please. KARMA-3 was an open-label open randomized control trial that enrolled patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma who had received two to four prior lines of therapy, including a PI and IMID and daratumumab, and who were refractory to the last line of therapy. While the trial specified a requirement for receipt of at least two to up to four prior lines, the requested indication is broad and not entirely reflective of the study population. Patients were randomized two is to one to either the IDACEL or standard of care arm. The standard of care arm included one of five regimens which were continued until disease progression or toxicity. This slide shows the treatment process in the IDACEL arm, which starts with leukophoresis, followed by bridging therapy, which is administered to stabilize the disease during product manufacture, followed by lymphodepleting chemotherapy and IDACEL infusion. Patients could receive up to one cycle of bridging therapy at investigator discretion. 
The protocol specified a 14-day washout period between completion of bridging therapy and start of lymphodepleting chemotherapy to allow for recovery from marrow toxicity. I would like to point out that prior to randomization, investigators selected one of the five protocol-specified regimens to be administered as treatment in the standard of care arm or as bridging therapy in the IDSL arm using clinical factors. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival per blinded IRC assessment. The key secondary endpoints were overall response rate and overall survival. Upon IRC confirmed disease progression at investigator discretion and if eligibility criteria were met, patients from the standard of care arm could cross over to the IDIS alarm. The primary efficacy and safety results pre presented today are based on the April 18, 2022 data cutoff date, which represents the primary efficacy analysis. Next slide, please. This slide summarizes the efficacy analysis plan for KARMA-3. The efficacy endpoints were tested in a hierarchical order from progression-free survival to overall response rate and then to overall survival in order to control the overall type 1 error rate at two-sided 0.05. The statistical analysis plan pre-specified two interim OS analyses. The first interim OS analysis occurred at the time of the primary PFS analysis for superiority, and the second OS analysis occurred at the time of the final PFS analysis. A final OS analysis powered at 50% will occur at 222 deaths. At this time, the second interim analysis for OS has already occurred, and the final OS analysis results are awaited. In the next few slides, I will review the study results. Next slide, please. This slide shows the demographic characteristics of the study population. The median age of the study population was 63 years, which is younger than the median age of 69 years at diagnosis in the US. Overall, only 9% of the study population was black or African American. A lower proportion of black or African American patients were on the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm. Otherwise, the demographic characteristics were balanced between the two arms. As noted in the slide, the older population, 75 years and older, and racial and ethnic minorities were underrepresented in the study. Next slide, please. This slide shows the disease and treatment characteristics of the study population. It is important to note that baseline disease factors that are indicative of poor prognosis, such as high-risk cytogenetics, revised ISS stage 3, and presence of extramedullary plasma cytoma were balanced between the two arms. In terms of the treatment history, the median number of prior lines of therapy was three, 95% were refractory to anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. Overall, this was a triple-class exposed population, and 66% of the patients were triple-class refractory. The baseline treatment history was balanced between the two arms. I would like to point out that one-third of the study population had received four prior lines of therapy, a population for which IDSL is commercially available. I will now describe the primary efficacy results. Next slide, please. Treatment with IDSL was associated with a statistically significant improvement in progression-free survival per IRC assessment compared to the standard of care arm. The median PFS was 13.3 months for IDSL and 4.4 months for the standard of care arm. As discussed by the applicant, this improvement in PFS was supported with improvement in overall response rate. As noted in the table, a higher proportion of PFS events in the IDSL arm were attributed to deaths compared to the standard of care arm, 8% versus 3%. Next slide, please. Although progression-free survival has been accepted as a primary endpoint and has supported traditional approval in multiple myeloma, overall survival is evaluated at the time of primary PFS assessment, given its importance both as an efficacy and safety metric. Particularly for therapies with significant toxicity, assessment of overall survival is important to ensure that there is a favorable benefit risk profile. 
The first interim OS analysis done at the time of the primary PFS analysis is shown in the slide. The results show a lower overall survival in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm that extends to 15 months with curves demonstrating a crossing pattern after that. Due to the crossing pattern of the Kaplan-Meier curves for overall survival, the average hazard ratio does not capture the entire treatment effect and is considered unreliable. There is significant censoring at approximately nine months indicating that data are immature. Overall, 28% of the study population had died at the time of the primary PFS analysis. The number of deaths were higher in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm as shown in the table. I will revisit FDA's concerns with the overall survival results in detail later on in my presentation. Next slide, please. In summary, a statistically significant improvement in median PFS was observed with IDSL compared to the standard of care arm. A higher proportion of deaths as PFS events were observed in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm, 8% versus 3%. And an overall survival detriment was observed for up to 15 months in the IDSL arm with crossing of the curves. I will now present an overview of safety. Next slide, please. All safety events and deaths that occurred after patients had crossed over to receive IDSL were analyzed under the standard of care arm according to randomization. This table also shows only those adverse events that occurred in the standard of care arm prior to crossover. Overall, the rate of grade four adverse events were higher in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm. If we compare the IDSL arm to the standard of care arm prior to crossover, the rate of grade three and higher adverse events, including fatal adverse events, was higher in the IDSL arm. Next slide, please. Cytokine release syndrome, cardiac cell-related neurologic toxicity, and HLH or MAS are known safety concerns for IDSL. For the standard of care arm, these adverse events reflect the toxicity of IDSL after crossover in 58 patients who received conformal IDSL. Overall, the rate of grade three or higher CRS, neurologic toxicity, and HLH or MAS was higher in the IDSL arm. The rate of grade three or higher neutropenia and thrombocytopenia was also higher in the IDIS alarm. At the time of the 90-day safety update, five cases of myeloid neoplasms have been reported in the IDIS alarm compared to none in the standard of care arm, rate of 2.2% versus zero, indicating a higher rate in the IDIS alarm. I will now begin my discussion on the main topics. Next slide, please. The major issues we would like to focus on today are the increased rate of early deaths in the IDSL arm compared to the standard of care arm, as noted in KARMA-3 trial, and the uncertainty in the clinical benefit due to observed early deaths in the context of PFS improvement with IDSL. Next slide, please. Before I review FDA's assessment of major issues, I would like to briefly highlight the process between randomization and CAR T cell infusion as shown in the slide. In this study, patients underwent leukophoresis and the apheresis material was sent for product manufacture. During product manufacture, patients underwent bridging therapy if required, followed by lymphodepleting chemotherapy and IDA cell infusion. In general, the safety risks due to a treatment are considered in patients who receive an investigational drug. For CAR T cell therapy, the treatment process for a patient starts with leukophoresis. Therefore, the risks associated with administration of CAR T cell therapy, such as risks of leukophoresis, bridging therapy, including lack of an adequately defined bridging therapy, delays in manufacture resulting in adverse clinical outcome, and toxicity from lymphodepleting chemotherapy are all inherent risks of the process, which are integral to the benefit risk assessment of IDA cell. Next slide, please. As shown previously, the first interim OS analysis at the time of the primary PFS analysis showed a higher rate of early deaths in the IDA cell arm. Next slide, please. During FDA's review of KARMA-3, the applicant provided results from the second interim OS analysis 
done at the time of the final PFS analysis and more mature OS data, and an additional one year of follow-up. These results are consistent with the first interim OS analysis with persistent OS detriment for approximately 15 months after randomization. At the time of this analysis, 42% of the study population had died, and 56% of the patients in the standard of care arm had crossed over and received IDASL. I will now present FDA's analysis of deaths to evaluate this early overall survival detriment observed in KARMA-3. All deaths that are presented today are based on the April 28, 2023 data cutoff date, the date of the second interim OS analysis. Next slide, please. I would like to remind the committee that all deaths after crossover to the IDASL arm were analyzed and are being presented under the standard of care arm as per the initial randomization. FDA's analysis of deaths that occurred in the first 15 months in the study demonstrated a higher rate of death in the IDASL arm in the first nine months post-randomization. As shown in the table, 18% of patients in the IDASL arm died in the first nine months compared to 11% in the standard of care arm. This includes a higher rate of death from disease progression, any adverse events and unknown causes. Note that out of the six deaths from adverse events in the standard of care arm in the first nine months, three deaths occurred after crossover to the IDASL arm. Next slide, please. Given the higher rate of death in the IDASL arm in the first nine months from randomization, FDA further analyzed these deaths. It is notable that 8% of the patients, so 20 patients, randomized to the IDASL arm, died without receiving the intended CAR T cell infusion within nine months of randomization compared to none such patients in the standard of care arm. The most common cause of death was disease progression followed by adverse events and unknown causes. Although we note the greater difference in early deaths in patients who did not go on to receive IDASL, as stated previously, these patients started the process to receive IDASL and had received leukophoresis and bridging therapy. Therefore, these deaths are important to evaluate the benefit risk of IDASL. Within the IDASL treated patients and patients who receive standard of care therapy, the rate of death and deaths from adverse events was similar between the two arms in the intent to treat population. Next slide, please. Analysis of the 20 patients who died prior to IDASL infusion within nine months of randomization demonstrates that patient attrition occurred at different steps in the process to CAR T cell infusion. This includes patients who were randomized but were unable to proceed with leukophoresis, patients who underwent leukophoresis but did not proceed further, manufacture failures, patients with need for repeated apheresis resulting in delays and inability to receive IDASL, and a patient who received lymphodepleting chemotherapy but did not receive IDASL infusion. Next slide, please. As I had discussed previously, the role for bridging therapy is to stabilize the disease while awaiting product manufacture. Since the majority of patients died from disease progression prior to IDASL infusion, we analyzed the bridging therapy administration in the subgroup of 20 patients who died prior to IDASL infusion within nine months of randomization and compared it to patients who did receive IDASL. Overall, the rate of bridging therapy administration was comparable between these two groups. The median time from randomization to start of bridging therapy and the median duration of bridging therapy were also similar between the two groups. There was a higher proportion of patients who received two or more cycles in this group of early mortality prior to IDASL compared to the treated group. Bridging therapy cycles were truncated and modified in the event of cytopenia or infections, and in some instances, more than one regimen was administered as bridging. Overall, no significant difference was found between the median time from leukophoresis to product release in the two groups. In all, this analysis indicates that bridging therapy administration was similar between the early mortality subgroup that did not receive IDASL and IDASL-treated patients. In addition, investigators use clinical judgment to tailor bridging therapy, including administering more than one cycle and non-protocol specified bridging therapy to meet patients' individual clinical needs in KARMA-3. Next slide, please. 
This slide demonstrates the distribution of bridging therapies and how that compares with the standard of care regimens. The most common regimen used as bridging was elotuzumab in combination with pomalidomide and dexamethasone, EPD, followed by daratumumab in combination with pomalidomide and dexamethasone, or DPD. In the standard of care arm, DPD was the most frequently selected regimen followed by EPD. Next slide, please. To analyze the early deaths within nine months in KARMA-3, FDA conducted exploratory analyses to assess whether any particular prognostic subgroup was associated with a higher early mortality in the IDIS alarm. This slide demonstrates that the higher early mortality with IDIS cell was observed across multiple prognostic subgroups and was observed even in the absence of individual poor prognostic factors. Next slide, please. In summary, no particular prognostic subgroup was associated with or was driving this observed higher early mortality. The study was not designed to characterize a heterogeneous study population which may have contributed to higher early mortality with IDIS cell. Next slide, please. Since most of the CAR T cell related toxicities have onset within 90 days of product infusion, we analyzed deaths within 90 days of treatment start in the safety population. While the overall death rate from adverse events in the safety population was similar between the two arms, deaths due to adverse events within 90 days of treatment start were numerically higher in the IDA cell arm compared to the standard of care arm, 2.7% versus 1.6%. This includes death from CRS, HLH, neurologic toxicity, infections, and stroke in the IDA cell arm. Next slide, please. This table shows the cause of death from treatment emergent AEs in the safety population in KARMA-3. Please note that at the time of the second OS interim analysis, 72 patients in the standard of care arm had crossed over and received conformal IDA cell. 6% of these patients died from an adverse event. Overall, the most common cause of death from adverse events in both arms was infection. Next slide, please. In summary, the rate of early mortality within the first nine months was higher in the IDIS alarm, 18% compared to 11% in the standard of care arm. When considering the population that actually received IDIS cell, the difference in mortality persisted, although it is smaller in magnitude. A higher proportion of deaths occurred before disease progression in the IDIS cell arm compared to the standard of care arm. Next slide, please. Overall survival is the ultimate clinical benefit endpoint because it is not subject to biased assessment and because prolongation of life in the setting of life-threatening and fatal disease is a clinical benefit. Overall survival not only provides an estimate of efficacy but also safety. Clinical trials including in oncology, including multiple myeloma, have demonstrated improvement in tumor-based endpoints such as progression-free survival, but with worse overall survival. Therefore, while progression-free survival has been accepted as an endpoint in relapse refractory multiple myeloma to expedite drug development, FDA recommends that overall survival should be prioritized as a key secondary endpoint to evaluate benefit risk. Next slide, please. While KARMA-3 demonstrated a statistically significant effect on PFS and overall response rate, an increased rate of early deaths was observed as described. While a final analysis of OS was pre-specified, the results from a fairly mature OS analysis are included in the BLA. It remains uncertain if additional follow-up of overall survival, even if statistically significant, will overcome the increased risk of early deaths. Overall, findings from KARMA-3 lead to uncertainties regarding whether the overall benefit risk assessment for IDA cell in the indicated population is favorable. I will now invite a statistical reviewer, Dr. Lin, to review the impact of crossover on the OS analysis and the duration of observed detriment with IDA cell. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Good afternoon. My name is Xue Mary Lin. I'm a mathematical statistician at the Division of Biostatistics at CBER. 
I'm the primary statistical reviewer of this BLA supplement, and I will focus on the statistical considerations on the OS detriment. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the overall survival Kaplan-Meier curves for the ITT population. The blue line represents the stand-up care arm, and the red line, the IDA cell arm. The two curves cross at around 15 months after randomization. Before months 15, the stand-up care arm had higher survival probability than the IDA cell arm, and then the two curves cross. After crossing, there was heavy censoring. As noted previously, there was a treatment crossover from the stand-up care arm to the IDA cell arm. Though the IDA cell arm showed substantial benefit on progression-free survival over the stand-up care arm, we are concerned about the overall survival results as shown in this figure. Next slide, please. Here are our two key points. First, the impact of crossover. The Karma study allowed crossover from the stand-up care arm to the IDA cell arm upon disease progression. While one can perform sensitivity analysis to assess the impact of crossover, we don't think such analysis can provide convincing evidence that IDA cell reduced the risk of death after adjusting for treatment crossover due to their inherent limitations. Second, duration of OS detriment. The available data shows that the detrimental effect of IDA cell lasted for up to nine months after randomization. Next slide, please. First, the impact of crossover. Next slide, please. So according to the statistical analysis plan, the primary analysis of OS was uh, the ITT analysis. Two models accounting for treatment crossover were specified as sensitivity analysis. The rank preserving structural failure time RF RPSFT model and a two stage accelerated failure time AFT model. Another post hoc analysis using the inverse probability of censoring weighting. IPCW method was also provided by the applicant. Next slide, please. So all three sensitivity analyses rely on unverifiable model assumptions, limiting their ability to explain OS detriment. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Previous slide. Sorry about the confusion. So the RPST our PSFT model assumes common treatment effect. That is, the treatment effect of IDA cell on OS is the same. When administered after disease progression on the stand-up care arm as when administered after initial randomization. An AFT and IPCW approaches both assume that there are no unmeasured confounders at the time of treatment crossover. In other words, any systematic differences between subjects who cross over and who do not can be explained by model covariates. These assumptions are unverifiable. Next slide, please. So this forest plot showed the estimated average hazard ratio from the applicant's sensitivity analysis. Although each point estimate was less than one after adjusting for treatment crossover, it is notable that the crossing hazard pattern or delayed effect pattern still persisted after adjusting for crossover. As a result, the average hazard ratio are not interpretable. There is also considerable uncertainty about the point estimates reflected by the wide confidence intervals. Next slide, please. As an example, this figure shows the overall survival Kaplan-Meier curves adjusting for treatment crossover using the RPSFT model. The, o, the early OS detriment persisted. The crossing hazards pattern renders the average hazard ratio uninterpretable. 
and the wide confidence interval indicates there's much uncertainty about the point estimate. Next slide, please. In summary, the limitations of sensitivity analysis to assess impact of crossover. The sensitivity analysis adjusting for treatment crossover rely on untestable assumptions and cannot be used to ascertain that either cell treatment has OS benefit when the ITT analysis clearly indicates OS disadvantage. Next, please. So in conclusion, the sensitivity analysis adjusting for treatment crossover cannot provide convincing evidence that either cell reduces the risk of death. Next slide, please. Second, the detrimental effect of either cell lasted for up to nine months. Next slide, please. So zooming in on the first 15 months of OS data, when the death rates are broken down in three months intervals. It is clear that the elevated rate of death in the idle cell arm persisted beyond six months into the uh, six to nine months range as highlighted in the table. Next slide, please. The piecewise hazard ratio estimate with different cutoff points also show that the tremendous effect of idle cell lasted up to nine months. Next slide, please. The overall survival data demonstrate a clear and persistent increased mortality for the idle cell arm compared with stand of care arm, with increased rates of deaths up to nine months. The overall survival disadvantage persisted to 15 months after randomization when the, fur when the curves finally cross. This concludes my portion of the presentation, and now I will turn it back to Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Dr. Lin. In conclusion, uh, next slide, please. In conclusion, Karma 3 demonstrated a progression-free survival benefit, an improvement in overall response rate in a triple-class exposed, relapsed refractory multiple myeloma population after two to four prior lines of therapy. However, an increased rate of early deaths was observed in the IDSL arm <clears throat> Um, leading to uncertainties um, if, in, if the additional follow-up of overall survival, even if statistically significant, will overcome this increased risk of early death. The study was not designed to identify predictive factors for early mortality observed with Ida cell. This higher rate of early death appears to be an inherent risk of this therapy. Overall, there is uncertain benefit risk of Ida cell in the proposed population. Next slide, please. We would like the committee to discuss the following topics. Discuss whether the results of Karma 3 are sufficient to support a positive risk-benefit assessment of idacaptogene vicleucil or idacel for the proposed indication. And the second discussion question is, is the risk of early death associated with idacaptogene vicleucil treatment acceptable in the context of the PFS benefit? Next slide, please. The voting question for the committee is the following. Is the risk-benefit assessment for idacaptogene vicleucil for the proposed indication favorable? With that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So please pull up slide five. We will now take clarifying questions for both Celgene Corporation and the FDA. For the panel, please use the raise hand icon to indicate that you have a question, and please remember to lower it uh, by clicking it again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged by the chair, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and di direct your question to either the sponsor or FDA. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it'd be good to, and helpful to um, acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you uh, or end the follow-up uh, of your questions with, uh, that's all for my questions. So we can now move, uh, move on to that portion. And let's see, Dr. Spratt has, uh, I think, his hand up first. So go ahead, Dr. Spratt. 
Thank you, Dan Spratt, UH Simon Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University. Uh, appreciate all the time uh, both the FDA and the sponsor uh, put into all of this. So, not surprising, probably, I'll first ask the FDA um, Did you conduct an RMST analysis given the non proportional hazard here? Thank you. I would like to turn it over to our statistical colleagues. Thank you. Um, no, we didn't. We didn't uh, conduct this um, post hoc exploratory analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And did the sponsor, did you? Yes, we did. Uh, Daniel Lee, please, from Biostatistics. Uh, Daniel Lee, uh, Biostatistics, BMI, uh, slide up. We did conduct a postdoc analysis on restream mean survival time. Slide up. And uh, at the time of analysis, uh, we uh, select the time after month 31, which is the median uh, follow up of our survival at this data cut. The idle cell is 23 months, and standard regimen arm is 23 months. The difference is 0 0.06 and there's no difference in terms of the RMSTs. And this is conducted under the ITT analysis without any uh, adjustment for crossover. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. Thanks. Yeah, just to wrap this up, this is of course in the context of the crossover design of the study as we all understand. Okay, I guess I, guess I will ask my question next. Uh, I guess this is primarily for Celgene. You know, we've heard a lot uh, today about how getting RTs, RTs earlier in the therapy, uh, or in, I'm sorry, in the disease course uh, is requisite for better outcomes. Yet here we have a trial where patients got it earlier. There's a huge PFS benefit, which is an acceptable endpoint in this uh, disease state. And only half the patients are so crossed over, yet the survival is, let's not argue better or worse, let's just say it's the same for argument's sake. How, how am I as a, as a non-myeloma expert supposed to reconcile that? So um, it is critically important to move this treatment into an earlier treatment line. And um, as you've seen, um, as Dr. Raji has shown, the progression-free survival is best in patients who just received two prior lines versus three or four prior lines of therapy at the same time. And we do see a higher dropout rate um, if patients have, have experienced pr more prior lines of therapy. In other words, there's a lower likelihood that they make it um, to either cell treatment. And progression-free survival survival is really the key endpoint in multiple myeloma, clinically highly relevant. And I'll ask Dr. Raji to comment on this. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you for that question, Dr. Madan. I think um, you know you bring up a critical point, but we've shown the data out here wherein earlier lines of treatment, two, roof, uh, two lines of treatment, patients did better with Ida cell, and that was true across the board. The one thing I do want to highlight is the fact that these were actually quite heavily pretreated. They'd been triple class exposed and refractory to, to a lot of the treatments. So the earlier we move these, the better the outcomes are going to be uh, with all of these treatments and I've also shown you data of the dropout rates as you move from two to four lines of uh, treatment that there was a doubling of the dropout rate in receiving cell in this patient population. Right so just to follow up there I mean this was a heavily pretreated median three-line population and the crossover rate was was 50 percent which is higher I guess than historical controls so you know again I think that puts that into context again I'm just uh, like I said, trying to understand how to reconcile some of this uh, sentiment of moving it earlier with, with the actual data I'm seeing. So thank you. Yeah. Maybe I can uh, add as an additional piece of information, I just saw that Dr. Lonia wants to comment as well, that given the very high unmet need in this triple class exposed population and the fact that they only have a median progression free survival of four months, we see this crossover effect very early. So patients crossed over in this study at three months post randomization. And about when you, when the, at the time the couple on myocurves cross, already two thirds, more than two thirds actually, of the patients had crossed over. So the impact of cross on crossover, of crossover on the survivor curves, um, is um, happens very early on. Um, so, Dr. Lonial, please, with additional comments from a clinical perspective. Thank you. 
Yes, thank you again for the opportunity to address this. So a third of the patients in the trial were in first relapse, a third were in second, and a third were in subsequent relapse. So there is a pretty even mix. And one of the challenges when assessing overall survival in early relapse trials is that you can't control for subsequent therapies. And in trials historically that have showed an overall survival, it's been predominantly enrolled in Europe where access to, to salvage therapies is not the same as it is in the US. This trial was almost 50% enrolled in the US. So there were a number of subsequent therapies. Access was not as big an issue for many of these patients. So I think what you're seeing is that if you have access, you can do better even after relapse. If you don't have access in trials predominantly enrolled in Europe, that's where you start to see the OS curve separate in the context of early relapse. Thank you, Dr. Leoniel. Um, as a sponsor, we would also like to um, comment on a conclusion that the FDA made on their slide 15, which is also related to, to death and survival. Um, the FDA concluded that there is a higher number of fatal adverse events when we compare the IDASL versus the standard of care arm um, after subtracting patients who died from, after crossover to IDASL in the standard of care arm. Um, what the FDA hasn't shown and what we would like to show is the number of patients who died after after crossing over to subsequent or receiving subsequent treatment in the IDASL arm, what you will see is that the number of patients who experience a fatal adverse event is very similar between the two arms. And the same is true um, with respect to the number of patients who, who experience a fatal event after subsequent therapy. Eric Pleikert, please. Thank you. If we can put the slide up. So this shows the deaths within nine months of randomization according to how the uh, FDA uh, provided the information. So you can see the IDSL patients on the left and the standard regimen patients on the right. If you look at column one and three, you can see uh, at randomization. And in column two and four, you can see after the patients progressed and received subsequent anti-myeloma therapy or AMT. If you look in the first pink row, you can see that the number of patients who died in the first nine months from an adverse event were 11.4% in the IDASL arm versus 10.6% in the control arm. But you'll notice uh, a third of those patients happened after they had progressed and received antimyeloma therapy, 5.5% in IDASL that crossed over to receive antimyeloma therapy versus 5.4% that crossed over on the standard regimen to receive uh, IDASL. You, know, you can also see it within uh, the first nine months as well in the second pink row, that whether you look at um, the randomized patients in column one or column three, or after receiving um, uh, an alternative anti-myeloma therapy in column two and four, uh, it's very similar rates. Thank you. Okay, I would like to recognize the FDA who um, had their hand up as well. I'm not sure whether it was to the original question or this, but obviously feel free to respond to both. Yes, I'd like to invite Dr. Sharma. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Sharma, the clinical reviewer. So I'd like to clarify that uh, the slide 15, where we are demonstrating the differences, uh, we are looking at the safety population. I think the slide that we had up earlier was the ITT population. There are some differences there. And the primary safety analysis that we did, including the analysis of death, was taking into account uh, the, the crossover within the standard of care arm. But we wanted to display the adverse events and deaths that occurred in the standard of care arm prior to crossover, just so there is a, um, so there is a comparison uh, just for the benefit of the committee. But our primary safety analysis for the standard of care arm included the adverse events and deaths that occurred after crossover as well. Um, and again, I think the slide that was pulled up with the six and th nine month data is the, um, is the ITT population, and we, here we are focusing on the safety population. If, if I may, we, we have the same data for the safety population. It shows the same, the same conclusions. It shows the same balance in terms of adverse events that occur during the initial treatment period and after subsequent therapy. So I don't think it changes anything in terms of the conclusions. Thank you. Well, well and, I, and I think I would like to, again, just clarify that the primary safety analysis that we did, we looked at the we looked at the Ida cell again. We looked at the Ida cell treated patients for the duration of the follow up in the study, as well as the standard of care arm. Uh, and and it's only in slide 15 that we wanted just. 
to ha so the data is available prior to IDSL um, crossover. I think that was just the intent of that. Uh, but we have taken into account the crossover in the standard of care arm for all of our subsequent analyses and tables. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll just kind of remind everyone of the rules to just kind of um, request to be recognized so we, we can kind of keep this situation a little more organized and orderly and have a nice productive conversation. Dr. Kwok, I think you had a, your hand up. Um, and I, 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 if you still have a question, please feel free to go ahead. Thank you. I was actually wondering if the FDA could put uh, slide 15 back up again, because that's one question that um, I, I did have. Um, I think just Tr again, trying to like reconcile the data. Um, and then a separate question that I had for the company was, um, I think 17% of patients didn't receive uh, bridging therapy and, you know, did all those patients go on to progress? Um, and do you know why they didn't receive bridging? Was it because they had already progressed on prior therapies or? So bridging therapy was not mandatory in the study, so it was at the physician's discretion. Um, so typically when patients did not receive bridging therapy, um, physicians didn't feel that that was required. Unfortunately, among those patients um, who experienced early deaths and did not receive um, and um, and did not receive IDA cells, some of them actually don't e didn't even receive uh, bridging therapy. Um, I'll ask Eric Bleicher to, um, to um, provide the exact numbers there. Thank you. Uh, we put the slide up. So we looked at the patients that did not receive IDASEL in the IDASEL arm. And you can see from if we put the slide up. So we can see there were 29 patients that did not receive IDASEL and you can see the 17 patients uh, that died within the first uh, six months, and you can see sort of the reasons why they did not go on to receive IDSL. Mostly it was for reasons of not uh, meeting the treatment criteria, either because of uh, cytopenias uh, or renal function. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe we can um, provide the numbers on how many patients did not receive bridging and did not receive IDSL in a moment. Thank you. We come back to it in a moment. Um, we're pulling up the slide. Maybe we want to look at slide 15 from the FDA in the meantime. Dr. Hunsberg, are you with us? Yes, sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, yes, Dr. Hunts Sally Huntsberger. Um, in the briefing book, it said that the washout period was a minimum of 14 days, but the range was from 12 to 75 days. So that seems like a, a very long range. Um, was there any relationship between the length of washout and death? Um, I will ask Eric Bleicher to answer the question. There um, are a um, few outliers that drive the upper range, but the majority of patients really um, were within uh, within the same range of um, time from end of bridging to ida cell infusion. Eric Bleicher, please. Yes, we did have uh, one patient that had a very long time to uh, actually receive the bridging therapy, and that was because initially they did not plan on starting bridging therapy, but during the waiting time for manufacturing, they uh, did require additional bridging, so that delayed the time to starting a bridging therapy. We did have one patient also between the end of bridging and the start of lymph depletion that was prolonged, and that was because they had a COVID-19 infection, uh, and they received it after that. Thank you. But can I just follow up? I, I thought the washout happened after the bridging, so so I'm I'm a little bit confused because you were talking about the bridging therapy. Uh, 
there were two periods during which patients did not receive anti-multiple myeloma treatment. The one period was from randomization to um, start of bridging therapy. So that's the time where the leukophoresis hap happened and that's what Dr. Bleichardt referred to um, in, in, one, in, in one part of his response. And then of course there was washout period after the bridging therapy, which was a minimum of 14 days. I don't believe we have seen a true relationship between the links of that, um, of that treatment gap and um, the occurrence of early deaths and the 75 days that you see at the upper limit that was a, a one patient outlier as Dr. Blackard has just described that was a patient with COVID-19. Thank you. And, uh, and I see um, if there, I, you know, I, I, we could provide the numbers now on patients who did not receive bridging and died early now if that is appropriate or we can continue to discuss slide 15. No, I think uh, we don't have any hands raised so please go ahead. Okay, slide up, please. I think it's not up yet. Here we go. Um, you see that um, we have split this out by the ITT population, the patients who did not receive either cell infusion and died within the first six months. That's the first column you see here. And you see that 23% or an N of four, unfortunately did not receive bridging therapy and experienced an early death without receiving either cell. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any other questions from the, the panel? Any other clarifying questions? Okay. I think um, I don't see any other questions. So with that, I think we can go to break unless- Can uh, we, uh, sorry. Oh, FDA wants to say something. Go yes, ahead. can we, can we please can we provide one, one statement for clarification, Dr. Sharma? Um, yes, thank you. I'm the, pri the primary clinical reviewer for the application. Uh, so I'd just like to clarify that for bridging therapy, the protocol did spe specify once, up to one cycle of bridging therapy. Um, however, the, um, if we look at the, um, the duration of bridging therapy um, and the uh, proportion of, so there were proportion of patients that did get non-protocol specified bridging therapy. Um, in addition, if a clinician felt that a patient was clinically deteriorating while awaiting the product, um, they could discuss that with the sponsor and administer additional cycles of bridging therapy. I believe uh, that was considered a, a non-key protocol violation. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that that flexibility was there in the study, that if a patient had disease progression uh, and they were clinically deteriorating, they could administer additional cycles or even additional regimens to control the disease um, for, a pa for a patient. Thank you. May I respond to that comment? Yes, go ahead. So the, um, the investigators were not discussing additional cycles with us as the sponsor and the additional cycles that were administered are considered protocol deviations. They were not considered important protocol deviations, but they are protocol deviations. And those and the majority of the size and the physicians have, um, um, have um, applied those restrictions and just gave one cycle. So there was no signal to the sites that they could use more than one cycle. Cycle, which they might have done um, if that would have been allowed in the protocol, but it wasn't. Um, I also would want to ask if we can, um, as a sponsor, comment on the slide 38 that the FDA has shown and um, show the, um, the missing crossover adjusted analysis. They just showed one method. I think we should complement that with showing the kaplan curve for the um, two-stage model. Is that possible? Um, go ahead. Yes. Uh, slide. Okay. Yes. Go ahead and put that up. We have a couple extra minutes, but we'll keep it. Thank you. Can we pull up that slide, please? So um, the FDA rightly said that none of the slide up, please, none of the methods that are applied to adjust for crossover are perfect. Um, they all have limitations. Um, they have just picked one of the methods. I think it's important to to complement that um, with the other method that was pre-specified, which was the, which was the two-stage model, and that curve. The FDA commented that at the RPSFT, sorry, RPSFT. Model, 
model, you don't see, um, you know, a change in the crossing of the curve. But if you look at the two-stage model, you see that. We no longer see a crossing of the curve. And we also um, do see that um, that we don't have an early imbalance in death in the curve and a, and a, and a favorable hazard ratio favoring the, the, the ITSL arm. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have a new question, but in fairness, I'll let the FDA oh. want to comment on the new uh, new data. Yes, thank you, Dr. Lin. Hi, um, this is uh, Xue Marilyn. I'm the primary statistical reviewer uh, for this BOE supplement. Um, FDA, please uh, pull up the backup slide uh, number four. So this figure will be show the um, Kaplan-Meier curves of overall survival. Um, this is the backup slides for stats, um, Kaplan-Meier curves uh, for overall survival for two-stage uh, accelerated failure time model with recensoring. I'm sorry. Uh, so this is a, a previous slide, uh, slide number three. Um, I think there's a. The next slide uh, should show the two-stage accelerated failure time model, the Kaplan-Meier curve. Yes, exactly. That's what I was looking for. So uh, a moment ago, the uh, applicant showed the um, um, overall survival for the two-stage accelerated failure time model with, um, without censoring. So their figure. <clears throat> It's different from this one in that uh, they didn't do the recensoring, which is uh, normally recommended by the uh, literature. Now we can see that uh, with recensoring, there's a uh, heavy um, um, censoring um, uh, that's uh, rendered uh, results un uninterpretable. So there, from this figure, there's no data beyond the month 17. So from this figure, I think we cannot um, really to any conclusions about uh, the benefit of the um, uh, IDA cell in prolonged uh, um, overall survival. Thank you. Okay. I, I think Elgin probably wants to comment, it looks like, but I think that, um, you know, we could get into dueling statistical interpretations for probably a long time here. So I'd like to just, if you have a comment quickly, otherwise we do have a question from the panel. So I'd like to go ahead and um, get to that if we could. Uh, I thought we did. Maybe it's gone. Dr. Dr. Lattimore, you had your hand up, but hopefully we didn't scare you off and putting it down. Do you, do you still have a question or was it answered? No, I do have a question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one of the sponsor slides previously um, had some notations about reasons for early um, attributions for early death. And one of the causalities was study drug manufacturing failure. I'm hoping that some additional detail could just be provided regarding what this means and context. Yeah, so uh, we we do not think that the um, data show that um, the manufacturing success rate or the manufacturing effects failures had um, a major contribution here. We had a very high manufacturing success rate in the study of 97%. Um, so there were very few patients who um, for whom we couldn't manufacture idosol. Um, I um, Eric Blackhart can actually show you the exact numbers. Um, I, I believe it's one of the patients that um, had experienced an early death, but it certainly didn't significantly contribute at all. Eric Plycott, please. Yes, as Dr. Kerber pointed out, that uh, there were only three manufacturing failures, so 97% of the patients did uh, have a successful manufacturing. There was one patient that did have a manufacturing failure, and that was one of the patients that died early within the first six months. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thank you, Eric. All right, I'm muted, sorry about that. I think uh, that ends um, our clarifying questions. I don't, I don't see any more from the panel. And we thank uh, the sponsor and uh, the FDA for answering our questions. So now we'll take a, a little break. Um, as of now, the uh, uh, open public hearing session will start at um, 3.55. We're gonna move that up a couple minutes since we're breaking a little bit earlier. So planner, panel members, please remember that there should be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics uh, with each other uh, during the break at all. We again will resume at uh, 355 for the open public hearing portion. And so if the panel members can come back a few minutes early, uh, just to make sure we're all here. Thank you very much.
Okay. We'll now begin the we will now begin the open public hearing session. Both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making. To ensure such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee, committee meeting, FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationships you may have with the applicant. For example, this financial information may include the applicant's payment of your travel, lodging, or other expenses in connection with your participation in the meeting today. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have such a financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. The FDA and committee place great importance on the open public hearing process. The insights and comments provided can help the agency and this committee in their consideration of the issues before them. That said, in many instances and for many topics, there will be a variety of opinions. One of our goals for today is, is for the open public hearing to be conducted in a fair and open way, where every participant is listened to carefully and treated with dignity, courtesy, and respect. Therefore, please only speak when recognized by the chairperson. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. And with that, I believe we have four speakers and we'll start with speaker number one. Speaker number one, please unmute your uh, mic and turn on your webcam. Uh, speaker no number one, please go ahead and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you are representing for the record. You will have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary Jerome, and I'm the Senior Director of Medical Communications and Education at the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, or MMRF. I have no financial relationships to disclose. The MMRF is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is to accelerate a cure for each and every multiple myeloma patient. We are the number one private funder of multiple myeloma research in the world and have raised over $600 million in support of this mission over the past 25 years. On behalf of the hundreds of thousands of patients, family members, and friends that the MMRF represents, we would like to express our support for the availability of therapies with a positive risk-benefit ratio to less heavily pretreated patients, particularly those agents that show efficacy in high-risk populations where there is still considerable unmet need. Despite decades of progress, the five-year survival rate for multiple myeloma patients is still only about 60%. Myeloma is a disease of remission and relapse, with some patients cycling rapidly through many lines of therapy until their treatment options are exhausted. Due to the increased use of quad therapy in the upfront setting, many patients arise at their first relapse already refractory to effective therapies, and the majority of patients do not survive to receive fourth or fifth line therapy, which is where many of the newer, more effective therapies are now approved. It is also clear that the more lines of therapy a myeloma patient is exposed to, the more compromised their immune system becomes, making immune therapies less effective. The use of therapies such as CAR-T earlier in a patient's disease journey may lead to higher response rates and rates of MRD negativity, longer progression-free survival, and improved quality of life as patients do not resume therapy again until they relapse. These significant benefits must be weighed against the risks for short-term adverse effects, such as CRS and ICANs, and the long-term adverse effects of cytopenias, serious infections, and secondary primary malignancies. It is our hope that the committee will appreciate that, despite the significant progress made in myeloma in the last 20 years, more options are urgently needed. In addition, we encourage the FDA to provide guidance on optimizing bridging therapy for patients eligible for CAR-T therapy in earlier lines to maximize disease control and enable patients to achieve the best possible outcomes. In conclusion, there remains a significant unmet need for effective therapies for relapsed refractory myeloma patients. Making more effective therapies available earlier in the disease will help to address that need. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that perspective. Um, speaker number two, please unmute and turn on your webcam. Speaker number two, will you please introduce yourself? Please state your name and any organization you're uh, representing into the record. 
you will also have five minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sanjay Singh, and I am speaking as a patient. I do not have any financial um, uh, interests to disclose. Um, I, am, I live um, in Philadelphia, and I am a financial consultant. Um, and I want to speak today uh, and share my experience receiving CAR T cell therapy and its results and side effects now that I am anniversarying my CAR T cell treatment. Um, I was diagnosed in September 2021 when I was 57 years old. I presented with IgG lambda multiple myeloma characterized by serum and urine monoclonal uh, gammopathy, uh, elevated um, uh, free lambda light chains, um, and um, moderate anemia and acute renal failure. My initial presentation was in the context of COVID-19, which could have at least partially accounted for the renal injury and anemia, but there was no other evidence of organ or tissue injury, such as hypercalcemia or lytic bone lesions. My first line of treatment started in September 2021 with um, bortezomib and linalidomide and dexamethasone, and that led to a very good partial response. The second line of treatment I received was uh, an autologous stem cell transplant in February of 2022, um, along with a high-dose uh, melphalan. Um, and this was followed by a linalidomide uh, maintenance, after which I have had no evidence of progression. My first two lines of treatment had significant side effects, especially the dexamethasone in the first line of treatment and the high-dose melphalan as part of the, sec the stem cell uh, treatment. The dexamethasone treatment that went on for four months inhibited sleep and induced significant fatigue and severe mood swings because of sleep deprivation. In the stem cell transplant, I had to be in the hospital for two weeks. And after release, I experienced extreme fatigue, loss of hair, appetite, had to be isolated for three months because of lowered immunity. Uh, the physical toll of these treatments was such that I had to leave my full-time job and I could not take up a new job because of the fatigue and weakness and the loss of hair and appearance of being very sick. At the recommendation of my oncologist, I signed up for a CAR T cell clinical trial of ECMA for patients like me who had been through an autologous BMT within a year and, and had not achieved complete response. Um, and um, my T cells were harvested and it was followed by an infusion of um, uh, lymphodepleting uh, chemotherapy with fludarabine and uh, cyclophosphamide and then IDSL BCMA directed CAR T cells. This was in February of 2023 and this was an outpatient procedure. So I did not have to be in the hospital for two, two, two weeks and um, uh, like in the uh, uh, BMT. Following the infusion, I did develop grade one CRS. Uh, which was treated with uh, tocilizumab uh, at the UPenn, uh, again in an out, outpatient procedure the following day, which stopped the side effects almost immediately. Um, and since my CAR T cell infusion, I have had four bone marrow biopsies, which show stringent, complete response. I am now on lenalidomide maintenance and have had no evidence of relapse. Uh, along with maintenance dose Revlimid, I'm also on high dose acyclovir, oral, and uh, bi monthly IVIG infusions at home that take you know about two hours to finish. My overall condition is very good. I have resumed most physical activities, I would say all physical activities pre diagnosis. While it is early days, I'm very encouraged by the deep response the CAR T cell therapy has had on my myeloma. I understand there is a risk of recurrence and progression, but the deeper the response in, in eliminating myeloma, in my case, at an earlier stage, the longer I can expect to live progression-free and lead a, a, a healthy, normal quality of life. And I would like to share my treatment history and results publicly to bring this treatment to early stage myeloma patients, which significantly improves the chances of a complete and deep response and gives the patient a quality of life um, that has to be taken into consideration in any uh, approval. I am grateful that I was accepted in the CAR T cell clinical trial. I'm living proof that it improved my quality of life. It changed the way myeloma is affecting my body. As a myeloma patient, to have this option and opportunity of CAR T cell therapy available to me means hope for a long remission while waiting for a cure. I encourage members of this esteemed ODAC meeting to consider voting to recommend the to the FDA to approve this therapy to be available to other patients earlier in their treatment before their bodies are beat up by myeloma itself and as other uh, with therapies. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your uh, journey with us. 
We will now move on to uh, OPH or uh, speaker number three. Please go ahead and turn on your, your webcam and unmute your mic. Please uh, begin and introduce yourself. Please state your name and any organization you're representing into the uh, record here. And you will also have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Carl Bergman. I live in Tulsa, Oklahoma with my wife of 40 years, Jenny. I am a patient of multi for multiple myeloma. I represent patients and I have no financial uh, association with any of the uh, CAR T companies. And uh, I am also retired petroleum engineer, currently 64 years old. In February of 2018, after being followed 10 years with an MGUS, my local hematologist in Tulsa diagnosed me with high-risk multiple myeloma. My high-risk multiple myeloma was characterized by high-risk cytogenetics. Uh, these were a uh, 1Q duplication, a 414 translocation, and a 17P deletion, which is where the T53 tumor suppressor gene resides. With these chromosome abnormalities, my uh, hematologist recommended that I go to MD Anderson to, for to treatment. So those chromosomal abnormalities, usually patients uh, relapse a lot faster than uh, normal myeloma patients without those, about every nine months or so. So I went to MD Anderson, they administered and or directed my treatment plan, which is an induction of Kyprolis, Revlimid, and dexamethasone, followed by an autologous stem cell transplant. In August of 2018, I had my stem cell transplant at MD Anderson, and this was followed by Revlimid maintenance. By May of 2019, nine months after stem cell, I had relapsed again. At the time of relapse, I still had the same chromosome abnormalities. My healthcare team then proposed I participate in the phase two, BB2121, which became Idacel or Abecma, CAR T cell clinical trial. My wife and I thoroughly reviewed the results of the phase one trial along with the potential side effects. Even though one of the complications of such a trial was listed as death, which really concerned and bothered my wife, the published results of good safety with longer remission for relapsed refractory patients convinced us that I should participate in the trial. In September of 2019, went back to MD Anderson to begin the process of the CAR T cell therapy. And as stated by the OPH number two, went through all the same st stages in the lymphodepleting chemo. And at that time, I became MD Anderson's first myeloma patient to receive CAR T cell treatment. When I was discharged, I was not prescribed any maintenance therapy, no Revlimid, no chemo, other than following clinical trial protocols for labs and doctor appointments, along with occasional IVIG immune boosters. I was able to live life just about the same as I did prior to the myeloma diagnosis. After 26 months of remission, which is three times longer than what was expected for a high-risk cytogenetic patient, I underwent another bone marrow biopsy that revealed that I no longer had the 1Q duplication or the 17P deletion. So the CAR T cell therapy proved to be efficacious, providing me with a long remission with a high quality of life and it has successfully changed the, bioma, the biology of myeloma for the better. And then due to the success of this CAR-T clinical cell trial for me, I highly recommend this treatment be made available in very early lines of therapy. If I had not undergone the CAR-T cell therapy, an alternative would have been an allogenic transplant, which often causes graft-versus-host disease or a multiple of other type of treatment. So I was grateful to be accepted into that trial. I'm living proof that the quality of life changed back to where it was originally. And I just appreciate the fact of having that. And as the previous speaker said, I would highly recommend that the panel um, approve this therapy to early lines of patients because the myeloma can tear up your T cells along with all the other therapies. So thank you for your time. Thank you, sir, for sharing your story with us.
Um, so we will now move to uh, speaker number four. Speaker number four, please unmute your uh, mic and turn on your webcam. Uh, speaker number four, please uh, begin. Yes. Please introduce yourself and state your name and any organization you are representing into the record. You will also have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I'm Dr. Brian Dury, uh, and I don't have any uh, compensated uh, uh, relationship for this testimony. I've got no uh, financial conflicts of interest to, to report. Uh, I'm a physician who has taken care of myeloma patients uh, uh, for, for decades now, uh, but I'm representing today the uh, International Myeloma Foundation, uh, which I uh, co-founded, and I'm currently the chief scientific officer for the International Myeloma Foundation. So what I can convey to you is the perspective uh, from the myeloma patient community, as well as the myeloma community more broadly. I'd like to just uh, touch on these five uh, uh, points here, uh, just to uh, emphasize what has been discussed uh, in great detail already uh, uh, in presentation to, to the committee. So the first two points are, are pretty clear, and I don't think there's any controversy. Um, the uh, uh, the abecma therapy uh, is in the KARMA-3 trial, clearly a very decisive therapy with a high response rate, 71%, 20% uh, MRD negative, so uh, high uh, deep responses. Uh, and that there is a clear PFS benefit, a tripling of the PFS, 13.3 months uh, versus 4.4 uh, uh, months. And so in the traditional uh, assessment of a therapy, uh, this CAR T therapy in this uh, earlier disease setting, triple class uh, uh, refractory, uh, is clearly uh, beneficial uh, as emphasized uh, by uh, the FDA, uh, the, the, the early uh, deaths uh, are, are clearly something that need to be explained. And uh, a key aspect to that is the difficulties with the bridging therapy. And so as a tr treating physician, I can comment uh, very clearly that this is a very, very difficult time uh, to manage uh, with patients. Uh, they have uh, frequently, rapidly progressive myeloma, and they need uh, to have their disease controlled sufficiently during this period of time until the CAR T cells are uh, manufactured and ready for infusion. Uh, and so clearly, there were a number of issues related uh, to the bridging therapy in, in this particular trial uh, that have been commented on, uh, the, the use of one cycle, uh, and then the 14-day washout period, uh, just making it particularly stressful uh, to get patients through that period of time and move on uh, to the uh, CAR-T infusion therapy. Uh, the key point for me is that the uh, increased death rate was not associated with the uh, CAR-T infusion therapy itself, but it was occurring uh, related to this preparative period. Uh, the, 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 the final point, uh, which was discussed uh, in, in quite some detail at the end of the, of the presentations, was the overall survival. And clearly, uh, the overall survival interpretation was very much complicated by the crossover, which was part of the study, uh, including the fact that 56% of the patients actually crossed over and uh, one point I'd like to emphasize, well, two points actually, is that this crossover uh, started to occur rather early. Uh, after three or four months, patients were starting to cross over because of disease progression. And so impacting the survival curve uh, relatively early. Uh, and the other point is that if you look at the outcomes for the patients uh, from the standard of care arm who received the Ida cell, their outcome was good and actually similar to the patients who received uh, the Ida cell as a primary goal of the therapy in, in, the, uh, in the treatment arm, and uh, very different than the patients who never received Ida cell. And, and obviously, I appreciate the difficulties in the various mathematical models and different ways to analyze uh, these outcomes. 
uh, and truly difficult. And I empathize with that difficulty uh, from a statistical standpoint. But from a pragmatic, patient-oriented uh, clinician standpoint, it's so tremendously important uh, for these types of therapies, specifically the abecma, to be made available in an earlier disease setting uh, with a sufficient understanding of what has impacted these statistics. Uh, I come down strongly on the side of the fact that there is indeed a favorable benefit risk uh, profile for the Ida cell in this uh, earlier relapse uh, setting. Thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome, sir. Thank you for your comments. So the open public hearing portion of this meeting has now concluded, and we will no longer take comments from the audience. The committee will now turn its attention to address the task at hand. Um, because we don't have any further clarifying questions. So there will be careful consider, um, so the task at hand, which will be uh, the careful consider consideration of all the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We will now proceed with questions, uh, th with the questions to the committee and panel discussion. And I would like to remind observers that while the meeting is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. So after I read each question, we will pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording. So I think we'll put up slide two. Okay, there's slide two up here. So this will be dis for discussion by the panel. Discuss whether the results of KARMA-3 are sufficient to support a positive risk-benefit assessment of IDASEL for the proposed indication. So again, um, let's start to, to ensure that uh, there are no questions that the panel has for clarification on the wording of this question uh, to the FDA before we start our discussion on question one for discussion and not voting. Okay, let me make sure I have my hands view. Yep. All right, I don't see any questions or requests for clarification. So, you know, again, I think we will try to look at uh, the, the overall risk benefit here assessment and maybe again, is there anybody who wants to start off with their thoughts on this um, discussion? I'm happy to, again, probably lean into those with expertise uh, in this area, but I've got volunteers for discussion. So Dr. Spratt, you're up. Oh, and, and one thing, sorry, please uh, state your name for the record and uh, before you start talking. Actually, I'll give my time. It looks like Dr. Kwok uh, raised her hand and just would love to hear from her expertise and then happy to go. Okay, very reasonable. Dr. Kwok, please go ahead. Um, thanks so much. Um, I think that, uh, I think that when I think of this trial and I think of, um, you know, access to CAR-T, um, similar to conversations that we had earlier today, I think it's a really important treatment. I wonder um, if, you know, a lot of the increased number of deaths that occurred early on could be related to the bridging therapy, for instance, limiting it to one cycle or something that might not be effective for the treatment. Um, uh, for you know, for what the patient needs for treatment, um, and I tend to agree with the comments that were made by some of the testimonies um, of the other myeloma physicians um, today. That these are things that you know we're gaining more experience with and can probably improve on. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think it's worth noting that you know this question is really focused on karma three in this data. Yeah, and, but, but I think you I think you bring up a good point for discussion, which is you know the bridging the bridging regimen, um, and you know that there was a lot of room for I think uh, you know flexibility, if you will, on this and on some level that that's kind of the the optimism, right? Is that well, you know, it could have been done a couple different ways, and we'll know better for later. But but on the other hand, you know, that's the flexibility that's going to be you know, potentially down the road, but, you know, it's kind of hard for me to just separate out that 
as a, um, a non-factor. You know, I mean, I think the, the bridging therapy, if it's an issue and we don't necessarily uh, have the data that says it's not, you know, you know, kind of this hope that it'll all get worked out down the line. How, how do people feel about that? On the committee, you can, you know, raise your hand or Dr. Kwok, I'll, I'll let you start since you're already speaking. You brought it up. Oh, well, I mean, I, I think probably that bridging therapy was probably not aggressive enough or was not long enough or, I mean, sure, there are probably a lot of different factors, but that's all speculation, you know, right now. Um, can, can I say a separate comment or should I come back yeah, to it? No, go ahead. You can go. The other thing I wanted to say is I think the statistics are hard to interpret um, because of the crossover. But on the other hand, I don't blame the company for making it a crossover study. In fact, for you know, a patient who has been refractory, you know, to triple class, um, you know, refractory or at least triple class exposed, um, enrolling them to a study where it's either, you know, something that they might have received or maybe not as good versus a CAR T cell, which, you know, we are hopeful is effective. Allowing them to cross over, I think, is a good thing. <laughs> you know, I think as a treating physician, it, um, um, no. I would think about enrolling them on the trial, but it makes the statistics a little bit hard to interpret. I completely agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but there are trials with crossovers that are pretty high in prostate cancer, for example, where you still have a survival advantage. And so, and in this one, you know, this was, I, the, the numbers range from like 46 to 56%. But anyway, you slice it, you know, as many as four, four or five and 10 didn't get the crossover. And without all the statistical permutations, it did seem like survival was similar, whether or not we get into the detriment or not. Um, so that's something that I also think that the committee can discuss in the context of this question, because I'm struggling with that as well. I feel like you know, probably about half the patients crossed over and, and we kept hearing, you know, how earlier treatment is better, but that's not necessarily what this data is showing us based on the data readout. So something that I'm sure Dr. Spratt has some comments on, um, and I think he's next. Dr. Kwok, did that finish your comments on this? Uh, yes, thank you. And, and again, if someone else wants to talk about the crossover, we can do that as discussion before we move on to the next discussion point. Um, but go ahead, Dr. Spratt. I'm sure you have some thoughts on this. Thank you. Um, Dan Spratt, UH Simon Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University. Um, yeah, so when I look at both, uh, and if the FDA, just to show the slide 12, um, which is the PFS curves here, similar to what you just said, uh, Ravi, is that you know they, the PFS curves come all the way back together. Um, and, and with that understanding, so that, I mean, clearly there's a PFS benefit. It's not sustained. Uh, there's absolutely no you know, signal here of any tail to the curve or flattening of the curve. They, they fully come back together. What I haven't heard brought up and concerns me a lot about the overall survival results. And so if, if the FDA can show their slide 13 is that Okay, we're giving, and again, no one can give, no one knows exactly why the potential survival uh, detriment is there early on. But we keep saying, oh, crossover explains this. Well, if anything, if we're saying that when you cross over, there's potentially a reason that you could have worse outcomes, similar to what you see early on in these curves, and that crossover is occurring, if you look at the PFS, like those recurrences are happening at three, six, nine months, you see the standard regimen arm start, and again, I'm not trying to overinterpret this, but you start seeing the slope, you know, drop uh, down. And so to me, if we say that when you cross over, when you start this therapy, you may have a worsening of survival due to the time to start this, this regimen, if anything, I'm very concerned that in the standard arm, when crossover happens, could that actually be some early events that are contributing to when these curves actually meet up? So, I, I, again, I don't... Yeah, I it's a, it, longer, yes, Robin. No, it's a, it's a challenge, and I hate to open a new can of worms in the discussion, but, but maybe we can take a step back and just say, at the very least, what detriment or not, 
there's not a clear separation despite earlier therapy. It, it, maybe we can at least agree on that. I think it does get to the question at hand without having to, you know, kind of try right. to... And I, I guess to just say this, if I, if I may, and one, you know, the sponsor showed this, uh, not to harp on these RMSD analysis, but, you know, basically at 31 months, you cannot tell your patients that they will live more than, you know, a day longer for whatever the cost of this a CAR-T is, 500000 plus whatever dollars. So I had never seen any and the F, from the FDA or others that this is a surrogate endpoint, formally PFS, and in this case, it's not clear earlier is better than later. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Spratt. So I, I think that this is an important thing, and I'm happy to move on to other points, but does anybody else want to come in with their perspective on this particular component of the survival after the crossover, you know, any of those components. Dr. Boston, your camera's on, so go ahead. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said so far. You know, I, I don't know if we necessarily need to invoke an OS decrement in this conversation. And indeed, I think the, F, you know, the FDA analyses in their um, sensitivity analyses of overall survival, the models couldn't, you know, um, uh, can't account for that either. But I guess the question is really, you know, with the crossover design, really the question is, is it better to get the therapy um, now or or later? And with this hazard ratio hovering around one, it seems that the answer is it doesn't matter. And I think that's the thing we're trying to, the question we're trying to wrestle with. This is obviously different from a non-crossover design where the question is more, you know, is is it better to get the drug or at all? Yeah, no, I think you're right. And again, the question we're focused on right now is more of the risk benefit assessment. It's not necessarily a detriment here for this this particular question, even though that was a focus for the conversation. So very good. Anybody else want to chime in on this concept of crossover or the overall survival or even PFS as it relates to overall survival? Dr. Frankel, I see you trying to turn your camera on, so go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, Tara Frankel, industry rep. I remembered to say it this time. <laughs> um, so, I mean, crossovers, I think, are always complex and controversial. Um, but when you have a drug where early data really suggests a substantial treatment benefit, as, we, as they had here, um, including the crossover, I think is really a very patient-centered approach, right? Because it maximizes the number of patients who are going to have access to the investigational drug. Um, but from an industry perspective, it's a risk, right? And we, we know that because it's going to reduce the treatment differences between the randomized arms, especially for the long-term trial endpoints, um, and then in, influence our ability to answer, right, the clinical question that we're trying to do, especially, especially when the crossover rate is more than 50%. Um, so when, when I look at this data, actually, I thought the treatment effect of Itacel was actually very evident with the PFS, right? 13 months versus four months. And then the early crossover that's happening in those patients and the dramatic increase in the median OS from what was the expected SOC, right? In that arm from the, they showed the historical expectation was 18 months and now it's 38 months. So for me, the efficacy is really actually robust. And the, I mean, this, this, the trial wasn't trying to answer a, a question of whether it was sequential, right? Which is the best sequential treatment of it. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. It, it, you know, that, that echoes a little bit of what Dr. Vossen was saying, which is it's not clear that earlier is better. I think that we can say the sequencing is probably beyond the scope a little bit, but yeah. You know, there are trials and prostate cancer being one of them where earlier uh, treatments uh, with inevitable crossovers and some of them are over 80% and, and survival is still shown. And that was shown with PARP inhibitors a few years ago in prostate cancer. So you can see it um, and, and everyone brings their frame of reference and that's one of mine, but um, but your point is taken. It, it, it may be viewed as a risk from industry, but you know, if the data, you know, supportive of earlier treatment, you know, it, it should, to some degree come out. And again, I think we're not debating magnitudes here. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, those kind of, those curves speak for themselves a little bit to us. Dr. Nieva, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Frank, I spoke a little bit after you commented. Did you want to say anything to, before you closed out? I want to give you a chance to, okay. 
Dr. Nieva? Yeah, uh, George Nieva, USC. Um, so, you know, I, I would have felt much better about these data if I'd seen some kind of plateau on the PFS curve. Um, but, but we're not really seeing that. And it, it raises the question of, you know, you know, re really how long term is the benefit that you're getting from this therapy? Um, but, I, but I, I agree with, uh, you know, the previous panel members that, uh, and the industry rep that, you know, we, we really can't evaluate OS with as much crossover. So I, I, I think the, the, the benefit here really has to be looked at as a, a PFS benefit. It's clear it's there. Um, and, and, and it looks somewhat better. Um, and again, you, in order to get that benefit, you're, you're going to have challenges that are, that are logistical, that are front loaded with this. Although, um, you, you know, the, there, there isn't a rapid drop in OS early on, and that's at least good to see. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nieva. Dr. Spratt, I believe you have an additional comment. Yes, uh, Dan Spratt, UH Simon Cancer Center. And just to, to state it slightly differently, if getting the, the, the drug when the patients start out, I'm going to presume they're the healthiest and fittest they're going to be when they start this trial, there is some amount of patients who are dying at a numerically higher rate. I don't understand why crossover would affect this because what we're saying is that the patients in the standard regimen arm are crossing over and should be subject to some amount, not necessarily the full amount because maybe the timing, it was faster or the bridging, but some amount of this whatever the cause is of unknown early cause of death when they go cross over to this drug. So if usually when we talk about crossover, it's because the therapy you give, I'll use your example, Ravi, of a PARP inhibitor, early on gives a very clear signal of benefit. There's no inversion of the curves. And then when the other group gets it, they catch back up. But in this case, the early effect of the therapy is a potential. That's why we're having this. It's not clear. Worse survival. So crossover, I don't understand how it confounds this analysis. Any additional comments on that? Okay. Any additional other comment? Oh, Dr. Nieva, you want to follow up? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just point out that you know, we, you, if you imagined a world where this therapy was not available at all, um, you, you, you wouldn't have that lift of, of OS that, that may be going on in the population. So I, th I think that's, that's really where the crossover matters. It's not so much about the early toxicity. Um, it, it's about the fact that when we look at this population who really shouldn't be doing all that well, you know, 18 and 24 months out that, that actually they're, they're still, both arms are doing okay 18 to 24 months out. And if there wasn't crossover, you, you'd expect that, that standard arm to, to perhaps be crashing a bit more. Yeah, but just, just for context, this is more of a Karma, Karma 3 specific question. And so the broader availability of this agent, which is available, I think uh, currently, um, you know, is less kind of germane to the point. But your second point is, I think, very clear very valid. We just want to try to focus on the, the karma three related component of this conversation and this, this question. So I think in the interest of time, we'll move on to our second question. But before we do that, I'll summarize. I think the committee um, is a little bit torn, I think, based on this conversation about how to interpret the overall, the, the very profound PFS benefit that's seen, and then this detriment, not detriment, I shouldn't say that, strike that from the record, the uh, relative similar survival timelines. And I think we're all kind of struggling uh, with our lens that we bring to the table to try to understand what that really means. And I think for all of us, that helps us better understand the answer to question one, which is the overall risk benefit. And depending on how we see that, I think colors how we answer that question. And I think I'm hearing that the plant panel is a little split on that. Okay, we will now move on to question two. And so here's question two, and I will read this. Uh, and if there are any questions afterwards, we can ask the FDA for uh, clarification, but 
think it's clear, is, is the risk of early death associated with IDOSEL treatment acceptable in the context of the PFS benefit? So I, I will, again, kind of stick to my point. Uh, so first of all, clarifications from anybody on the panel to the FDA. So I think, again, while I, I seem to struggle with the, the OS component here, it is interesting that this question is specifically asking the PFS benefit. So, but it, it still brings up some of this early, early death question. So Dr. Liu, you have your, uh, your hand up and I'll let you watch the conversation here. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'll really be interested to see what other people think. The issue here is that obviously there seems to be an issue with the bridging therapy. I, I think that that's pretty clear, right? So you look at the amount of deaths that we're seeing during that time period, um, that bridging therapy is problematic. And I think we've seen that now across a couple of different studies. And whether it's related to the drug or not, it, it almost doesn't matter, right? I mean, this is just part of the treatment paradigm and people are, are essentially accruing this risk, whether it's due to the drug itself or whether it's due to the bridging therapy. And so that's obviously gonna be one of the big takeaways here is, is optimization of that, of that time period, which appears to be really critical because we are seeing an increase of deaths in that time. I think what makes this really difficult is that when you look at the progression-free survival and you know, this point has been made multiple times that these curves come together in terms of PFS benefit. And so isn't that, there, there isn't that long durable uh, benefit that we'd like to see uh, for people to assume this risk of early death, uh, or at least this trend. And so this is where I think that it, I think it's narrow uh, in regards to the risk that people are assuming for this PFS that is clearly there. I mean, it, it's a, these are wide curves, but the simple fact is that they come together at the end and it isn't as durable as maybe one might hope. So durability is your concern and perspective on the PFS. Yeah, so I, I mean, this is also part of what Dr. Kwok was mentioning about the optimization of the bridging regimen, and, and that really is tied to this early early death event. Um, so any other thoughts from the panel on this? Dr. Kwok? Um, I want to um, clarify, right, so duration of response, I think, you know, when we think of the current FDA approval of um, Ida cell, like I think, you know, generally like the duration of response that we expect is roughly about a year, right? I mean, it's not, um, uh, it's, it's about that. And I think the duration of response that was seen in this study was that it was 14 months, if I rem remember correctly, something like that. So I think that when the curves come together, it's not a huge surprise. I mean, it's not a cure, right? And so, um, uh, And how to interpret that again in the context of crossover is a little bit, you know, difficult. But I guess that doesn't surprise me. I think of it just like as another line of therapy for patients with myeloma. Okay. Yeah, and I think the question is like, can we? Do they have to take that jump? So Dr. Liu kind of highlighted that, you know, you can't buy the therapy without the, the bridging component. And there's risk, obviously, in that, even if it's not tied directly to the therapy. And, you know, that's kind of the question here. Dr. Hunsberger, I think you had your, your hand up next. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, Sally Hunsberger. I do agree that the, the bridging does seem to be problematic. I'm a little bit worried about saying that the PFS curves come together and that there's still quite a bit of censoring in the uh, I'd sell arm. Right. So there's so we don't exactly know what's going on. The tails are, are coming together, but there's still if you look in the in the middle of the curve, there's a lot of centering. And so we don't really know what the PFS curve looks like for that. The standard regimen, there's not that much centering, but but for the I'd cell arm, there is still a lot of centering. So I don't know that that we know exactly what's going on in the tails yet. OK, so I think that's a good point. We appreciate that. Um, Dr. Frankel, you're up again. Yes, thanks. I was going to make um, a similar point. So thank you, Dr. Hunsberger. I was maybe a question for um, our experts on the panel, our clinical experts on the panel with how does that um, interpretation of the curves also tie into time off therapy, right? When these, all these patients are not getting any therapy during it, and we know that that increased their quality of life um, as well. So how are people thinking about that? Um, Go ahead, Dr. Kwok. 
Uh, sorry, I keep forgetting to introduce myself. Mary Kwok, University of Washington Fred Hutt Cancer Center. Um, I I don't know the specifics in this study, but like when I think of you know um, sending patients for clinical trials, especially something like a CAR T clinical trial, they have to be progressing right while they're going on trial. So that it's not like they have indolent controlled disease. Usually, you have to be progressing and have measurable disease, and it's like a time where there's somewhat of an urgency to start treatment, and so. Um, when I think of that and I think of, you know, inadequate bridging therapy, then it makes me worried that it's hard to get the disease under control. And especially if there's lots of breaks built in, right? Because you have to have the break for break off of therapy for screening purposes, for leukapheresis, um, you know, to get your bridging approved or whatever. And then another washout before you have your lymphodepletion. Like that's a lot of breaks. And for somebody that might have disease that's not super well controlled, and you, and here you're only giving one cycle of bridging therapy, it's not a huge surprise that there could be disease, con, you know, progression during that time. But I think that myeloma is also very heterogeneous. So you'll have patients that have more of an indolent relapse versus patients that have a more aggressive relapse. And so I suspect that the patients that are progressing, you know, um, before they're getting their ida cell, maybe fall into the more aggressive type category. Okay. Okay, I see a couple more hands and then we'll probably get to our voting question. But Dr. Gratishier, you were next. Yeah. I I, Bill Gratisher, Northwestern, I would echo what others have said. I think the um, theme has been that the bridging therapy is problematic, uh, and, and this came up in an earlier discussion as well. Um, I think the survival curves are a little bit uninterpretable at this point. Maybe that's being unfair, but they're, you know, because of the, obviously, the crossover. But I, I am still struck by the PFS. And you know, the question that had been raised earlier is whether or not a duration of time of that length in the absence of ongoing therapy has value. And I, I certainly think it does for any patient. So although there are some things that we can't control here or we can't interpret completely, I think still the PFS as well as the time off uh, a new therapy it, it is not insignificant to patients who would receive this. Okay, we heard that before. Dr. Vossen, you had your hand raised? Uh, Neil Vossen, my point was made. Okay, great. I see um, there's a hand from Celgene, but we'd like to probably focus on the panel discussion at this point. Um, so I think uh, unless you have a, a uh, kind of a brief comment you'd like to make, uh, probably not get into a big discussion, but if you have a brief point, we can we can go ahead and let you say that. Th thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madan. Few uh, points to make. One is I don't let's think we to, can. Yeah, let's try to keep it to a minimum because yes, it's really panel uh, discussion time. So absolutely, cannot underestimate the time off treatment for our patients. The second thing which you brought up is fifty six percent crossed over. It is actually more than seventy percent because only those who progressed crossed over. So that is something uh, important to recognize as well and. Uh, uh, the the last point, which I think you brought up in your discussion, is the control arm was treated and crossed over when they had a biochemical progression, and that's why you don't see that deficit in uh, uh, survival at the crossover. But the earlier on, these are heavily pretreated patients with aggressive disease. I just wanted to make sure the panel understood that. Thank okay. you. Yeah. yeah, I think that those were all incorporated in our conversation. The FDA now would like to, to follow up. So go ahead and I think that'll be the end of our discussion. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Dr. Sharma. Yeah, thank you. I'm the clinical reviewer for the application. Um, I think we just like to clarify that um, as stated earlier, the poor prognostic clinical factors were balanced in the two arms. So the randomization does take care of the unknown and unknown prognostic factors. And both the arms had the same therapy um, assigned to them based on clinical factors. And so I think we, we, we are sort of struggling to understand that despite these balances, um, we are seeing this early overall survival detriment and how that would not uh, you know, also translate into the real world setting. Um, so we just wanted to make, you know, bring up that issue. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think the committee or the panel, I should say, is somewhat seeing this 
it uniformly in the sense that there is a PFS benefit. It's clear. Uh, there's there's increased, you know, um, toxicity or death that that happens likely from bridging and not from the therapy itself. And you know, I think as you heard from different individuals seeing it differently, the crossover and and to some degree the survival readouts color that interpretation further. I, I do think the, the panel is a little split on on the ultimate answer to this question, but I think that we are in agreement that PFS benefits are clear and um, and the early deaths are, are, are an issue and, and possibly related to the, the conditioning regimen, which is not optimized at this time. So I think with that, unless somebody wanted to add clarity from the panel, uh, Dr. Frankel, Thank you, Dr. Frankel, industry rep. Um, yes, I just, to your point, I, we're talking about toxicity and maybe we're saying the same thing, but on slide 22 of the FDA, and again, a similar point as to earlier, prior to treatment, the increased rate of death is due to, is driven by progression, right? I think six, if I remember correctly, six out of eight patients um, was from progression. So Again, it is kind of inadequacy, I think, of the bridging therapy, but not attributed to toxicity from the therapy. And after treatment, the numbers are quite even from deaths from, um, yeah, just death from adverse events, and yeah. then less from progression. So same. Yeah. No, I think that's that's correct. And there's the slide for us to reference if we'd yeah. like. Thank you. Okay. So now um, we will proceed with uh, to question three, which is a voting question. So. I'll ask Dr. Joyce Frimpong to, to go ahead and provide us instructions for voting. Thank you, Dr. Madam. This is Joyce Frimpong, DFO. Question three is a voting question. Voting members will use the Zoom platform to submit their votes for this meeting. If you are not a voting member, you will be moved to a breakout room while we conduct the vote. After the chairperson reads the voting question into the record and all questions and discussion regarding the wording of the vote question are complete, we will announce that voting will begin. A voting window will appear where you can submit your vote. There will be no discussion during the voting session. You should select the button in the window that corresponds to your vote. Please note that once you click the submit button, you will not be able to change your vote. Once all voting members have selected their vote, I will announce that the vote is closed. Please note there will be a momentary pause as we tally the vote results and return non-voting members into the meeting room. Next, the vote results will, do, will be displayed on the screen. I'll read the, vote, read the vote results from the screen into the record. Thereafter, the chairperson will go down the list and each voting member will state their name and their vote into the record. Voting members should also address any subparts of the voting question, including the rationale for their vote. Are there any questions about the voting process before we begin? Since there are no questions, I will hand it back to Dr. Madan and we can begin. Okay. I will go ahead and read the question that we will be voting on. Um, is the benefit is the risk benefit assess assessment of IDSL for the proposed indication favorable? So I, I just wanna make sure that the question is clear and offer opportunities for anyone on the panel to request clarification on the question. Okay, I, I'm not seeing any hands. Double check, make sure that windows, yep. So if there are no further questions or comments concerning the wording of the question, we'll now begin voting on question number three. We will now move non-voting participants to the breakout room.
Voting has closed and is now complete. The voting results will be displayed. There are eight yeses, three noes, and zero abstentions. I hand it to you, Dr. Madan. Okay, thank you. We'll now go down the list and have everyone who voted state their name and vote into the record. Uh, you may also include the rationale for your vote as well. Uh, we'll start with me, I guess. I'm listed first. So, uh, Robbie Madden, National Cancer Institute. You know, I know there's a lot of optimism about moving these therapies earlier in the disease states of multiple myeloma, but for me, this data at this level of maturity really didn't provide convincing evidence that Idacel earlier had a, a favorable risk-benefit assessment in the proposed indication, as the question asked. There are relatively higher grade three and four toxicities with this treatment. It seems like the bridging therapy strategies really need to be optimized further. Um, and finally, while the PFS is quite remarkable, uh, the ultimate readouts of similar overall survival, again, question whether earlier is truly better in this setting. Um, and so I think that, you know, at this level of analysis, this data for me left a little bit more uh, to provide clarity uh, to answer in the affirmative for this question. So thank you. We'll move to number two on the list, uh, Mr. De, uh, Mr. De Felice. Uh, John DeFleece, my loma survivor. I voted yes. I'm impressed with the prolonged PFS in this um, very uh, refractory group of patients. So I voted yes. Thank you, Mr. DeFelice. Dr. Ivani? Uh, Ranjan Ivani, Stanford. So I voted yes because I think the PFS is very convincing. We have problems with bridging. We don't know what the ideal bridging is across almost any indication with CART. And that actually, once it's available, will the, uh, physicians know how to manipulate bridging better than when it's on a trial where you get restricted to one versus the other. I do think the crossover suggests that the standard of care arm survival is better, and that's why the curves came together, not because there's a hint that it's worse. And we do know that all, most of the progressions in the early, the early deaths were related to patients who had uh, rapidly progressive disease and didn't get the product. So I think uh, overall, I was I was quite impressed by the um, PFS curves, and I think uh, I voted yes for that reason. Thank you, Dr. Advani. Dr. Liu? This is Chris Liu. I'm from the University of Colorado, and I voted yes. I'll be honest, I struggle with this decision, given what I feel are data that are concerning for two reasons, a prolonged trend towards overall survival detriment in that 15 months, as well as a lack of durable PFS tail suggesting a response that's not quite as durable as one might hope given what we're asking our patients to go through. And of course, patients have to be aware of the risk associated with the treatment in the early months, whether it's related to Idacel or just the risk burden that patients are gonna carry with them during a the bridging period, which is still part of this overall treatment paradigm. But having said that, the PFS difference is prolonged and significant. It offers our patients a chance of significant time off therapy with associated quality of life improvement. And given this, I, I do believe that the risk benefit profile is favorable, favorable for this population as a whole, but it's a closer margin than I think we would like, and patients will need to have in-depth discussions about the risks and benefits and balance that with the, uh, the possible benefits uh, with their provider. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Dr. Grash here. Yeah, I voted, Bill Gratish here, Northwestern, I voted yes. I think the PFS, PFS data is compelling. I think uh, for all the discussion revolving around survival, and the crossover that becomes more problematic to interpret. But I do th put a lot of weight on time off from uh, therapy uh, that would come to our patients. So I think that is compelling in light of the PFS. And I think there's still things that need to be worked out better generally with respect to uh, bridging therapies and the whole process. But the PFS data drove it for me. Thank you. Dr. Vossen? Neil Vossen, Columbia. Uh, I voted no. I felt that the uh, lack of the tail of the curve for PFS and the lack of effects on OS outweighed uh, the benefits and led me to conclude that it is not better to get IDASEL now versus later. Um, I would like to commend the applicant for designing a crossover trial. I think these are the types of trials we want to see. They're very patient-centered. They're ethical. And as these drugs, as, as CAR T cells move into earlier settings, we need more trial designs that can capture the benefits of not only if the treatment is given, but when the treatment is given. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Vossen. Dr. Nieva? Uh, George Nieva, USC. I voted yes, though I'm concerned about the lack of a plateau on the PFS curve. Um, there is a, a, certainly a benefit there that's uh, prolonged. The quality of life benefit made it um, convincing to me that patients actually do benefit from this therapy. Um, I, I do think that much of the issue around bridging, which I, I think is a reason for some of the problems here, is in a way an artifact of the clinical trial process. And I think in the real world where collection and manufacturing could occur early in the course of disease, it may be less of an issue for uh, patients, which of course is very difficult to test in the absence of a clinical trial. So I, I, I think um, that's something where real world evidence may help us in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nieva. Dr. Spratt? Thank you, uh, Dan Spratt, UH Simon Cancer Center, Case Western Reserve University. Um, I voted no. This was a challenging one. Um, you know, I want to be clear that, you know, our goal, right, is to help patients experience life better, you know, usually quality or quantity of life. So the, the questions, you know, the risk benefit ratio. So the benefits, as everyone said, is clearly that uh, PFS is improved. Um, what are the risks right now? Well, the risks are PFS at the data we have now, it appears transient and there's no clear benefit that earlier is better than later. Those that per that do progress and crossover have favorable OS as they showed. So there's not a clear benefit of earlier intervention. There is numerically greater early deaths. I still believe there's still uncertain potential of worse OS um, that crossover doesn't explain, but we don't have all the events matured. And speaking to real world data, I think there's a whole other side of real world data is that providers would need to tell their patient based on this data that there's potentially you know, over half a million dollar expense for a zero day on average life gained over a 31 month period. So I think that my vote is based on the follow-up we have today. I think with longer follow-up, it may change both the PFS curves coming together, as I was stated, as well as um, OS. And I would strongly encourage industry to demonstrate a valid surrogate endpoint and pool their individual patient data together to identify this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spratt. Dr. Lattimore. Um, yes, this is Susan Lattimore. I voted yes. Um, I just want to echo the comments of Dr. Liu and Dr. Gratisher. Um, I really, I struggled a little bit with some of these results, but I do think the potential for time off treatment really has to be considered. Um, and if the overall outcomes are even similar to the standard of care treatment, this opportunity for people to have a time off treatment period and a very complicated treatment phase certainly has a higher benefit in my mind. Um, I would say that really transparent disclosure of this risk benefit and clarity around that disclosure with patients and families is ultimately important. Thank you, Dr. Lattimore. Dr. Huntsberger? Uh, yes, Sally Huntsberger, I voted yes. I think the, um, the, the reason I voted yes is I think the DFS, I mean, sorry, PFS is is what the study was designed to look at. It definitely met that endpoint. Um, the study was underpowered for overall survival. So it's asking a lot to, to really expect to see the curves to, you know, separate in a way that you will see significance, especially in the light of the crossover. I think the crossover, you know, once you start putting a crossover in there, it, it almost it leaves overall survival pretty much uninterpretable. We have statistical methods to try to look at that. Uh, there was lots of modeling done, and I think I think it was done well. And and what I got from the modeling was that at best um, there is a, a, a almost a benefit there. At worst, it's the same. So I, I think the PFS drove my decision. I think there is still the bridging question and how to really implement that. But I think. The study was designed for PFS, and and the overall survival is is you know it's not harmful it, it, as far as I can see. So I, I think you're asking too much to actually be able to to expect the, the the curves to diverge based on OS, especially at this point in the study. That's all I have. Thanks. 
Thank you, Dr. Hunsberger. Dr. Kwok? Uh, thank you, Mary Kwok, University of Washington, Fred Hodge Cancer Center. Um, I also voted yes. Um, I think I shared my thoughts earlier, but I think the PFS benefit is there. Uh, and the OS um, was greatly impacted by the pre um period. So I think, again, coming to this question of bridging therapy. And for me, the OS was still like hard to kind of um, reconcile in the light of the crossover. And again, like I um, don't necessarily, I don't, again, blame the company for making it a, um, a crossover study. I echo Dr. Vassan's um, comments that, you know, I actually commend it. Um, it's very patient-centered. Um, and yeah, so so I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Kwok. You know, I think either, even though we have votes for yes and no, that there is some agreement on the panel here that um, the PFS uh, data here is very encouraging and great for patients and that um, the bridging regimen really needs to be optimized. And, you know, maybe that's across the field, but, you know, that's something I think everybody agreed on. I think that for those people who had concerns and voted no, it was more from a lack of later uh, outcomes, whether it was survival despite the crossover or, or lack of plateau. But um, that was less of a concern for um, the people who voted yes, who felt that the time off of therapy uh, was valuable and that perhaps in uh, the time down the road, uh, all the bridging issues would be worked out. Um, so I think, I think it was a productive discussion today. I'd like to take a moment to thank the FDA for their thoughtful presentations of the data. I would like to thank the Celgene uh, colleagues for their openness and sharing data with us and their ideas on, 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 this, uh, on this trial. Um, I'd like to thank my colleagues um, at, uh, who helped facilitate this, this discussion today. And also, of course, we had some people at the open public hearing session share their very personal stories about their journeys. And um, you know, I think that is always helpful for us to hear um, when we're trying to determine this sort of uh, thing. So before we adjourn, I just want to make sure there's no last comments from the FDA at all. Well, just to thank you again. So on behalf of the FDA, we really would like to thank all of the participants, the advisory committee, patients, um, caregivers, providers, and we really uh, appreciate the very robust conversation that will really help inform our decision making. So again, thank you so much for taking the time um, and taking the day to really explore this with us. Thank you. All right. I think, I think that's our end of our day. So we'll now adjourn the meeting. Thank you, everybody, for uh, your time and participating and for those who joined us.